Preface to A Woman's Journey Round the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. A Woman's Journey Round the World by Ida Laura Pfeiffer. Preface I have been called, in many of the public journals, a professed tourist but I am sorry to say that I have no title to the appellation in its usual sense. On the one hand, I possess too little wit and humour to render my writings amusing, and, on the other, too little knowledge to judge rightly of what I have gone through. The only gift to which I can lay claim is that of narrating in a simple manner the different scenes in which I have played a part, and the different objects I have beheld. If I ever pronounce an opinion, I do so merely on my own personal experience. Many will perhaps believe that I undertook so long a journey from vanity. I can only say in answer to this, whoever thinks so should make such a trip himself, in order to gain the conviction that nothing but a natural wish for travel, a boundless desire of acquiring knowledge, could ever enable a person to overcome the hardships, privations and dangers to which I have been exposed. In exactly the same manner as the artist feels an invincible desire to paint, and the poet to give free course to his thoughts, so was I hurried away with an unconquerable wish to see the world. In my youth I dreamed of travelling. In my old age I find amusement in reflecting on what I have beheld. The public received very favourably my plain, unvarnished account of a voyage to the Holy Land, and to Iceland and Scandinavia. Emboldened by their kindness, I once more step forward with the journal of my last and most considerable voyage, and I shall feel content if the narration of my adventures procures for my readers only a portion of the immense fund of pleasure derived from the voyage by the authoress. Vienna, March 16th, 1850. With the hope that we may forward the views of the authoress and be the means of exciting the public attention to her position at once, we append the following statement by Mr. A. Peterman, which appeared in the Athenaeum of the 6th of December, 1851. Madame Pfeiffer came to London last April with the intention of undertaking a fresh journey. Her love of travelling appearing not only unabated, but even augmented by the success of her journey round the world. She had planned, as her fourth undertaking, a journey to some of those portions of the globe which she had not yet visited, namely Australia and the islands of the Asiatic archipelago, intending to proceed thither in the usual route round the Cape. Her purpose was, however, changed while in London. The recently discovered Lake Ngami in southern Africa and the interesting region to the north towards the equator, the reflection how successfully she had travelled amongst savage tribes where armed men hesitated to penetrate, how well she had borne alike the cold of Iceland and the heat of Babylonia, and lastly the suggestion that she might be destined to raise the veil from some of the totally unknown portions of the interior of Africa, made her determine on stopping at the Cape, and trying to proceed thence, if possible, northwards into the equatorial regions of the African continent. Madame Pfeiffer left for the Cape on 22nd of May last, in a sailing vessel, her usual mode of travelling by sea, steamboats being too expensive. She arrived safely at Cape Town on the 11th of August, as I learned from a letter which I received from her last week, dated the 20th of August. From that letter the following are extracts. The impression which this place, Cape Town, made on me was not an agreeable one. The mountains surrounding the town are bare. The town itself, London being still fresh in my recollection, resembles a village. The houses are of only one story, with terraces instead of roofs. From the deck of the vessel, a single tree was visible, standing on a hill. In short, on my arrival, I was at once much disappointed, and this disappointment rather increases than otherwise. In the town, the European mode of living is entirely prevalent, more so than in any other place abroad that I have seen. I have made a good many inquiries as to travelling into the interior, and have been throughout assured that the natives are everywhere kindly disposed to travellers, and that as a woman I should be able to penetrate much farther than a man, 
and I have been strongly advised to undertake a journey as far as the unknown lakes, and even beyond. Still, with all these splendid prospects and hopes, I fear I shall travel less in this country than in any other. Here the first thing you are told is that you must purchase wagons, oxen, horses, asses, hire expensive guides, etc., etc. How far should I reach in this way with my hundred pounds sterling? I will give you an example of the charges in this country. For the carriage of my little luggage to my lodgings, I had to pay ten shillings and sixpence. I had previously landed in what I thought the most expensive places in the world, London, Calcutta, Canton, etc., had everywhere a much greater distance to go from the vessel to my lodgings, and nowhere had I paid half of what they charged me here. Board and lodging I have also found very dear. Fortunately, I have been very kindly received into the house of Mr. Tywitzer, the Hamburg consul, where I live very agreeably, but do not much advance the object which brought me here. I shall, in the course of the month, undertake a short journey with some Dutch boers to climb Williams, and I fear that this will form the beginning and the end of my travels in this country. From these extracts it will be seen that the resolute lady has at her command but very slender means for the performance of her journeys. The sum of one hundred pounds which was granted to her by the Austrian government forms the whole of her funds. Private resources she has none. It took her twenty years to save enough money to perform her first journey, namely that to the Holy Land. While in London she received scarcely any encouragement, and her works were not appreciated by the public, or indeed known, till she had left this country. It is to be regretted that the want of a little pecuniary assistance should deter the enterprising lady from carrying out her projected journey in southern Africa. Though not a scientific traveller, she is a faithful recorder of what she sees and hears, and she is prepared to note the bearings and distances of the journey, make meteorological observations, and keep a careful diary, so that the result of her projected journey would perhaps be of as much interest as those of other travellers of greater pretensions. End of Preface Section 1 of A Woman's Journey Round the World This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson A Woman's Journey Round the World by Ida Laura Pfeiffer Chapter 1 The Voyage to the Brazils Part 1 Departure from Vienna, Stay in Hamburg Steamers and sailing vessels, departure from Hamburg, Cuxhaven, the British Channel, flying fish, the Fisolida, constellations, passing the line, the Vampiros, a gale and storm, Cape Frio, arrival in the port of Rio Janeiro. On the 1st of May, 1846, I left Vienna, and, with the exception of slight stoppages at Prague, Dresden, and Leipzig, proceeded directly to Hamburg there to embark for the Brazils. In Prague I had the pleasure of meeting Count Berchtold, who had accompanied me during a portion of my journey in the east. He informed me that he should like to be my companion in the voyage to the Brazils, and I promised to wait for him in Hamburg. I had a second most interesting meeting on the steamer from Prague to Dresden, namely with the widow of Professor Mikan. In the year 1817, this lady had, on the occasion of the marriage of the Austrian princess Leopoldine with Don Pedro I, followed her husband to the Brazils, and afterwards made with him a scientific journey into the interior of the country. I had often heard this lady's name mentioned, and my joy at making her personal acquaintance was very great. In the kindest and most amiable manner, she communicated to me the results of her long experience, and added advice and rules of conduct, which proved afterwards highly useful. I arrived in Hamburg on the 12th of May, and as early as the 13th might have embarked on board a fine fast-sailing brig, which besides was christened the Ida like myself. With a heavy heart I saw this fine vessel set sail. I was obliged to remain behind, as I had promised my travelling companion to await his arrival. Week after week elapsed, with nothing but the fact of my staying with my relatives to lighten the dreariness of suspense. 
At last, about the middle of June, the Count came, and shortly afterwards we found a vessel, a Danish brig, the Caroline, Captain Bock bound for Rio Janeiro. I had now before me a long voyage, which could not be made under two months at the least, and which possibly might last three or four. Luckily, I had already lived for a considerable period on board sailing vessels during my former travels, and was therefore acquainted with their arrangements, which are very different from those of steamers. On board a steamer everything is agreeable and luxurious. The vessel pursues her rapid course independent of the wind, and the passengers enjoy good and fresh provisions, spacious cabins, and excellent society. In sailing vessels all this is very different, as, with the exception of the large East India men, they are not fitted up for passengers. In them the cargo is looked upon as the principal thing, and in the eyes of the crew passengers are a troublesome addition, whose comfort is generally very little studied. The captain is the only person who takes any interest in them, since a third or even the half of the passage money falls to his share. The space, too, is so confined that you can hardly turn yourself round in the sleeping cabins, while it is quite impossible to stand upright in the berths. Beside this, the motion of a sailing vessel is much stronger than that of a steamer. On the latter, however, many affirm that the eternal vibration and the disagreeable odour of the oils and coals are totally insupportable. For my own part, I never found this to be the case. It certainly is unpleasant, but much easier to bear than the many inconveniences always existing on board a sailing vessel. The passenger is there a complete slave to every whim or caprice of the captain, who is an absolute sovereign and holds uncontrolled sway over everything. Even the food depends upon his generosity, and although it is generally not absolutely bad, in the best instances it is not equal to that on board a steamer. The following form the ordinary diet tea and coffee without milk, bacon and junk, soup made with peas or cabbage, potatoes, hard dumplings, salted cod and ship biscuit. On rare occasions, ham, eggs, fish, pancakes, or even skinny fowls are served out. It is very seldom in small ships that bread can be procured. To render the living more palatable, especially on a long voyage, passengers would do well to take with them a few additions to the ship's fare. The most suitable are portable soup and captain's biscuit, both of which should be kept in tin canisters to preserve them from mouldiness and insects. A good quantity of eggs, which, when the vessel is bound for a southern climate, should first be dipped in strong lime water or packed in coal dust. Rice, potatoes, sugar, butter, and all the ingredients for making sangaree and potato salad, the former being very strengthening and the latter very cooling. I would strongly recommend those who have children with them to take a goat as well. As regards wine, passengers should take especial care to ask the captain whether this is included in the passage money, otherwise it will have to be purchased from him at a very high rate. There are also other objects which must not be forgotten, and above all a mattress, bolster and counterpane, as the berths are generally unfurnished. These can be purchased very cheaply at any seaport town. Besides this, it is likewise advisable to take a stock of coloured linen. The office of washerwoman is filled by a sailor, so that it may easily be imagined that the linen does not return from the wash in the best possible condition. When the sailors are employed in shifting the sails, great care must be taken to avoid injury by the falling of any of the ropes. But all these inconveniences are comparatively trifling. The greatest amount of annoyance begins towards the end of the voyage. The captain's mistress is his ship. At sea he allows her to wear an easy negligee, but in port she must appear in full dress. Not a sign of the long voyage, of the storms, of the glowing heat she has suffered, must be visible. Then begins an incessant hammering, planing, and sawing. Every flaw, every crack or injury is made good, and, to wind up, the whole vessel is painted afresh. The worst of all, however, is the hammering when the cracks in the deck are being repaired and filled up with pitch. This is almost unbearable. But enough of annoyances. I have described them merely to prepare, in some degree, those who have never been to sea. Persons residing in seaport towns do not, perhaps, stand in need of this, for they hear these matters mentioned every day. 
but such is not the case with us poor souls who have lived all our lives in inland cities. Very often we hardly know how a steamer or a sailing vessel looks, much less the mode of life on board them. I speak from experience, and know too well what I myself suffered on my first voyage, simply because, not having been worn beforehand, I took nothing with me save a small stock of linen and clothes. At present I will proceed with the progress of my voyage. We embarked on the evening of the 28th of June, and weighed anchor before daybreak on the 29th. The voyage did not commence in any very encouraging manner. We had very little, in fact almost no, wind at all and compared to us every pedestrian appeared to be running a race. We made the nine miles to Blankenese in seven hours. Luckily the slow rate at which we proceeded was not so disagreeable, as at first, for a considerable period, we beheld the magnificent port, and afterwards could admire, on the Holstein side, the beautiful country houses of the rich Hamburgers, situated upon charming eminences and surrounded by lovely gardens. The opposite side, belonging to Hanover, is as flat and monotonous as the other side is beautiful. About here, the Elbe, in many places, is from three to four miles broad. Before reaching Blankenese, the ships take in their stock of water from the Elbe. This water, although of a dirty and thick appearance, is said to possess the valuable quality of resisting putridity for years. We did not reach Gluckstadt, thirty-seven miles from Hamburg, before the morning of the thirtieth. As there was not now a breath of wind, we were entirely at the mercy of the stream, and began drifting back. The captain, therefore, ordered the men to cast anchor, and profited by the leisure thus enforced upon them, to have the chests and boxes made fast on the deck and in the hold. We idlers had permission granted us to land and visit the town, in which, however, we found but little to admire. There were eight passengers on board. The four cabin places were taken by Count B, myself, and two young people who hoped to make their fortune sooner in the Brazils than in Europe. The price of a passage in the first cabin was one hundred dollars, twenty pounds sixteen shillings and eightpence, and in the steerage fifty dollars, ten pounds eight shillings and fourpence. In the steerage, besides two worthy tradesmen, was a poor old woman who was going, in compliance with the wish of her only son, who had settled in the Brazils, to join him there, and a married woman whose husband had been working as a tailor for the last six years in Rio Janeiro. People soon became acquainted on board ship, and generally endeavoured to agree as well as possible, in order to render the monotony of a long voyage at all supportable. On the 1st of July we again set sail in rather stormy weather, we made a few miles, but were soon obliged to cast anchor once more. The Elbe is here so wide that we could hardly see its banks, and the swell so strong that sea-sickness began to manifest itself among our company. On the 2nd of July we again attempted to weigh anchor, but with no better success than the day before. Towards evening we saw some dolphins, also called tumbler or tumblers, as well as several gulls, which announced to us that we were fast nearing the sea. A great many vessels passed quickly by us. Ah, they could turn to account the storm and wind which swelled out their sails, and drove them rapidly towards the neighbouring port. We grudged them their good fortune, and perhaps we had to thank this specimen of Christian love on our part, that on the 3rd of July we had not got further than Cuxhaven, seventy-four miles from Hamburg. The 4th of July was a beautifully fine day, for those who could remain quietly on shore but for those on board ship it was bad enough, as there was not the slightest breath of wind stirring. To get rid of our lamentations, the captain launched out in praises of the charming little town, and had us conveyed to land. We visited the town as well as the bathing establishment and the lighthouse, and afterwards actually proceeded as far as a place called the Bush, where, as we were told, we should find a great abundance of strawberries. After wandering about over fields and meadows, for a good hour in the glowing heat we found the bush it is true but instead of strawberries discovered only frogs and adders there we now proceeded into the scanty wood where we saw about twenty tents erected a bustling landlord came up and offering us some glasses of bad milk said that every year a fair is held in the bush for three weeks or rather on three successive sundays 
for during the weekdays the booths are closed. The landlady also came tripping towards us and invited us in a very friendly manner to spend the next Sunday with them. She assured us that we should amuse ourselves charmingly, that we elder members of the company should find entertainment in the wonderful performance of the tumblers and jugglers, and the younger gentlemen find spruce young girls for partners in the dance. We expressed ourselves much pleased at this invitation, promised to be sure to come, and then extended our walk to Ritzebutel, where we admired a small castle in a miniature park. 5th of July. Nothing is so changeable as the weather. Yesterday we were travelling in sunshine, and today we were surrounded by a thick, dark fog. And yet this, bad as it was, we found more agreeable than the fine weather of the day before, for a slight breeze sprang up, and at nine o'clock in the morning we heard the rattling of the capstan as the anchor was being weighed. In consequence of this, the young people were obliged to give up the idea of an excursion to the bush, and defer all dancing with pretty girls, until their arrival in another hemisphere, for it was fated that they should not set foot in Europe again. The transition from the Elbe to the North Sea is scarcely perceptible, as the Elbe is not divided into different channels, but is eight or ten miles broad at its mouth. It almost forms a small sea of itself, and has even the green hue of one. We were, consequently, very much surprised on hearing the captain exclaim in a joyful tone, We are out of the river at last. We imagined that we had long since been sailing on the wide ocean. In the afternoon we bore in sight of the island of Heligoland, which belongs to the English, and presented really a magical appearance as it rose out from the sea. It is a barren, colossal rock, and had I not learned from one of the newest works on geography that it was peopled by about 2,500 souls, I should have supposed the whole island to have been uninhabited. On three sides the cliffs rise so precipitously from the waves that all access is impossible. We sailed by the place at a considerable distance, and saw only the towers of the church and lighthouse, in addition to the so-called monk, a solitary perpendicular rock that is separated from the main body, between which and it there sparkles a small strip of sea. The inhabitants are very poor. The only sources of their livelihood are fishing and bathing visitors. A great number of the latter come every year, as the bathing, on account of the extraordinary swell, is reckoned extremely efficacious. Unfortunately, great fears are entertained that this watering place cannot exist much longer, as every year the island decreases in size, from the continual falling away of large masses of rock, so that some day the whole place may disappear into the sea. From the 5th to the 10th of July we had continued stormy and cold weather, with a heavy sea and great rolling of the ship. All we poor landlubbers were suffering from seasickness. We first entered the British Channel, also called La Manche, 420 miles from Cuxhaven, on the night of the 10th to the 11th. We awaited with impatience the rising of the sun, which would display to our gaze two of the mightiest powers of Europe. Luckily the day was fine and clear, and the two kingdoms lay before us in such magnificence and proximity that the beholder was almost inclined to believe that a sister people inhabited both countries. On the coast of England we saw the North Foreland, the castle of Sandown, and the town of Deal, stretching out at the foot of the cliffs, which extended for many miles and are about a 150 feet high. Further on we came in sight of the South Foreland, and lastly the ancient castle of Dover, that sits right bravely enthroned upon an eminence, and overlooks the surrounding country far and wide. The town itself lies upon the seashore. Opposite Dover, at the narrowest part of the channel, we distinguished on the French coast Cap Grenet, where Napoleon erected a small building, in order, it is said, to be at least able to see England, and, further on, the obelisk raised in memory of the camp at Boulogne by Napoleon, but completed under Louis-Philippe. The wind being unfavourable, we were obliged, during the night, to tack in the neighbourhood of Dover. The great darkness which covered both land and sea rendered this manoeuvre a very dangerous one, firstly on account of the proximity of the coast, and secondly on account of the number of vessels passing up and down the channel. To avoid a collision, we hung out a lantern on the foremast, while, from time to time, a torch was lighted and held over the side, 
and the bell frequently kept sounding, all very alarming occurrences to a person unused to the sea. For fourteen days we were prisoners in the three hundred and sixty miles of the channel, remaining very often two or three days, as if spellbound, in the same place, while we were frequently obliged to cruise for whole days to make merely a few miles. A near start we were overtaken by a tolerably violent storm. During the night I was suddenly called upon deck. I imagined that some misfortune had happened, and hastily throwing a few clothes on, hurried up, to enjoy the astonishing spectacle of a sea-fire. In the wake of the vessel I behold a streak of fire so strong that it would have been easy to read by its light. The water round the ship looked like a glowing stream of lava, and every wave as it rose up threw out sparks of fire. The track of the fish was surrounded by dazzling, inimitable brilliancy, and far and wide everything was one dazzling coruscation. This extraordinary illumination of the sea is of very unfrequent occurrence, and rarely happens after long-continued violent storms. The captain told me that he had never yet beheld the sea so lighted up. For my part, I shall never forget the sight. A second and hardly less beautiful spectacle came under our observation at another time, when, after a storm, the clouds, gilt by the rays of the sun, were reflected as in a mirror on the bosom of the sea. They glittered and shone with an intensity of colour which surpassed even those of the rainbow. We had full leisure to contemplate Eddiston Lighthouse, which is the most celebrated building of the kind in Europe, as we were cruising about two days in sight of it. Its height and the boldness and strength with which it is built are truly wonderful, but still more wonderful is its position upon a dangerous reef, situated ten miles from the coast. At a distance it seems to be founded in the sea itself. We often sailed so near the coast of Cornwall that not only could we plainly perceive every village, but even the people in the streets and in the open country. The land is hilly and luxuriant, and appears carefully cultivated. During the whole time of our cruising in the channel, the temperature was cold and raw, the thermometer seldom being higher than 65 degrees to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. At last, on the 24th of July, we came to the end of the channel and attained the open sea. The wind was tolerably favourable, and on the 2nd of August we were off Gibraltar, where we were becalmed for 24 hours. The captain threw several pieces of white crockery ware as well as a number of large bones, overboard, to show how beautifully green such objects appeared as they slowly sank down beneath the sea. Of course, this can only be seen in a perfect calm. In the evening we were greatly delighted by numbers of molluscae shining through the water. They looked exactly like so many floating stars, about the size of a man's hand. Even by day we could perceive them beneath the waves. They are of a brownish-red, and in form resemble a toadstool. Many had a thick pedicle, somewhat fimbriated on the under part. Others, instead of the pedicle, had a number of threads hanging down from them. End of section one. Section two of A Woman's Journey Round the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. A Woman's Journey Round the World by Ida Laura Pfeiffer. Chapter 1, Part 2. 4th of August. This was the first day that it was announced by the heat that we were in a southern latitude. But, as was also the case the following day, the clear, dark blue sky that generally overarches the Mediterranean in such exceeding loveliness was still wanting. We found, however, some slight compensation for this in the rising and setting of the sun, as these were often accompanied by unusual forms and colours of the clouds. We were now off Morocco, and were fortunate enough today to perceive a great number of bonitos. Everyone on board bestirred himself, and on every side fish-hooks were cast overboard. Unluckily, only one bonito allowed himself to be entrapped by our friendly invitations. He made a dart at the bait, and his good-natured confidence procured us a fresh meal, of which we had long been deprived. 
On the 5th of August we saw land for the first time in 12 days. The sun was rising as the little island of Porto Santo greeted our sight. It is formed of peaked mountains which, by their shape, betray their volcanic origin. A few miles in advance of the island stands the beautiful Falcon Rock, like a sentinel upon the lookout. We sailed past Madeira, 23 miles from Porto Santo, the same day, but unluckily at such a distance that we could only perceive the long mountain chains by which the island is intersected. Near Madeira lie the rocky deserter islands, which are reckoned as forming part of Africa. Near these islands we passed a vessel running under reefed sails before the wind, whence the captain concluded that she was a cruiser looking after slavers. On the 6th of August we beheld for the first time flying fish, but at such a distance that we could scarcely distinguish them. On the 7th of August we neared the Canary Isles, but unfortunately on account of the thick fog we could not see them. We now caught the trade wind that blows from the east and is anxiously desired by all sailors. On the night of the ninth to 10th we entered the tropics. We were now in daily expectation of greater heat and a clearer sky, but met with neither. The atmosphere was dull and hazy, and even in our own raw fatherland the sky could not have been so overcast, except upon some days in November. Every evening the clouds were piled upon one another, in such a way that we were continually expecting to see a water spout. It was generally not before midnight that the heavens would gradually clear up, and allow us to admire the beautiful and dazzling constellations of the south. The captain told us that this was the fourteenth voyage he had made to the Brazils, during which time he had always found the heat very easily borne, and had never seen the sky otherwise than dull and lowering. He said that this was occasioned by the damp, unhealthy coast of Guinea, the ill effects of which were perceptible much further than where we then were, although the distance between us was 350 miles. In the tropics, the quick transition from day to night is already very perceptible. 35 or 40 minutes after the setting of the sun, the deepest darkness reigns around. The difference in the length of day and night decreases more and more the nearer you approach the equator. At the equator itself, the day and night are of equal duration. On the 14th and 15th of August, we sailed parallel with the Cape de Verde Islands, from which we were not more than 23 miles distant, but which, on account of the hazy state of the weather, we could not see. During this period we used to be much amused by the small flocks of flying fish, which very often arose from the water so near the ship's side that we were enabled to examine them minutely. They are generally the size and colour of a herring. Their side fins, however, are longer and broader, and they have the power of spreading and closing them like little wings. They raise themselves about twelve or fifteen feet above the water, and then, after flying more than a distance of a hundred feet, dive down again for a moment beneath the waves to recommence directly afterwards. This occurs most frequently when they are pursued by bonitos or other foes. When they were flying at some distance from the ship, they really looked like elegant birds. We very frequently saw the bonitos also, who were pursuing them, endeavour to raise themselves above the water, but they seldom succeeded in raising more than their head. It is very difficult to catch one of these little denizens of the air, as they are to be secured neither by nets nor hooks, but sometimes the wind will drive them, during the night, upon the deck, where they are discovered in the morning, dead, not having sufficient strength to raise themselves from dry places. In this way, I obtained a few specimens. Today, August 15th, we enjoyed a most interesting sight. We happened, exactly at twelve o'clock, to be in the sun's zenith, and the sunbeams fell so perpendicularly that every object was perfectly shadowless. We put books, chairs, ourselves in the sun, and were highly delighted with this unusual kind of amusement. Luckily, we had chanced to be at the right spot at the right time, had we, at the same hour, been only one degree nearer or one degree further, we should have lost the entire sight. When we saw it, we were 14 degrees 6 minutes. A minute is equal to a nautical mile. All observations with the sextant. 
were out of the question until we were once more some degrees from the zenith footnote the sextant is a mathematical instrument by which the different degrees of longitude and latitude are determined and the hour known the chronometers also are set by it in order to find the latitude the ship is in an observation is taken at noon but only when the sun shines this last is absolutely necessary since it is from the shadow cast upon the figures of the instrument that the reckoning is made the longitude can be determined both morning and afternoon as the sun in this case is not necessary end of footnote seventeenth of august shoals of tunny fish fish four and five feet long and belonging to the dolphin tribe were seen tumbling about the ship a harpoon was quickly procured and one of the sailors sent out with it on the bowsprit but whether he had bad luck or was unskilled in the art of harpooning he missed his mark the most wonderful part of the story though was that all the fish disappeared as if by magic and did not appear again for some days it seemed as if they had whispered and warned each other of the threatened danger all the oftener however did we see another inhabitant of the sea namely that beautiful mollusca the fisolida called by the sailors portuguese sail ship portuguese sailing ship when floating upon the surface of the sea with its long crest which it can elevate or depress at pleasure it really resembles a delicate tiny little sailing vessel i was very desirous of catching one of these little creatures but this could only be effected by means of a net which i had not got nor had i either needle or twine to make one necessity however is the mother of invention so i manufactured a knitting needle of wood unravelled some thick string and in a few hours possessed a net very soon afterwards a mollusca had been captured and placed in a tub filled with sea-water the little creature's body is about six inches long and two inches high the crest extends above the hole of the back and in the middle where it is highest measures about an inch and a half both the crest and body are transparent and appear as if tinged with rose colour from the belly which is violet are suspended a number of threads or arms of the same colour i hung the little thing up to dry at the stern outside the ship some of the threads reached down into the water a depth of at least twelve feet but most of them fell off after the animal was dead the crest remained erect and the body perfectly filled out but the beautiful rose colour gradually changed to white eighteenth of august to-day we had a heavy thunderstorm for which we were very grateful as it cooled the air considerably between one degree and two or three degrees north latitude frequent changes in the weather are very common for instance on the morning of the twentieth we were overtaken by a strong wind which lashed up the sea to a great height and continued until evening when it gave way to a tropical shower which we at home should call a perfect water-spout the deck was instantaneously transformed into a lake while at the same time the wind had so completely fallen that even the rudder enjoyed a holiday this rain cost me a night's rest for when i went to take possession of my berth i found the bedclothes drenched through and through and was fain to content myself with a wooden bench for a couch on the twenty seventh of august we got beyond these hostile latitudes and were received by the anxiously desired southeast trade wind which hurried us quickly on our voyage we were now very near the equator and like all other travellers wished very much to see the celebrated constellations of the south i myself was most interested in the southern cross and as i could not find it among the stars i begged the captain to point it out to me both he and the first mate however said that they had never heard of it and the second mate was the only one to whom it did not appear entirely unknown with his help we really did discover in the spangled firmament four stars which had something of the form of a somewhat crooked cross but were certainly not remarkable in themselves nor did they excite the least enthusiasm amongst us a most magnificent spectacle was on the contrary formed by orion jupiter and venus the latter indeed shone so brilliantly that her gleams formed a silver furrow across the waves the great frequency of falling stars is another fact that i cannot corroborate they are perhaps more frequent than in cold climates but are far from being as common as is said 
and as for their size, I saw only one which surpassed ours, and this appeared about three times as large as an ordinary star. For some days we also had now seen the Cape, or Magellan's Clouds, and also the so-called Black Cloud. The first are bright, and like the Milky Way are formed of numberless small stars, invisible to the naked eye. The latter presents a black appearance, and is said to be produced by the absence of all stars whatever from this part of the heavens. All these different signs prepared us for the most interesting moment of our voyage, namely, passing the line. On the 29th of August, at 10 o'clock p.m., we saluted the southern hemisphere for the first time. A feeling nearly allied to pride excited everyone, but more especially those who crossed the line for the first time. We shook each other by the hand and congratulated one another mutually, as if we had done some great and heroic deed. One of the passengers had brought with him a bottle or two of champagne to celebrate the event. The cork sprang gaily in the air, and with a joyful huzzah, the health of the new hemisphere was drunk. No festivities took place among the crew. This is at present the case in most vessels, as such amusements seldom end without drunkenness and disorder. The sailors, however, could not let the cabin boy, who passed the line for the first time, go quite scot-free so he was well christened in a few buckets of salt water. Long before passing the line, we passengers had frequently spoken of all the sufferings and tortures we should be subjected to at the equator. Everyone had read or heard something exceedingly horrible, which he duly communicated to all the rest. One expected headache or colic. A second had pictured to himself the sailors falling down from exhaustion. A third dreaded such a fearful degree of heat that it would not only melt the pitch but would so dry up the ship that nothing but continual throwing water over it could prevent its catching fire, while a fourth feared that all the provisions would be spoilt and ourselves nearly starved to death. Footnote. The heat does not require to be very great in order to melt the pitch on a ship's seams. I have seen it become soft and form bladders when the thermometer stood at 81.5 in the sun. End of footnote. For my own part, I had already congratulated myself on the tragical stories I should be able to present to my readers. I beheld them shedding tears at the narration of the sufferings we had experienced, and I already appeared to myself half a martyr. Alas, I was sadly deceived. We all remained in perfectly good health. Not a sailor sank exhausted. The ship did not catch fire, and the provisions were not spoilt. They were just as bad as before. 3rd of September from two degrees to three degrees south latitude, the wind is very irregular, and frequently excessively violent. Today we passed the eight degrees south latitude without seeing land, which put the captain in the best of humours. He explained to us that if we had seen land, we should have been obliged to retrace our course almost to the line, because the current sets in with such violence towards the land, that the voyage could only be made at a proper distance. 7th of September between ten degrees and twenty degrees south latitude, we again met with very peculiar prevalent winds. They are called vamperos, and oblige the sailor to be always on his guard, as they spring up very suddenly, and are often extremely violent. We were overtaken by one during the night, but luckily it was not of the worst kind. In a few hours it had entirely passed over, but the sea did not become calm again for a considerable time. On the ninth and eleventh of September, we encountered some short gusts of the Vamperos, the most violent being the last. Twelfth and thirteenth of September, the first was termed by the captain merely a stiffish breeze, but the second was entered in the log as a storm. Footnote: Every four hours, the state of the wind, how many miles the vessel has made, in fact, every occurrence is noted down in the log with great exactitude. The captain is obliged to show this book to the owners of the ship at the conclusion of the voyage. End of footnote. The stiffish breeze cost us one sail, the storm two. During the time it lasted, the sea ran so high that it was with the greatest difficulty we could eat. With one hand we were obliged to grasp the plate, and at the same time to hold fast on to the table, while with the other we managed with considerable difficulty to convey the food to our mouth. At night I was obliged to stow myself firmly in my berth with my cloaks and dresses, 
to protect my body from being bruised black and blue. On the morning of the 13th, I was on deck at break of day. The helmsman led me to the side of the vessel and told me to hold my head overboard and inhale the air. I breathed the most beautiful perfume of flowers. I looked round in astonishment and imagined that I must already be able to see the land. It was, however, still far distant, the soft perfume being merely drifted to us by the wind. It was very remarkable that inside the ship this perfume was not at all perceptible. The sea itself was covered with innumerable dead butterflies and moths, which had been carried out to sea by the storm. Two pretty little birds, quite exhausted by their long flight, were resting upon one of the yards. For us who, during two months and a half, had seen nothing but sky and water, all these things were most satisfactory, and we looked out anxiously for Cape Frio, which we were very near. The horizon, however, was lowering and hazy, and the sun had not force enough to tear the murky veil asunder. We looked forward with joy to the next morning, but during the night were overtaken by another storm, which lasted until two o'clock. The ship's course was changed, and she was driven as far as possible into the open sea, so that, in the end, we were glad enough to reach the next day the same position we had occupied the morning before. Today we caught no glimpse of land, but a few gulls and albatrosses from Cape Frio warned us that we were near it, and afforded us some little amusement. They swam close up to the ship's side, and eagerly swallowed every morsel of bread or meat that was thrown to them. The sailors tried to catch some with a hook and line, and were fortunate enough to succeed. They were placed upon the deck, and, to my great surprise, I perceived that they were unable to raise themselves from it. If we touched them, they merely dragged themselves with great difficulty a few paces further, although they could rise very easily from the surface of the water and fly extremely high. One of the gentlemen was exceedingly anxious to kill and stuff one of them, but the superstition of the sailors was opposed to this. They said that if birds were killed on board ship, their death would be followed by long calms. We yielded to their wishes and restored the little creatures to the air and waves, their native elements. This was another proof that superstition is still deep-rooted in the minds of sailors. Of this we had afterwards many other instances. The captain, for example, was always very averse to the passengers amusing themselves with cards or any other game of chance. In another vessel, as I was informed, no one was allowed to write on Sunday, etc. Empty casks or locks of wood were also very frequently thrown overboard during a calm, probably as sacrifices to the deities of the winds. On the morning of the 16th of September, we at last had the good fortune to perceive the mountains before Rio Janeiro, and soon singled out the sugar loaf. At two o'clock p.m. we entered the bay and port of Rio Janeiro. Immediately at the entrance of the bay are several conical rocks, some of which, like the sugar loaf, rise singly from the sea, while others are joined at the base and are almost inaccessible. Footnote. Some years ago, a sailor made an attempt to scale the sugar loaf. He succeeded in attaining the summit, but never came down again. Most likely, he made a false step and was precipitated into the sea. End of footnote. Between these ocean mountains, if I may be allowed the expression, are seen the most remarkably beautiful views. Now, extraordinary ravines, then some charmingly situated quarter of the town presently the open sea, and the moment after some delightful bay. From the bay itself, at the end of which the capital is built, rise masses of rock, serving as foundations to different fortifications. On some of these eminences are chapels and fortresses. Ships are obliged to pass as near as possible to one of the largest of the latter, namely Santa Cruz, in order that their papers may be examined. From this fortress to the right, stretches the beautiful mountain range of the Cerrados Orgoas, which, in conjunction with other mountains and hills, fringes a lovely bay, on the shores of which lie the little town of Praia Grande, some few villages and detached farmhouses. At the extremity of the principal bay stands Rio Janeiro, surrounded by a tolerably high chain of mountains, among which is the Corcovado, 2,100 feet high, behind which, more inland, is the Organ Mountain, 
which owes its name to the many gigantic peaks placed upright, one against the other like the pipes of an organ. The highest peak is 5,000 feet high. One portion of the town is concealed by the Telegraph Mountain, and several hills on which, besides the Telegraph, there is a monastery of Capuchin monks and other smaller buildings. Of the town itself are seen several rows of houses and open squares, the great hospital, the monasteries of St. Lucia and Moro do Costello, the convent of St. Bento and fine church of St. Candelaria, and some portions of the really magnificent aqueduct. Close to the sea is the public garden, Paseo Publico, of the town, which, from its fine palm trees and elegant stone gallery, with two summer houses, forms a striking object. To the left, upon eminences, stand some isolated churches and monasteries, such as St. Gloria, St. Teresa, etc. Near these are the Praia Flamingo and Botafogo, large villages with beautiful villas, pretty buildings and gardens, which stretch far away until lost in the neighbourhood of the Sugarloaf, and thus close this most wonderful panorama. In addition to all this, the many vessels, partly in the harbour before the town, partly anchored in the different bays, the rich and luxurious vegetation, and the foreign and novel appearance of the whole, help to form a picture of whose beauties my pen, unfortunately, can never convey an adequate idea. It rarely happens that a person is so lucky as to enjoy, immediately on his arrival, so beautiful and extensive a view as fell to my lot. Fogs, clouds, or a hazy state of the atmosphere very often conceal certain portions, and thus disturb the wonderful impression of the whole. Whenever this is the case, I would advise everyone who intends stopping any time in Rio Janeiro to take a boat on a perfectly clear day as far as Santa Cruz in order to behold this peculiarly beautiful prospect. It was almost dark before we reached the place of anchorage. We were first obliged to stop at Santa Cruz to have the ship's papers examined, and then appear before an officer who took from us our passports and sealed letters, then before a surgeon who inspected us to see if we had not brought the plague or yellow fever, and lastly before another officer who took possession of different packets and boxes and assigned us the spot to anchor in. It was now too late for us to land, and the captain alone proceeded on shore. We, however, remained for a long time on deck, contemplating the magnificent picture before us, until both land and sea lay shrouded in night. With a light heart did we all retire to rest, the goal of our long voyage having been attained without any misfortune worthy of being mentioned. A cruel piece of intelligence was in store for the poor tailor's wife alone, but the good captain did not break it to her to-day, in order to let her enjoy the undisturbed night's rest. As soon as the tailor heard that his wife was really on her passage out, he ran off with a negress, and left naught behind, but debts. The poor woman had given up a sure means of subsistence in her native land. She supported herself by cleaning lace and ladies' apparel, and had devoted her little savings to pay the expenses of her voyage, and all to find herself deserted and helpless in a strange hemisphere. Footnote. The worthy Lalamont family received her, a few days after her arrival, into their house. End of footnote. From Hamburg to Rio Janeiro is about 8,750 miles. End of chapter 1section three of a woman's journey round the world this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org a woman's journey round the world by ida laura pfeiffer chapter two arrival and sojourn in rio janeiro introduction arrival description of the town the blacks and their relations to the whites, arts and sciences, festivals of the church, baptism of the imperial princes, fat in the barracks, climate and vegetation, manners and customs, a few words to immigrants. I remained in Rio de Janeiro above two months, exclusive of the time devoted to my different excursions into the interior of the country. It is very far from my intention, however, 
to tire the reader with a regular catalogue of every trifling and ordinary occurrence. I shall content myself with describing the most striking features in the town, and likewise in the manners and customs of the inhabitants, according to the opportunities I possessed, during my stay, to form an opinion of them. I shall then give an account of my various excursions in an appendix, and afterwards resume the thread of my journal. It was on the morning of the 17th of September that, after the lapse of nearly two months and a half, I first set foot upon dry land. The captain himself accompanied the passengers on shore, after having earnestly advised each one separately to be sure and smuggle nothing, more especially sealed letters. In no part of the world, he assured us, were the custom house officers so strict and the penalties so heavy. On coming in sight of the guardship, we began to feel quite frightened from this description, and made up our minds that we should be examined from top to toe. The captain begged permission to accompany us on shore. This was immediately granted, and the whole ceremony was completed. During the entire period that we lived on board the ship, and were continually going and coming to and from the town, we never were subjected to any search. It was only when we took chests and boxes with us that we were obliged to proceed to the custom house, where all effects are strictly examined, and a heavy duty levied upon merchandise, books, etc., etc. We landed at the Praia dos Mineiros, a disgusting and dirty sort of square, inhabited by a few dozen blacks, equally disgusting and dirty, who were squatted on the ground, and praising at the top of their voices the fruits and sweetmeats which they were offering for sale. Thence we proceeded directly into the principal street, Rua Direita, whose only beauty consists in its breadth. It contained several public buildings, such as the post office, the custom house, the exchange, the guard house, etc., all of which, however, are so insignificant in appearance that any one would pass them by unnoticed, if there were not always a number of people loitering before them. At the end of this street stands the Imperial Palace, a commonplace large building, exactly resembling a private house, without the least pretensions to taste or architectural beauty. The square before it, Largo do Passo, whose only ornament, a plain fountain, is extremely dirty, and serves at night as a sleeping place for a number of poor free negroes, who, on getting up in the morning, perform the various duties of their toilet in public, with the most supreme indifference. A part of the square is walled off and employed as a market for fish, fruit, vegetables, and poultry. Of the remaining streets, the Rua Misericórdia and the Rua Ouvidor are the most interesting. The latter contains the finest and largest shops, but we must not expect the magnificent establishments we behold in the cities of Europe. In fact, we meet with little that is beautiful or costly. The flower shops were the only objects of particular attraction for me. In these shops are exposed for sale the most lovely artificial flowers, made of birds' feathers, fishes' scales, and beetles' wings. Of the squares, the finest is the Largo do Rocio, the largest, the Largo de Santana. In the first, which is always kept tolerably clean, stand the opera house, the government house, the police office, etc. This, too, is the starting place for most of the omnibuses, which traverse the town in all directions. The last-named square is the dirtiest in the whole town. On crossing it for the first time, I perceived lying about me half-putrid cats and dogs, and even a mule in the same state. The only ornament of this square is a fountain, and I almost think I should prefer it if the fountain were, in this case, taken away. For, as soft water is not very abundant in Rio de Janeiro, the washerwoman's noble art pitches its tent wherever it finds any, and most willingly of all, when, at the same time, it meets with a good drying ground. The consequence is that, in the Largo de Santana, there's always such an amount of washing and drying, of squalling and screaming, that you are glad to get away as quickly as possible. There's nothing remarkable in the appearance of the churches, either inside or out. 
the church and cloister of São Bento and the church of Santa Candelaria are the most deceptive. From a distance they have a very imposing look. The houses are built in the European fashion, but are small and insignificant. Most of them have only a ground floor or a single story. Two stories are rarely met with. Neither are there any terraces and verandas adorned with elegant trellis work and flowers, as there are in other warm countries. Ugly little balconies hang from the walls, while clumsy wooden shutters close up the windows and prevent the smallest sunbeam from penetrating into the rooms, where everything is enveloped in almost perfect darkness. This, however, is a matter of the greatest indifference to the Brazilian ladies, who certainly never over-fatigue themselves with reading or working. The town offers, therefore, very little in the way of squares, streets and buildings, which, for a stranger, can prove in the least attractive. While the people that he meets are truly shocking, nearly all being negroes and negresses, with flat, ugly noses, thick lips and short woolly hair, they are, too, generally half-naked, with only a few miserable rags on their backs, or else they are thrust into the worn-out European-cut clothes of their masters. To every four or five blacks may be reckoned a mulatto, and it's only here and there that a white man is to be seen. This horrible picture is rendered still more revolting by the frequent bodily infirmities which everywhere meet the eye. Among these, elephantiasis, causing horrible club feet, is especially conspicuous. There is, too, no scarcity of persons afflicted with blindness and other ills. Even the cats and dogs that run about the gutters in great numbers partake of the universal ugliness. Most of them are covered with the mange, or are full of wounds and sores. I should like to be endowed with the magic power of transporting hither every traveller who starts back with affright from the lanes of Constantinople, and asserts that the sight of the interior of the city destroys the effect produced by it when viewed at a distance. It is true that the interior of Constantinople is exceedingly dirty, and that the numbers of small houses, the narrow streets, the unevenness of the pavement, the filthy dogs, etc., do not strike the beholder as excessively picturesque. But then he soon comes upon some magnificent edifice of the time of the Moors or Romans, some wondrous mosque or majestic palace, and can continue his walk through endless cemeteries and forests of dreamy cypresses. He steps aside before a pasha or priest of high rank, who rides by on his noble steed, surrounded by a brilliant retinue. He encounters Turks in splendid costumes, and Turkish women with eyes that flash through their veils like fire. He beholds Persians with their high caps, Arabs with their nobly formed features, dervises in full caps and plated petticoats like women, and now and then some carriage, beautifully painted and gilt, drawn by superbly caparisoned oxen. All these different objects fully make up for whatever amount of dirtiness may occasionally be met with. In Rio de Janeiro, however, there is nothing that can in any way amuse, or atone for the horrible and disgusting sights which everywhere meet the eye. It was not until I had been here several weeks that I became somewhat accustomed to the appearance of the negroes and mulattoes. I then discovered many very pretty figures among the young negresses, and handsome, expressive countenances among the somewhat dark-complexioned Brazilian and Portuguese women. The men seems, as regards beauty, to be less favored. The bustle in the streets is far less than what I had been led to expect from the many descriptions I had heard, and is certainly not to be compared to that at Naples or Messina. The greatest amount of noise is made by those negroes who carry burdens, and especially by such as convey the sacks full of coffee on board the different vessels. They strike up a monotonous sort of song, to the tune of which they keep step, but which sounds very disagreeable. It possesses, however, one advantage. It warns the foot passenger, and affords him time to get out of the way. In the Brazils, Every kind of dirty or hard work, whether indoors or out, is performed by the blacks, who here, in fact, replace the lower classes. Many, however, 
learned trades, and frequently are to be compared to the most skillful Europeans. I have seen blacks in the most elegant workshops, making wearing apparel, shoes, tapestry, gold or silver articles, and met many a nattily dressed negro maiden working at the finest ladies' dresses, or the most delicate embroidery. I often thought I must be dreaming when I beheld these poor creatures, whom I had pictured to myself as roaming free through their native forests, exercising such occupations in shops and rooms. Yet they do not appear to feel it as much as might be supposed. They were always merry and joking over their work. Among the so-called educated class of the place, there are many who, in spite of all the proofs of mechanical skill, as well as general intelligence which the blacks often display, persist in asserting that they are so far inferior to the whites in mental power that they can only be looked upon as a link between the monkey tribe and the human race. I allow that they are somewhat behind the whites in the intellectual culture, but I believe that this is not because they are deficient in understanding, but because their education is totally neglected. No schools are erected for them, no instruction given them. In a word, not the least thing is done to develop the capabilities of their minds. As was the case in all despotic countries, their minds are purposely kept and chained. For, were they once to awake from their present condition, the consequences to the whites might be fearful. They are four times as numerous as the latter, and, if they ever become conscious of this superiority, the whites might probably be placed in the position that the unhappy blacks have hitherto occupied. But I am losing myself in conjectures and reasonings, which may, perhaps, become the pen of a learned man, but certainly not mine, since I assuredly do not possess the necessary amount of education to decide upon such questions. My object is merely to give a plain description of what I have seen. Although the number of slaves in the Brazils is very great, there is nowhere such a thing as a slave market. The importation of them is publicly prohibited, yet thousands are smuggled in every year, and disposed of in some underhand manner, which everyone knows and everyone employs. It is true that English ships are constantly cruising off the coasts of Brazil and Africa, but even if a slaver happened to fall into their hands, the poor blacks, I was told, were no more free than if they had come to the Brazils. They are all transported to the English colonies, where, at the expiration of ten years, they are supposed to be set at liberty. But during this period, their owners allow the great number to die, of course, in the returns only, and the poor slaves remain slaves still. But I repeat that I only know this from hearsay. After all, slaves are far from being as badly off as many Europeans imagine. In the Brazils they are generally pretty well treated, they are not overworked, their food is good and nutritious, and the punishments are neither particularly frequent nor heavy. The crime of running away is the only one which is visited with great rigor. Besides a severe beating, they have fetters placed round their neck and feet. These they have to wear for a considerable period. Another manner of punishment consists in making them wear a tin mask, which is fastened with a lock behind. This is the mode of punishment adopted for those who drink, or are in the habit of eating earth or lime. During my long stay in the Brazils, I only saw one negro who had got on a mask of this description. I very much doubt whether, on the whole, the lot of these slaves is not less wretched than that of the peasants of Russia, Poland, or Egypt, who are not called slaves. I was one day very much amused at being asked to stand godmother to a negro, which I did, although I was not present at either baptism or confirmation. There is a certain custom here, that when a slave has done anything for which he expects to be punished, he endeavors to fly to some friend of his owner, and obtain a note, asking for the remission of his punishment. The writer of such a letter has the title of godfather bestowed on him, and it would be accounted an act of the greatest impoliteness not to grant the godfather's request. In this way, I myself was fortunate enough to save a slave from punishment. The town is tolerably well lighted, and the lighting is continued to a considerable distance, on all sides, beyond the town itself. 
this measure was introduced on account of the great number of blacks. No slave dare be seen in the streets later than nine o'clock in the evening, without having a pass from his master, certifying that he is going on business for him. If a slave is ever caught without a pass, he is immediately conveyed to the house of correction, where his head is shaved, and he himself obliged to remain until his master buys his freedom for four or five mil hays, eight shillings, eight pence, or ten shillings, ten pence. In consequence of this regulation, the streets may be traversed with safety at any hour of the night. One of the most disagreeable things in Rio de Janeiro is the total absence of sewers. In a heavy shower, every street becomes a regular stream, which it is impossible to pass on foot. In order to traverse them, it is requisite to be carried over by negroes. At such times, all intercourse generally ceases. The streets are deserted, parties are put off, and even the payment of bills of exchange deferred. It is very seldom that people will hire a carriage, for it is an absurd custom here to pay as much for a short drive as if the carriage were required for the whole day. In both cases, the charge is six mil hays, thirteen shillings. The carriages are half covered once, with seats for two, and are drawn by a pair of mules, on one of which the driver rides. Carriages and horses, like the English, are very seldom to be met with. As regards the arts and sciences, I may mention the Academy of Fine Arts, Museum, Theater, etc. In the Academy of Fine Arts is something of everything, and not much of anything. A few figures and busts, most in plaster, a few architectural plans and pencil drawings, and a collection of very old paintings. It really seemed to me as if some private picture gallery had been carefully weeded of all the rubbish in it, which had then been put here out of the way. Most of the oil paintings are so injured that it is scarcely possible to make out what they are intended to represent, which, after all, is no great loss. The one thing respectable about them is their venerable antiquity. A startling contrast is produced by the copies of them made by the students. If the colors in the old pictures are faded, in the modern ones they blaze with a superfluity of vividness, red, yellow, green, etc., are there in all their force. Such a thing as mixing, softening, or blending them has evidently never been thought of. Even at the present moment, I really am at a loss to determine whether the worthy students intended to found a new school for coloring, or whether they merely desired to make up in the copies for the damage time had done the originals. There were as many blacks and mulattoes among the students as whites, but the number of them altogether was inconsiderable. Music, especially singing and the pianoforte, is almost in a more degraded position than painting. In every family, the young ladies play and sing, but of tact, style, arrangement, time, etc., the innocent creatures have not the remotest idea, so that the easiest and most taking melodies are often not recognizable. The sacred music is a shade better, although even the arrangements of the imperial chapel itself are susceptible of many improvements. The military bands are certainly the best, and these are generally composed of negroes and mulattoes. The exterior of the opera house does not promise anything very beautiful or astonishing, and the stranger is consequently much surprised to find on entering a large and magnificent house with a deep stage. I should say it could contain more than two thousand persons. There are four tiers of spacious boxes rising one above the other, the balustrades of which, formed of delicately wrought iron trellis work, give the theater a very tasty appearance. The pit is only for men. I was present at a tolerably good representation by an Italian company of the opera of Lucrezia Borgia. The scenery and costumes are not amiss. If, however, I was agreeably surprised by my visit to the theater, I experienced quite a contrary feeling on going to the museum. In a land so richly and luxuriously endowed by nature, I expect an equally rich and magnificent museum, and found a number of very fine rooms, it is true, which one day or other may be filled, but which at present are empty. The collection of birds, which is the most complete of all, is really fine. That of the minerals is very defective, 
and those of the quadrupeds and insects poor in the extreme. The objects which most excited my curiosity were the heads of four savages in excellent preservation. Two of them belonged to the Malay, and two to the New Zealand tribes. The latter especially I could not sufficiently contemplate, completely covered as they were with tattooing of the most beautiful and elegant design, and so well preserved that they seemed only to have just ceased to live. During the period of my stay in Rio de Janeiro, the rooms of the museum were undergoing repairs, and the new classification of the different objects was also talked of. In consequence of this, the building was not open to the public, and I have to thank the kindness of Herr Hiedel, the director, for allowing me to view it. He acted himself as my guide, and, like me, regretted that in a country where the formation of a rich museum would be so easy a task, so little had been done. I likewise visited the studio of the sculptor Patrick, a native of Dresden, who came over at the unsolicited command of the court, to execute a statue of the emperor in Carrera marble. The emperor is represented the size of life, in a standing position, and arrayed in his imperial robes, with the ermine cloak thrown over his shoulder. The head is strikingly like, and the whole figure worked out of the stone with great artistic skill. I believe this statue was destined for some public building. End of section 3《Section Section Four of A Woman's Journey Round the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Woman's Journey Round the World by Ida Laura Pfeiffer. Chapter Two: Arrival and Sojourn in Rio de Janeiro, Part Two. I was fortunate enough during my stay in Rio de Janeiro to witness several different public festivals. The first was on the 21st of September, in the Church of Santa Cruz, on the occasion of celebrating the anniversary of the patron saint of the country. Early in the morning, several hundred soldiers were drawn up before the church, with an excellent band, which played a number of lively airs. Between ten and eleven, the military and civil officers began gradually to arrive, the subordinate ones, as I was told, coming first. On their entrance into the church, a brownish-red silk cloak, which concealed the whole of the uniform, was presented to each. Every time that another of a higher rank appeared, all those already in the church rose from their seats, and advancing towards the newcomer, as far as the church door, accompanied him respectfully to his place. The emperor and his wife arrived the last of all. The emperor is extremely young, not quite one and twenty, but six feet tall and very corpulent. His features are those of the Habsburg Lothering family. The Empress, a Neapolitan princess, is small and slim, and forms a strange contrast when standing beside the athletic figure of her husband. High Mass, which was listened to with great reverence by every one, began immediately after the entrance of the court, and after this was concluded, the imperial pair proceeded to their carriage, presenting the crowd, who were waiting in the church, their hands to kiss as they went along. This mark of distinction was bestowed not only on the officers and officials of superior rank, but on every one who pressed forward to obtain it. A second and more brilliant festival occurred on the 19th of October. It was the Emperor's birthday, and was celebrated by High Mass in the Imperial Chapel. This chapel is situated near the Imperial Palace, to which it is connected by means of a covered gallery. Besides the imperial family, all the general officers, as well as the first officials of the state, were present at the mass, but in full uniform, without the ugly silk cloaks. Surrounding all was a row of lancers, the bodyguard. It is impossible for any but an eyewitness to form an idea of the richness and profusion of the gold embroidery, the splendid epaulis, and beautiful set orders, etc., displayed on the occasion and I hardly believe that anything approaching it could be seen at any European court. During High Mass, the foreign ambassadors and the ladies and gentlemen admitted to court assembled in the palace, where, on the emperor's return, everyone was admitted to kiss his hand. The ambassadors, however, took no part in this proceeding, but merely made a simple bow. 
This edifying ceremony could easily be seen from the square, as the windows are very near the ground and were also open. On such occasions, continual salutes are fired from the imperial ships, and sometimes from others in the harbor. On the 2nd of November I saw a festival of another description, namely a religious one. During this and the following days, old and young proceed from one church to another to pray for the souls of the departed. They have a singular custom here of not burying all their dead in the churchyard, many bodies being placed, at an additional expense, in the church itself. For this purpose there are, in every church, particular chambers, with catacombs formed in the walls. The corpse is strewed with lime, and laid in a catacomb of this description, where, after a lapse of eight or ten months, the flesh is completely eaten away. The bones are then taken out, cleaned by boiling, and collected in an urn, on which is engraved the name, birthday, etc., of the deceased. These urns are afterwards set up in the passages of the church, or sometimes even taken home by their relations. On All Souls' Day, the walls of the chambers are hung with black cloth, gold lace, and other ornaments, and the urns are richly decorated with flowers and ribbons, and are lighted up by a great number of tapers in silver candelabra and chandeliers, placed upon high stands. From an early hour in the morning until noon, the women and young girls begin praying very fervently for the souls of their deceased relations, and the young gentlemen, who are quite as curious as those in Europe, go to see the young girls pray. Females on this day are dressed in mourning, and often wear, to the great disgust of the curious young gentlemen before mentioned, a black veil over their head and face. No one, by the way, is allowed to wear a bonnet at any festival of the church. But the most brilliant of the public festivals I saw here was the christening of the imperial princes, which took place on the 15th of November in the imperial chapel, which is connected with the palace. Towards three o'clock in the afternoon, a number of troops were drawn up in the courtyard of the palace. The guards were distributed in the corridors and the church, while the bands played a series of pleasing melodies, frequently repeating the national anthem, which the late emperor, Peter I, is said to have composed. Equipage after equipage began to roll up to the palace, and set down the most brilliantly attired company of both sexes. At four o'clock, the procession began to leave the palace. First came the court band, clothed in red velvet, and followed by three heralds, in old Spanish custom, magnificently decorated hats and feathers, and black velvet suits. Next walked the officers of the law, and the authorities of every rank, chamberlains, court physicians, senators, deputies, generals, and ecclesiastics, privy councillors and secretaries, and lastly, after this long line of different personages, came the lord steward of the young princes, whom he bore upon a magnificent white velvet cushion, edged with gold lace. Immediately behind him followed the emperor and the little princess's nurse, surrounded by the principal nobles and ladies of the court. On passing through the triumphal arch of the gallery, and coming before the pallium of the church, the emperor took his little daughter into his own arms, and presented her to the people an act which pleased me exceedingly, and which I considered extremely appropriate. The empress with her ladies had likewise already arrived in the church through the inner corridors, and the ceremony commenced forthwith. The instant the princess was baptized, the event was announced to the whole town by salvos of artillery, volleys of musketry, and the discharge of rockets. At the conclusion of the ceremony, which lasted above an hour, the procession returned in the same order in which it had arrived, and the chapel was then opened to the people. I was curious enough to enter with the rest, and I must own I was quite surprised at the magnificence and taste with which the building was decorated. The walls were covered with silk and velvet hangings, ornamented with gold fringe, while rich carpets were spread underfoot. On large tables, in the middle of the nave, were displayed the most valuable specimens of the church plate gold and silver vases, immense dishes, plates and goblets artistically engraved, and ornamented with embossed or open work, while magnificent vessels of crystal, containing the most beautiful flowers, and massive candelabra, with innumerable lights, sparkled in the midst. On a separate table, near the high altar, 
were all the costly vessels and furniture which had been employed at the christening and in one of the side chapels the princess's cradle covered with white satin and ornamented with gold lace in the evening the town or rather the public buildings were illuminated the proprietors of private houses are not required to light up and they either avail themselves of the privilege or at most hang out a few lanterns a fact which will be readily understood when it is known that such illuminations last for six or eight days the public buildings on the contrary are covered from top to bottom with countless lamps which look exactly like a sea of fire the most original and really amusing facts to celebrate the christening of the princes were those given on several evenings in some of the barracks even the emperor himself made his appearance there for a few moments on different occasions they were also the only fetes i saw here which were not mixed up with religious solemnities the sole actors in them were the soldiers themselves of whom the handsomest and most active had previously been selected and exercised in the various evolutions and dances the most brilliant of these fetes took place in the barracks of the rua barboni a semicircular and very tasty gallery was erected in the spacious courtyard and in the middle of the gallery were busts of the imperial couple this gallery was set apart for the ladies invited who made their appearance as if dressed for the most splendid ball at the entrance of the courtyard they were received by the officers and conducted to their places before the gallery stood the stage and at each side of the ladder were ranged rows of seats for the less fashionable females beyond these seats was standing room for the men at eight o'clock the band commenced playing and shortly afterwards the representation began the soldiers appeared dressed in various costumes as highlanders poles spaniards etc nor was there any scarcity of danseuses, who of course were likewise private soldiers what pleased me most was that both the dress and behaviour of the military young ladies were highly becoming i had expected at least some little exaggeration or at best no very elegant spectacle and was therefore greatly astonished not only with the correctness of the dances and evolutions but also with the perfect propriety with which the whole affair was conducted the last fete that i saw took place on the second of december in celebration of the emperor's birthday after high mass the different dignitaries again waited on the emperor to offer their congratulations and were admitted to the honour of kissing his hand etc the imperial couple then placed themselves at a window of the palace while the troops defiled before them with their bands playing the most lively airs it would be difficult to find better dressed soldiers than those here every private might easily be mistaken for a lieutenant or at least a non-commissioned officer but unluckily their bearing size and colour are greatly out of keeping with the splendour of their uniform a mere boy of fourteen standing next to a full-grown well-made man a white coming after black and so on the men are pressed into the service the time of serving is from four to six years i had heard and read a great deal in europe of the natural magnificence and luxury of the brazils of the ever clear and smiling sky and the extraordinary charm of the continual spring but though it is true that the vegetation is perhaps richer and the fruitfulness of the soil more luxuriant and vigorous than in any other part of the world and that every one who desires to see the working of nature in its greatest force and incessant activity must come to brazil still it must not be thought that all is good and beautiful and that there is nothing which will not weaken the magical effect of the first impression although every one begins by praising the continual verdure and the uninterrupted splendour of spring met with in this country he is in the end but too willing to allow that even this in time loses its charm a little winter would be preferable as the reawakening of nature the resuscitation of the slumbering plants the return of the sweet perfume of spring enchances all the more simply because during a short period we have been deprived of it i found the climate and the air exceedingly oppressive and the heat although at that period hardly above eighty six degrees in the shade very weakening during the warm months which last from the end of december to may the heat rises in the shade to ninety nine degrees and in the sun to above a hundred twenty two 
in egypt i bore a greater amount of heat with far greater ease a circumstance which may perhaps be accounted for by the fact that the climate is there drier while here there is always an immense degree of moisture fogs and mists are very common the hills and eminences nay even whole tracts of country are often enveloped in impenetrable gloom and the whole atmosphere loaded with damp vapours in the month of november i was seriously indisposed for a considerable period i suffered especially in the town from an oppressive feeling of fatigue and weakness and to the kindness and friendship of herr geiger the secretary to the austrian consulate and his wife who took me with them into the country and showed me the greatest attention do i alone owe my recovery i ascribed my illness altogether to the unusual dampness of the atmosphere the most agreeable season is said to be the winter from june to october that with a temperature of from sixty three degrees to seventy two degrees is mostly dry and clear this period is generally selected by the inhabitants for travelling during the summer violent thunderstorms are of frequent occurrence i myself only saw three during my stay in the brazils all of which were over in an hour and a half the lightning was almost incessant and spread like a sheet of fire over the greater portion of the horizon the thunder on the other hand was inconsiderable from sixteenth of september to ninth of december were so rare that i really could have counted them and i am at a loss to understand how so many travellers have spoken of the ever beautiful smiling and blue sky of the brazils this must be true of some other portion of the year a fine evening and long twilight is another source of enjoyment which may be said to be unknown at sunset every one hastens home as it is immediately followed by darkness and damp in the height of summer the sun sets at about a quarter past six and all the rest of the year six o'clock twenty or thirty minutes afterwards night sets in the mosquitoes ants baradon and sand fleas are another source of annoyance many a night have i been obliged to sit up tormented and tortured by the bite of these insects it is hardly possible to protect provisions from the attacks of the baratin and ants the latter in fact often appear in long trains of immeasurable length pursuing their course over every obstacle which stands in the way during my stay in the country at herr geiger's i beheld a swarm of this description traverse a portion of the house it was really most interesting to see what a regular line they formed nothing could make them deviate from the direction they had first determined on madame geiger told me that she was one night awoke by a horrible itching she sprang immediately out of bed and beheld a swarm of ants of the above description pass over her bed there is no remedy for this the end of the procession which often lasts four or six hours must be waited for with patience provisions are to some extent protected from them by placing the legs of the tables and presses in plates filled with water clothes and linen are laid in tightly fitting tin canisters to protect them not only from the ants but also from the baratin and the damp the worst plague of all however are the sand fleas which attach themselves to one's toes underneath the nails or sometimes to the soles of the feet the moment a person feels an itching in these parts he must immediately look at the place if he sees a small black point surrounded by a small white ring the former is the flea and the latter the eggs which it has laid in the flesh the first thing done is to loosen the skin all round as far as the white ring is visible the whole deposit is then extracted and a little snuff strewed in the empty space the best plan is to call in the first black you may happen to see as they all perform this operation very skilfully as regards the natural products of the brazils a great many of the most necessary articles are wanting in the list it is true that there are sugar and coffee but no corn no potatoes and none of our delicious varieties of fruit the flour of manioc which is mixed up with the other materials of which the dishes are composed supplies the place of bread but is far from being so nutritious and strengthening while the different kinds of sweet tasting roots are certainly not to be compared to our potatoes the only fruit which are really excellent are the oranges bananas and mangoes their celebrated pineapples are neither very fragrant nor remarkably sweet i certainly have eaten much finer flavored ones that have been grown in an european hothouse 
the other kinds of fruit are not worth mentioning. Lastly, with the two very necessary articles of consumption, milk and meat, the former is very watery, and the latter very dry. On instituting a comparison between the Brazil and Europe, both with respect to the impression produced by the whole, as also to the separate advantages and disadvantages of each, we shall perhaps, at first, find the scale inclined towards the former country, but only to turn ultimately with greater certainty in favor of the latter. The Brazils is, perhaps, the most interesting country in the world for travelers, but for a place of permanent residence I should most decidedly prefer Europe. I saw too little of the manners and customs of the country to be qualified to pronounce judgment upon them, and I shall therefore, on this head, confine myself to a few remarks. The manners seem, on the whole, to differ but little from those of Europe. The present possessors of the country, as is well known, derive their descent from Portugal, and the Brazilians might very aptly be termed Europeans translated into Americans, and it is very natural that in this translation many peculiarities have been lost, while others have stood forth in greater relief. The strongest feature in the character of the European American is the greed for gold. This often becomes a passion, and transforms the most faint-hearted white into a hero, for it certainly requires the courage of one to live alone, as planter, on a plantation with perhaps some hundred slaves, far removed from all assistance, and with the prospect of being irrevocably lost in the event of any revolt. This grasping feeling is not confined to the men alone. It is found among the women as well, and is greatly encouraged by a common custom here, agreeably to which a husband never assigns his wife so much for pin-money, but, according to his means, make her a present of one or more male or female slaves, whom she can dispose of as she chooses. She generally has them taught how to cook, sew, embroider, or even instructed in some trade, and then lets them out, by the day, week, or month, to people who possess no slaves of their own, or she lets them take in washing at home, or employs them in the manufacture of various ornamental objects, fine pastry, etc., which she sends them out to sell. The money for these things belongs to her, and is generally spent in dress and amusement. In the case of tradesmen and professional men, the wife is always paid for whatever assistance she may lend her husband in his business. Morality, unfortunately, is not very general in the Brazils. One cause of this may be traced to the manner in which the children are first brought up. They are confided entirely to the care of blacks. Negresses suckle them when they are infants. Their nurses are negresses. Their attendants are negresses. And I have often seen girls of eight or ten years of age taken to school or any other place by young negroes. The sensuality of the black is too well known for us to be surprised, with such a state of things, at the general and early demoralization. In no other place did I ever behold so many children with such pale and worn faces as in the streets of Rio de Janeiro. The second cause of immorality here is, without doubt, the want of religion. The Brazils are thoroughly Catholic. Perhaps there are no countries save Spain and Italy that can be compared to them. Almost every day there is some procession, service, or church festival. But these are attended merely for the sake of amusement, while the true religious feeling is entirely wanting. We may also ascribe to this deep demoralization and want of religion the frequent occurrence of murders, committed not for the sake of robbery or theft, but from motives of revenge and hatred. The murderer either commits the deed himself, or has it perpetrated by one of his slaves, who is ready to lend himself for the purpose in consideration of a mere trifle. The discovery of the crime need cause the assassin no anxiety, provided he is rich, for in this country everything, I was assured, can be arranged or achieved with money. I saw several men in Rio de Janeiro who had, according to report, committed either themselves or by the means of others not one but several murders, and yet, they not only enjoyed perfect liberty, but were received in every society. In conclusion, I beg leave to address a few words to those of my countrymen who think of leaving their native land to seek their fortune on the distant coast of Brazil, a few words which I could desire to see as far spread and as well known as possible. There are people in Europe, 
not a whit better than the African slave dealers, and such people are those who delude poor wretches with exaggerated accounts of the richness of America and her beautiful territories, of the overabundance of the products of the soil, and the lack of hands to take advantage of them. These people, however, care little about the poor dupes. Their object is to freight the vessels belonging to them, and to effect this they take from their deluded victim the last penny he possesses. During my stay here, several vessels arrived with unfortunate immigrants of this description. The government had not sent for them, and therefore would afford them no relief. Money they had none, and consequently could not purchase land, neither could they find employment in working on the plantations, as no one will engage Europeans for this purpose, because, being unused to the warm climate, they would soon succumb beneath the work. The unhappy wretches had thus no resource left. They were obliged to beg about the town, and, in the end, were fain to content themselves with the most miserable occupations. A different fate awaits to those who are sent for by the Brazilian government to cultivate the land or colonize the country. These persons receive a piece of uncleared ground, with provisions and other help, but if they come over without any money at all, even their lot is no enviable one. Want, hunger, and sickness destroy most of them, and but a very small number succeed, by unceasing activity and an iron constitution, in gaining a better means of livelihood than what they left behind them in their native land. Those only who exercise some trade find speedy employment and an easy competency but even this will, in all probability, soon be otherwise, for great numbers are pouring in every year, and latterly the Negroes themselves have been, and are still being, more frequently taught every kind of trade. Let every one, therefore, obtain trustworthy information before leaving his native land. Let him weigh calmly and deliberately the step he is about to take, and not allow himself to be carried away by deceptive hopes." The poor creature's misery, on being undeceived, is so much the more dreadful, because he does not learn the truth until it's too late, until he has already fallen a victim to poverty and want. End of section 4please visit LibriVox.org. A Woman's Journey Round the World by Ida Laura Pfeiffer Chapter 3. Excursions in the Neighborhood of Rio Janeiro The Waterfalls near Teixuca, Boa Vista, The Botanical Gardens and Their Environs, The Corcovado Mountains, 2,253 feet above the level of the sea, Palaces of the Imperial Family, The Newly Founded German Colony of Petropolis, Attempt at Murder, by a maroon negro. An excursion to the waterfalls near Teixuca to Boa Vista and the botanical gardens is one of the most interesting near the city, but it requires two days, as it takes a long time to see the botanical gardens alone. Count Berkthold and myself proceeded as far as Andarahi, four miles, in an omnibus, and then continued our journey on foot, between patches of wood and low hills elegant country houses are situated upon the eminences and along the high road when we had walked four miles a path to the right conducted us to a small waterfall neither very high nor well supplied but still the most considerable one in the vicinity of rio janeiro we then returned to the high road and in half an hour reached a little elevated plain whence the eye ranged over a valley of the most remarkable description one portion of it being in a state of wild chaotic confusion, and the other resembling a blooming garden. In the former were strewed masses of broken granite, from which, in some places, larger blocks reared their heads, like so many colossi, while in others large fragments of rock lay towering one above the other. In the second portion stood the finest fruit trees in the midst of luxuriant pastures, this romantic valley is enclosed on three sides by noble mountains, the fourth being open and disclosing a full view of the sea. In this valley we found a small venda, 
where we recruited ourselves with bread and wine, and then continued our excursion to the so-called Great Waterfall, with which we were less astonished than we had been with the smaller one. A very shallow sheet of water flowed down over a broad, but no wise precipitous ledge of rock into the valley beneath. After making our way through the valley, we came to the Porto Massalu, where a number of trunks of trees, hollowed out and lying before the few huts situated in the bay, apprised us that the inhabitants were fishermen. We hired one of these beautiful conveyances to carry us across the little bay. The passage did not take more than a quarter of an hour at the most, and for this, as strangers, we were compelled to pay two thousand hays, four shillings. We had now, at one moment, to wade through plains of sand, and the next to clamber over the rocks by wretched paths. In this laborious fashion we proceeded for at least twelve miles, until we reached the summit of a mountain, which rises like the party wall of two mighty valleys. This peak is justly called the Boa Vista. The view extends over both valleys, with the mountain ranges and rows of hills which intersect them, and embraces, among other high mountains, the Corcovado and the Two Brothers, and, in the distance, the capital, with the surrounding country houses and villages, the various bays, and the open sea. Unwillingly did we leave this beautiful position, but being unacquainted with the distance we should have to go before reaching some hospitable roof, we were obliged to hasten on. Besides which, Negroes are the only persons met with on these lonely roads, and a rencontre with any of them by night is a thing not at all to be desired. We descended, therefore, into the valley, and resolved to sleep at the first inn we came to. More fortunate than most people in such cases, we not only found an excellent hotel with clean rooms and good furniture, but fell in with company which amused us in the highest degree. It consisted of a mulatto family, and attracted all my attention. The wife, a tolerably stout beauty of about thirty, was dressed out in a fashion which, in my own country, no one, save a lady of an exceedingly vulgar taste, would ever think of adopting. All the valuables she possessed in the world she had got about her. Wherever it was possible to stick anything of gold or silver, there it was sure to be. A gown of heavy silk in a real cashmere enveloped her dark brown body, and a charming little white silk bonnet looked very comical placed upon her great heavy head. The husband and five children were worthy of their respective wife and mother, and in fact this excess of dress extended even to the nurse, a real unadulterated negress who was also overloaded with ornaments. On one arm she had five, and on the other six bracelets of stones, pearls and coral, but which, as far as I could judge, did not strike me as being particularly genuine. When the family rose to depart, two landaws, each with four horses, drove up to the door, and man and wife, children and nurse, all stepped in with the same majestic gravity. As I was still looking after the carriages, which were rolling rapidly towards the town, I saw someone on horseback nodding to me. It was my friend, Herr Geiger. On hearing that we intended to remain for the night where we were, he persuaded us to accompany him to the estate of his father-in-law, which was situated close at hand. In the latter gentleman we made the acquaintance of a most worthy and cheerful old man of seventy years of age, who, at that period, was directing architect and superintendent of the fine arts under government. We admired his beautiful garden and charming residence, built with great good taste in the Italian style. Early on the following morning I accompanied Count Berchtold to the botanical gardens. Our curiosity to visit these gardens was very great. We hoped to see there magnificent specimens of trees and flowers from all parts of the world, but we were rather disappointed. The gardens have been founded too recently, and none of the large trees have yet attained their full growth. There is no very great selection of flowers or plants, and to the few that are there not even tickets are fixed to acquaint the visitor with their names. The most interesting objects for us were the monkey's bread tree, with its gourds weighing ten or twenty-five pounds, and containing a number of kernels, which are eaten not only by monkeys, but also by men, the clove, camphor, and cocoa tree, 
the cinnamon and tea bush, etc. We also saw a very peculiar kind of palm tree. The lower portion of the trunk, to the height of two or three feet, was brown and smooth, and shaped like a large tub or vat. The stems that sprang from this were light green, and like the lower part, very smooth, and at the same time shining, as if varnished. They were not very high, and the crest of leaves, as is the case with other palms, only unfolded itself at the top of the tree. Unfortunately, we were unable to learn the names of this kind of palm, and in the whole course of my voyage I never met with another specimen. We did not leave the gardens before noon. We then proceeded on foot four miles as far as Botafogo, and thence reached the city by omnibus. Herr Geiger had invited Count Berthold, Herr Hister, a native of Vienna, and myself to an excursion to the Corcovado Mountains, and accordingly, on the first November, at a time when we are often visited by storms and snow, but when the sun is here in his full force, and the sky without a cloud, at an early hour in the morning, did we commence our pilgrimage. The splendid aqueduct was our guide as far as the springs from which it derives the water, which point we reached in an hour and a half, having been so effectually protected by the deep shade of lovely woods, that even the intense heat of the sun, which reached during the day more than a hundred seventeen degrees in the sun, scarcely annoyed us. We stopped at the springs, and on a sign from Herr Geiger, an athletic negro made his appearance, loaded with a large hamper of provisions. Everything was soon prepared, a white cloth was spread out, and the eatables and drinkables placed upon it. Our meal was seasoned with jokes and good humor, and when we started afresh on our journey, we felt revived both in body and mind. The last cone of the mountain gave us some trouble. The route was very precipitous, and lay over bare, hot masses of rock. But when we did reach the top, we were more than repaid by seeing spread before us such a panorama as most assuredly is very seldom to be met with in the world. All that I had remarked on my entrance into the port lay there before me, only more clearly defined and more extended, with innumerable additional objects. We could see the whole town, all the lower hills, which half hid it from my view on my arrival, the large bay, reaching as far as the Oregon Mountain, and on the other side the romantic valley, containing the botanical gardens and a number of beautiful country houses. I recommend every one who comes to Rio de Janeiro, although it be only for a few days, to make this excursion, since from this spot he can, with one glance, perceive all the treasures which nature, with so truly liberal a hand, has lavished upon the environs of this city. He will here see virgin forests, which, if not quite as thick and beautiful as those farther inland, are still remarkable for their luxuriant vegetation. Mimosa and Ehrenbaum of a gigantic size, palms, wild coffee trees, orchidean, parasites and creepers, blossoms and flowers without end, birds of the most brilliant plumage, immense butterflies, and sparkling insects flying in swarms from blossom to blossom, from branch to branch. A most wonderful effect, also, is produced by the millions of fireflies, which find their way into the very tops of the trees, and sparkle between the foliage, like so many brightly twinkling stars. I had been informed that the ascent of this mountain was attended with great difficulty. I did not, however, find this to be the case, since the summit may be reached with the greatest ease in three hours and three quarters, while three parts of the way can also be performed on horseback. The regular residence of the imperial family may be said to be the palace of Cristóvão, about half an hour's walk from the town. It is there that the emperor spends most of the year, and where also all political councils are held, and state business transacted. The palace is small, and is distinguished neither for taste nor architectural beauty. Its sole charm is its situation. It is placed upon a hill, and commands a view of the Oregon Mountain, and one of the bays. The palace garden itself is small, and is laid out in terraces right down into the valley below. A larger garden that serves as a nursery for plants and trees joins it. 
Both these gardens are highly interesting for Europeans, since they contain a great number of plants, which either do not exist at all in Europe, or are only known from dwarf specimens in hot houses. Herr Hiedel, who has the management of both gardens, was kind enough to conduct us over them himself, and to draw my attention more especially to the tea and bamboo plantations. Ponte de Caxia, four miles from the town, is another imperial garden. There are three mango trees here, which are very remarkable from their age and size. Their branches describe a circle of more than eighty feet in circumference, but they no longer bear fruit. Among the most agreeable walks in the immediate vicinity of the town, I may mention the Telegraph Mountain, the Public Garden, Jardim Público, the Praia do Flamengo, and the Cloisters of Santa Gloria and Santa Teresa, etc. I had heard so much in Rio de Janeiro of the rapid rise of Petrópolis, a colony founded by Germans in the neighborhood of Rio de Janeiro, of the beauty of the country where it was situated, and of the virgin forests through which a part of the road ran, that I could not resist the temptation of making an excursion thither. My traveling companion, Count Berchtold, accompanied me, and on the 26th of September we took two places on board one of the numerous barks which sail regularly, every day, for the Porto de Estrela, a distance of twenty or twenty-two nautical miles, from which place the journey is continued by land. We sailed through a bay remarkable for its extremely picturesque views, and which often reminded me vividly of the peculiar character of the lakes in Sweden. It is surrounded by ranges of lovely hills, and is dotted over with small islands, both separate and in groups, some of which are so completely overgrown with palms, as well as other trees and shrubs, that it seems impossible to land upon them, while others either rear their solitary heads, like huge rocks from the waves, or are loosely piled one upon the other. The round form of many of the latter is especially remarkable. They almost seem to have been cut out with a chisel. Our bark was manned by four negroes and a white skipper. At first we ran before the wind with full sails, and the crew took advantage of this favorable opportunity to make a meal, consisting of a considerable quantity of flour of manioc, boiled fish, roasted milk, Turkish corn, oranges, coconuts, and other nuts of a smaller description. Indeed, there was even white bread, which for blacks is a luxury, and I was greatly delighted to see them so well taken care of. In two hours the wind left us, and the crew were obliged to take to the oars, the manner of using which struck me as very fatiguing. At each dip of the oar into the water, the rower mounts upon a bench before him, and then, during the stroke, throws himself off again with his full force. In two hours more we left the sea, and taking a left-hand direction entered the river Jeromerim, at the mouth of which is an inn, where we stopped half an hour, and where I saw a remarkable kind of lighthouse, consisting of a lantern affixed to a rock. The beauty of the country is now at an end, that is, in the eyes of the vulgar, a botanist would, at this point, find it more than usually wonderful and magnificent, for the most beautiful aquatic plants, especially the nymphia, the pontedera, and the cyprian grass are spread out, both in the water and all around it. The two former twine themselves to the very top of the nearest sapling, and the cyprian grass attains a height of from six to eight feet. The banks of the river are flat and fringed with underwood and young trees. The background is formed by ranges of hills. The little houses, which are visible now and then, are built of stone and covered with tiles, yet, nevertheless, they present a tolerably poverty-stricken appearance. After sailing up the river for seven hours, we reached, without accident, Porto de Estrela, a place of some importance, since it is the emporium for all the merchandise which is sent from the interior, and then conveyed by water to the capital. There are two good inns, and, besides these, a large building, similar to a Turkish khan, and an immense tile roof, supported on strong stone pillars. The first was appropriate to the merchandise, and the second to the donkey drivers, who had arranged themselves very comfortably underneath it, and were preparing their evening meal over various fires that were blazing away very cheerfully. Although fully admitting the charms of such quarters for the night, 
we preferred retiring to the star inn where clean rooms and beds and skillfully spiced dishes possessed more attraction for us twenty seventh of september from porto de estrela to petrópolis the distance is seven leagues this portion of the journey is generally performed upon mules the charge for which is four mule hays eight shillings eight pennies each but as we had been told in rio de janeiro that the road afforded a beautiful walk parts of it traversing splendid woods and that it was besides much frequented and perfectly safe being the great means of communication with minas gerais we determined to go on foot and that the more willingly as the count wished to botanize and i to collect insects the first eight miles lay through a broad valley covered with thick brambles and young trees and surrounded with lofty mountains the wild pineapples at the side of the road presented a most beautiful appearance they were not quite ripe and were tinged with the most delicate red unfortunately they are far from being as agreeable to the taste as they are to the sight and consequently are very seldom gathered i was greatly amused with the hummingbirds of which i saw a considerable number of the smallest species nothing can be more graceful and delicate than these little creatures they obtain their food from the calyx of the flowers round which they flutter like butterflies and indeed are very often mistaken for them in their rapid flight it is very seldom that they are seen on a branch or twig in a state of repose after passing through the valley we reach the serra as the brazilians term the summit of each mountain that they cross the present one was three thousand feet high a broad paved road traversing virgin forests runs up the side of the mountain i had always imagined that in virgin forests the trees had uncommonly thick and lofty trunks i found that this was not here the case the vegetation is probably too luxuriant and the larger trunks are suffocated and rot beneath the masses of smaller trees bushes creepers and parasites the two latter description of plants are so abundant and cover so completely the trees that it is often impossible to see even the leaves much less the stems and branches herr schleicher a botanist assured us that he once found upon one tree six and thirty different kinds of creepers and parasites we gathered a rich harvest of flowers plants and insects and loitered along enchanted with the magnificent woods and not less beautiful views which stretched over hill and dale towards the sea in its base and even as far as the capital itself frequent troopers driven by negroes as well as the number of pedestrians we met eased our minds of every fear and prevented us from regarding it as at all remarkable that we were being continually followed by a negro as however we arrived at a somewhat lonely spot he sprang suddenly forward holding in one hand a long knife and in the other a lasso rushed upon us and gave us to understand more by gestures than words that he intended to murder and then drag us into the forest we had no arms and we had been told that the road was perfectly safe and the only weapons of defence we possessed were our parasols if i except a clasp knife which i instantly drew out of my pocket and opened fully determined to sell my life as dearly as possible we parried our adversary's blows as long as we could with our parasols but these lasted but a short time besides he caught hold of mine which as we were struggling for it broke short off leaving only a piece of the handle in my hand in the struggle however he dropped his knife which rolled a few steps from him i instantly made a dash and thought i had got it when he more quick than i thrust me away with his feet and hands and once more obtained possession of it he waved it furiously over my head and dealt me two wounds a thrust and a deep gash both in the upper part of the left arm i thought i was lost and despair alone gave me the courage to use my own knife i made a thrust at his breast this he warded off and i only succeeded in wounding him severely in the hand the count sprang forward and seized the fellow from behind and thus afforded me an opportunity of raising myself from the ground the whole affair had not taken more than a few seconds the negro's fury was now roused to its highest pitch by the wounds he had received he gnashed his teeth at us like a wild beast and flourished his knife with frightful rapidity the count in his turn had received a cut right across the hand and we had been irrevocably lost 
had not Providence sent us assistance. We heard the tramp of horses' hoofs upon the road, upon which the negro instantly left us and sprang into the wood. Immediately afterwards, two horsemen turned a corner of the road, and we hurried towards them. Our wounds, which were bleeding freely, and the way in which our parasols were hacked, soon made them understand the state of affairs. They asked us which direction the fugitive had taken, and springing from their horses hurried after him. Their efforts, however, would have been fruitless if two negroes who were coming from the opposite side had not helped them. As it was, the fellow was soon captured. He was pinning it, and as he would not walk, severely beaten, most of the blows being dealt upon the head, so that I feared the poor wretch's skull would be broken. In spite of this, he never moved a muscle, and lay, as if insensible to feeling, upon the ground. The two other negroes were obliged to seize hold of him, when he endeavored to bite every one within his reach, like a wild beast, and carry him to the nearest house. Our preservers, as well as the Count and myself, accompanied him. We then had our wounds dressed, and afterwards continued our journey. Not, it is true, entirely devoid of fear, especially when we met one or more negroes, but without any further mishap, and with a continually increasing admiration of the beautiful scenery. The colony of Petropolis is situated in the midst of a virgin forest, at an elevation of 2,500 feet above the level of the sea, and, at the time of our visit, it had been founded about 14 months, with the especial purpose of furnishing the capital with certain kinds of fruit and vegetables, which, in tropical climates, would thrive only in very high situations. A small row of houses already formed a street, and on a large space that had been cleared away, stood the wooden carcass of a larger building, the imperial villa, which, however, would have some difficulty in presenting anything like an imperial appearance, on account of the low doors that contrasted strangely with the broad, lofty windows. The town is to be built around the villa, though several detached houses are situated at some distance away in the woods. One portion of the colonists, such as mechanics, shopkeepers, etc., had been presented with small plots of ground for building upon near the villa. The cultivators of the soil had received larger patches, although not more than two or three yokes. What misery must not these poor people have suffered in their native country to have sought another hemisphere for the sake of a few yokes of land? We here found the good old woman who had been our fellow passenger from Germany to Rio de Janeiro, in company with her son. Her joy at being once more able to share in the toils and labors of her favorite had, in this short space of time, made her several years younger. Her son acted as our guide, and conducted us over the infant colony, which is situated in broad ravines. The surrounding hills are so steep that when they are cleared of timber and converted into gardens, the soft earth is easily washed away by heavy showers. At a distance of four miles from the colony, a waterfall foams down a chasm which it has worn away for itself. It is more remarkable for its valley-like enclosure of noble mountains and the solemn gloom of the surrounding woods than for its height or body of water. 29th of September In spite of the danger we had incurred in coming, we returned to Porto de Estrela on foot, went on board a bark, sailed all night, and arrived safely in Rio de Janeiro the next morning. Every one, both in Petropolis and the capital, was so astonished at the manner in which our lives had been attempted, that if we had not been able to show our wounds, we should never have been believed. The fellow was at first thought to have been drunk or insane, and it was not till later that we learned the real motives of his conduct. He had some time previously been punished by his master for an offense, and on meeting us in the wood, he no doubt thought that it was a good opportunity of satisfying with impunity, his hatred against the whites. End of section 5。section 6 of A Woman's Journey Round the World。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Woman's Journey Round the World by Ida Laura Pfeiffer. Chapter 4. Journey into the Interior of the Brazils. Part 1. 
the towns of Morro Queimado, Nova Friburgo, and Aldeia do Pedro, plantations of the Europeans, burning forests, virgin forests, last settlement of the whites, visit to the Indians, also called Puris or Rabocles, return to Rio de Janeiro. This second journey I also made in company of Count Berthold, after having resolved on penetrating into the interior of the country, and paying a visit to the primitive inhabitants of the Brazils. 2nd of October. We left Rio de Janeiro in the morning, and proceeded in a steamer as far as the port of Sampaio, a distance of twenty-eight miles. This port lies at the mouth of the river Macacu, but consists of only one inn and two or three small houses. We here hired mules to take us to the town of Morro Queimado, eighty miles off. I may take this opportunity of remarking that it is the custom in the Brazils to hire the mules without muleteers, a great mark of confidence on the part of the owners towards travelers. Arrived at their destination, the animals are delivered up at a certain place fixed on by the proprietor. We preferred, however, to take a muleteer with us, as we were not acquainted with the road, a piece of precaution we regretted the less, on finding the way frequently obstructed with wooden gates, which had always to be opened and shut again. The price for hiring a mule was twelve mule hays, one pound six shillings. As we arrived at Porto Sampaio by two o'clock, we resolved on going on as far as Ponte do Pinheiro, a distance of sixteen miles. The road lay mostly through valleys covered with large bushes, and surrounded by low rocks. The country wore a general aspect of wildness, and only here and there were a few scanty pasture grounds and poverty-stricken huts to be seen. The little town of Ponte de Caires, which we passed, consists of a few shops and vendas, a number of smaller houses, an inconsiderable church, and an apothecary's. The principal square looked like a meadow. Ponte do Pinheiro is rather larger. We experienced here a very good reception, and had an excellent supper, consisting of fowls stewed in rice, flour of manioc, and Portuguese wine. We had also good beds and breakfasts. The whole cost us, however, four mil hays, eight shillings, eight pence. 3rd of October. We did not set off till seven o'clock. Here, as everywhere else in the country, there is no getting away early in the morning. The scenery was of the same character as that passed the day before, except that we were approaching the more lofty mountains. The road was tolerably good, but the bridges across the streams and sloughs execrable. We esteemed ourselves fortunate whenever we passed one without being compelled to stop. After a ride of three hours, nine miles, we reach the great sugar fazenda de colégio, which, in its arrangements, is exactly like a large country seat. To the spacious residence is attached a chapel, with the offices lying all around. The whole is enclosed by a high wall. Far and wide stretch the fields and low eminences, covered with sugar canes. Unfortunately, we could not see the mode of preparing the sugar, as the canes were not yet ripe. A planter's fortune in the Brazils is calculated by the number of his slaves. There were eight hundred of them on the plantation we were viewing, a large property, since each male slave costs from six to seven hundred mil hays, sixty to seventy pounds. Not far from this fazenda, to the right of the high road, lies another very considerable one, called Papagais. Besides these, we saw several smaller plantations, which lent a little animation to the uniformity of the scene. St. Anna, sixteen miles distant, is a small place, consisting of only a few poor houses, a little church, and an apothecary's. The last is a necessary appendage to every Brazilian village, even though it only contains twelve or fifteen huts. We here made a repast of eggs with a bottle of wine and gave our mules a feed of mill, for which a cheating landlord, Herr Gebhardt, charged us three mule hays, six shillings, six pence. 
Today we did not proceed further than Mendoza, twelve miles, a still more insignificant place than Santa Anna. A small shop and a venda were the only houses at the roadside, though in the background we perceived a manioc fazenda, to which we paid a visit. The proprietor was kind enough first to offer us some strong coffee without milk, a customary mark of attention in the Brazils, and then to conduct us over his plantation. The manioc plant shoots out stalks from four to six feet in height, with a number of large leaves at their upper extremities. The valuable portion of the plant is its bulbous root, which often weighs two or three pounds, and supplies the place of corn all through the Brazils. It is washed, peeled, and held against the rough edge of a millstone, turned by a negro, until it is completely ground away. The whole mass is then gathered into a basket, plentifully steeped in water, and is afterwards pressed quite dry by means of a press. Lastly, it is scattered upon large iron plates and slowly dried by a gentle fire kept up beneath. It now resembles a very coarse kind of flour and is eaten in two ways, wet and dry. In the first case, it is mixed with hot water until it forms a kind of porridge. In the second, it is handed round under the form of coarse flour in little baskets and every one at table takes as much as he chooses and sprinkles it over his plate. 4th of October The mountain ranges continue drawing nearer and nearer to each other, and the woods become thicker and more luxuriant. The various creeping plants are indescribably beautiful. Not only do they entirely cover the ground, but they are so intertwined with the trees that their lovely flowers hang on the highest branches, and look like the blossoms of the trees themselves. But there are likewise trees whose own yellow and red blossoms resemble the most beautiful flowers, while there are others whose great white leaves stand out like silver from the surrounding mass of flowery green. Woods like these might well be called the giant gardens of the world. The palm trees have here almost disappeared. We soon reached the mountain range we had to cross, and on our way often ascended such elevated spots that we had a free view extending as far back as the capital. On the top of the mountain, Alta da Serra, sixteen miles from Mendoza, we found a venda. From this spot, the distance to Morro Queimado is sixteen miles, which took us a long time, as the road is either up or downhill the whole way. We were continually surrounded by the most magnificent woodlands, and were only rarely reminded by a small plantation of cabi or mill that we were in the neighborhood of men. We did not perceive the little town until we had surmounted the last eminence and were in its immediate vicinity. It lies in a large and picturesque hollow, surrounded by mountains at an elevation of 3,200 feet above the level of the sea. As night was near at hand, we were glad enough to reach our lodgings, which were situated on one side of the town, in the house of a German named Linderuth. They were very comfortable, and, as we afterwards found, exceedingly reasonable, seeing that for our rooms and three good meals a day we only paid one mule hays, two shillings, two pence. 5th of October The small town of Nova Friburgo, or Morro Queimado, was founded about fifteen years since by French, Swiss, and Germans. It contains not quite a hundred substantial houses, the greater part of which form an extremely broad street, while the others lie scattered about here and there. We had already heard, in Rio de Janeiro, a great deal of the Messieurs Basque and Frise, and we particularly recommended not to forget to pay a visit to each. Herr Basque is a naturalist, and resides here with his wife, who is almost as scientific as himself. We enjoyed many an hour in their entertaining society, and were shown many interesting collections of quadrupeds, birds, serpents, insects, etc. The collection of these last, indeed, was more rich and remarkable than that in the Museum of Rio de Janeiro. Herr Basque has always a great many orders from Europe to send over various objects of natural history. Herr Fries is the director and proprietor of an establishment for boys, and preferred establishing his school in this cool climate 
than in the hot town beneath. He was kind enough to show us all his arrangements. As it was near evening when we paid our visit, school was already over, but he presented all his scholars to us, made them perform a few gymnastic exercises, and proposed several questions on geography, history, arithmetic, etc., which, without exception, they answered very carefully and correctly. His establishment receives sixty boys, and was quite full, although the annual charge for each boy is one thousand mil hays, a hundred and eight pounds, six shillings, eight pence. The 6th of October. We had at first intended to stop only one day in Nova Friburgo, and then continue our journey. Unfortunately, however, the wound which the Count had received on our excursion to Petropolis became, through the frequent use of the hand and the excessive heat, much worse. Inflammation set in, and he was consequently obliged to give up all ideas of going any further. With my wounds I was more fortunate, for, as they were on the upper part of the arm, I had been enabled to pay them a proper degree of care and attention. They were now proceeding very favorably, and neither dangerous nor troublesome. I had, therefore, no resource left but either to pursue my journey alone, or to give up the most interesting portion of it, namely, my visit to the Indians. To this last idea I could by no means reconcile myself. I inquired, therefore, whether the journey could be made with any degree of safety, and as I received a sort of half-satisfactory answer, and Herr Lindenroth found me also a trusty guide, I procured a good double-barrel pistol, and set out undaunted upon my trip. We at first remained for some time in the midst of mountain ranges, and then again descended into the warmer region beneath. The valleys were generally narrow, and the uniform appearance of the woods was often broken by plantations. The latter, however, did not always look very promising, most of them being so choked up with weeds that it was frequently impossible to perceive the plant itself, especially when it was young and small. It is only upon the sugar and coffee plantations that any great care is bestowed. The coffee trees stand in rows upon tolerably steep hillocks. They attain a height of from six to twelve feet, and begin to bear sometimes as soon as the second, but in no case later than the third year, and are productive for ten years. The leaf is long and slightly serrated, the blossom white, while the fruit hangs down in the same manner as a bunch of grapes, and resembles a longish cherry, which is first green, then red, brown, and nearly black. During the time it is red, the outer shell is soft, but ultimately becomes perfectly hard and resembles a wooden capsule. Blossoms and fruit in full maturity are found upon the trees at the same time, and hence the harvest lasts nearly the whole year. The latter is conducted in two ways. The berries are either gathered by hand, or large straw mats are spread underneath and the trees well shaken. The first method is the more troublesome, but without comparison the better one. Another novelty which I saw here for the first time were the frequent burning forests which had been set on fire to clear the ground for cultivation. In most cases I merely saw immense clouds of smoke curling upwards in the distance, and desired nothing more earnestly than to enjoy a nearer view of such a conflagration. My wish was destined to be fulfilled today, as my road lay between a burning forest and a burning rost. The intervening space was not, at the most, more than fifty paces broad, and was completely enveloped in smoke. I could hear the cracking of the fire, and through the dense vapor perceive thick, forked columns of flame shoot upwards towards the sky, while now and then loud reports, like those of a cannon, announced the fall of the large trees. On seeing my guide enter this fiery gulf, I was, I must confess, rather frightened. But I felt assured, on reflecting, that he would certainly not foolishly risk his own life, and that he must know from experience that such places were passable. At the entrance sat two negroes, to point out the direction that wayfarers had to follow, and to recommend them to make as much haste as possible. 
My guide translated for me what they said, and spurred on his mule. I followed his example, and we both galloped at full speed into the smoking pass. The burning ashes now flew around us in all directions, while the suffocating smoke was even more oppressive than the heat. Our beasts, too, seemed to have great difficulty in drawing breath, and it was as much as we could do to keep them in a gallop. Fortunately, we had not above five hundred or six hundred paces to ride, and consequently succeeded in making our way safely through. In the Brazils, a conflagration of this kind never extends very far, as the vegetation is too green and offers too much opposition. The wood has to be ignited in several places, and even then the fire frequently goes out, and when most of the wood is burnt, many patches are found unconsumed. Soon after passing this dangerous spot, we came to a magnificent rock, the sides of which must have risen almost perpendicularly to a height of six hundred or eight hundred feet. A number of detached fragments lay scattered about the road, forming picturesque groups. To my great astonishment, I learned from my guide that our lodging for the night was near at hand. We had scarcely ridden twenty miles, but he affirmed that the next venda where we could stop was too far distant. I afterwards discovered that his sole object was to spin out the journey, which was a very profitable one for him, since, besides good living for himself and father for his two mules, he received four mule hays, eight shillings, eight pence a day. We put up, therefore, at a solitary venda, erected in the middle of the forest, and kept by Herr Mollas. During the day we had suffered greatly from the heat, the thermometer standing in the sun at 119 degrees 75 Fahrenheit. The circumstance which must strike a traveler most forcibly in the habits of the colonists and inhabitants of the Brazils is the contrast between fear and courage. On the one hand, every one you meet upon the road is armed with pistols and long knives, as if the whole country was overrun with robbers and murderers, while on the other, the proprietors live quite alone on their plantations, and without the least apprehension, in the midst of their numerous slaves. The traveller, too, fearlessly passes the night in some venda, situated in impenetrable woods, with neither shutters to the windows nor good locks to the doors, besides which, the owner's room is a considerable distance from the chambers of the guests, and it would be utterly impossible to obtain any assistance from the servants, who are all slaves, as they live either in some corner of the stable or in the loft. At first I felt very frightened at thus passing the night alone, surrounded by the wild gloom of the forest, and in a room that was only very insecurely fastened. But, as I was everywhere assured that such a thing as a forcible entry into a house had never been heard of, I soon dismissed my superfluous anxiety, and enjoyed the most tranquil repose. I know very few countries in Europe, where I should like to traverse vast forests, and pass the night in such awfully lonely houses, accompanied by only a hired guide. On the 7th of October, also, we made only a short day's journey of twenty miles, to the small town of Cantagallo. The scenery was of the usual description, consisting of narrow, circumscribed valleys and mountains covered with endless forests. If little fazendas and the remains of woods which had been set on fire had not, every now and then, reminded us of the hand of men, I should have thought that I was wandering through some yet undiscovered part of Brazil. The monotony of our journey was rather romantically interrupted by our strain for a short distance from the right road. In order to reach it again, we were obliged to penetrate by untrodden paths through the woods, a task presenting difficulties of which an European can scarcely form an idea. We dismounted from our mules, and my guide threw back, on either side, the low hanging branches, and cut through the thick web of creepers, while one moment we were obliged to climb over broken trunks, or squeeze ourselves between others, and the next we sank knee-deep among endless parasitical plants. I began almost to despair of ever effecting a passage, and even up to the present day am at a loss to understand how we succeeded in escaping from this inextricable mass. 
The little town of Cantagallo is situated in a narrow valley and contains about eighty houses. The venda stands apart, the town not being visible from it. The temperature here is warm as in Rio de Janeiro. On my return to the venda, after a short walk to the town, I applied to my landlady, in order to obtain a near and really correct idea of a Brazilian household. The good woman, however, gave herself very little trouble, either in looking after the house or the kitchen. As is the case in Italy, this was her husband's business. A negress and two young negroes cooked, the arrangements of the kitchen being of the most primitive simplicity. The salt was pressed fine with a bottle. The potatoes, when boiled, underwent the same process. The latter were also subsequently squeezed in the frying pan with a plate, to give them the form of a pancake. A pointed piece of wood served for a fork, etc. There was a large fire burning for every dish. Every one whose complexion was white sat down with us at table. All the dishes, consisting of cold roast beef, black beans with boiled carne seca, potatoes, rice, manioc flour, and boiled manioc roots, were placed upon the table at the same time, and every one helped himself as he pleased. At the conclusion of our meal, we had strong coffee without milk. The slaves had beans, carne seca, and manioc flour. 8th of October Our goal today was the Fazenda Boa Esperança, 24 miles off. Four miles beyond Cantagallo, we crossed a small waterfall, and then entered one of the most magnificent virgin forests I had yet beheld. A small path, on the bank of a little brook, conducted us through it. Palms, with their majestic tops, raised themselves proudly above the other trees, which, lovingly interlaced together, formed the most beautiful bowers. Orchids grew in wanton luxuriance upon the branches and twigs. Creepers and ferns climbed up the trees, mingling with the boughs, and forming thick walls of blossoms and flowers, which displayed the most brilliant colors, and exhaled the sweetest perfume. Delicate hummingbirds twittered around our heads. The pepper-pecker, with his brilliant plumage, soared shyly upwards. Parrots and parakeets were swinging themselves in the branches, and numberless beautifully marked birds, which I only knew from having seen specimens in the museum, inhabited this fairy grove. It seemed as if I was riding in some fairy park, and I expected every moment to see sylphs and nymphs appear before me. I was so happy that I felt richly recompensed for all the fatigue of my journey. One thought only obscured this beautiful place, and that was that weak men should dare to enter the lists with the giant nature of the place, and make it bend before his will. How soon, perhaps, may this profound and holy tranquillity be disturbed by the blows of some daring settler's axe, to make room for the wants of men. I saw no dangerous animals, save a few dark green snakes, from five to seven feet long, a dead ounce that had been stripped of its skin, and a lizard, three feet in length, which ran timidly across our path. I met with no apes. They appeared to conceal themselves deeper in the woods, where no human footstep is likely to disturb them where no human footstep is likely to disturb them in their sports and gambles. During the whole distance from Cantagallo to the small village of Santa Rita, sixteen miles, if it had not again been for a few coffee plantations, I should have thought the place completely forgotten by men. Near Santa Rita are some gold washings in the river of the same name, and not far from them diamonds also are found. Since seeking or digging for diamonds is no longer an imperial monopoly, every one is at liberty to employ himself in this occupation, and yet it is exercised as much as possible in secret. No one will acknowledge looking for them, in order to avoid paying the state its share as fixed by law. The precious stones are sought for and dug out at certain spots, from heaps of sand, stones, and soil, which have been washed down by the heavy rains. I had found lodgings in a venda for the last time, the preceding evening, at Cantagallo. I had now to rely upon the hospitality of the proprietors of the fazendas. 
custom requires that, on reaching a fazenda, any person who desires to stop the middle of the day or the night there should wait outside and ask, through the servant, permission to do so. It is not until his application is granted, which is almost always the case, that the traveller dismounts from his mule and enters the building. They received me at Fazenda da Boa Esperança in the most friendly manner, and, as I happened to arrive exactly at dinner-time, it was between three and four o'clock, covers were immediately laid for me and my attendant. The dishes were numerous, and prepared very nearly in the European fashion. Great astonishment was manifested in every venda and fazenda at seeing a lady arrive, accompanied only by a single servant. The first question was whether I was not afraid thus to traverse the woods alone, and my guide was invariably taken on one side and questioned as to why I travelled. As he was in the habit of seeing me collect flowers and insects, he supposed me to be a naturalist, and replied that my journey had a scientific object. After dinner, the amiable lady of the house proposed that I should go and see the coffee plantations, warehouses, etc., and I willingly accepted her offer, as affording me an opportunity of viewing the manner in which the coffee was prepared, from beginning to end. The mode of gathering it I have already described. When this is done, the coffee is spread out upon large plots of ground, trodden down in a peculiar manner, and enclosed by low stone walls, scarcely a foot high, with little drain holes in them, to allow of the water running off in case of rain. On these places the coffee is dried by the glowing heat of the sun, and then shaken in large stone mortars, ten or twenty of which are placed beneath a wooden scaffolding, from which wooden hammers, set in motion by water power, descend into the mortars, and easily crush the husks. The mass thus crushed is then placed in wooden boxes, fastened in the middle of a long table, and having small openings at each side, through which both the berry itself and the husk fall slowly out. At the table are seated negroes, who separate the berry from the husk, and then cast it into shallow copper cauldrons, which are easily heated. In these it is carefully turned, and remains until it is quite dried. This last process requires some degree of care, as the color of the coffee depends upon the degree of heat to which it is exposed. If dried too quickly, instead of the usual greenish color, it contracts a yellowish tinge. On the whole, the preparation of coffee is not fatiguing, and even the gathering of it is far from being as laborious as reaping is with us. The negro stands in an upright posture when gathering the berry, and is protected by the tree itself against the great heat of the sun. The only danger he incurs is of being bitten by some venomous snake or other, an accident, however, which fortunately rarely happens. The work on a sugar plantation, on the contrary, is said to be exceedingly laborious, particularly that portion of it which relates to weeding the ground and cutting the cane. I have never yet witnessed a sugar harvest, but perhaps may do so in the course of my travels. All work ceases at sunset, when the negroes are drawn up in front of their master's house for the purpose of being counted, and then, after a short prayer, have their supper, consisting of boiled beans, bacon, carne seca, and manioc flour, handed out to them. At sunrise they again assemble, are once more counted, and after prayers and breakfast go to work. I had an opportunity of convincing myself in this, as well as in many other fazendas, vendas, and private houses, that the slaves are by far not so harshly treated as we Europeans imagine. They are not overworked, perform all their duties very leisurely, and are well kept. Their children are frequently the playmates of their master's children, and knock each other about as if they were all equal. There may be cases in which certain slaves are cruelly and undeservedly punished, but do not the like instances of injustice occur in Europe also? I am certainly very much opposed to slavery, and should greet its abolition with the greatest delight. But, despite this, I again affirm that the negro slave enjoys, under the protection of the law, a better lot than the free fella of Egypt, or many peasants in Europe, who still groan under the right of socage. 
the principal reason of the better lot of the slave compared to that of the miserable peasant in the case in point may perhaps partly be that the purchase and keep of the one is expensive while the other costs nothing the arrangements in the houses belonging to the proprietors of the fazendas are extremely simple the windows are unglazed and are closed at night with wooden shutters in many cases the outer roof is the common covering of all the rooms which are merely separated from one another by low partitions so that you can hear every word your neighbor says and almost the breathing of the person sleeping next to you the furniture is equally simple a large table a few straw sofas and a few chairs the wearing apparel is generally hung up against the walls the linen alone being kept in tin cases to protect it from the attacks of the ants in the country the children of even the most opulent persons run about frequently without shoes or stockings before they go to bed they have their feet examined to see whether any sand fleas have nestled in them and if such be the case they are extracted by the elder negro children End of section 6section seven of a woman's journey round the world this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org a woman's journey round the world by ida laura pfeiffer chapter four journey into the interior of the brazils part two ninth of october early in the morning i took leave of my kind hostess who like a true careful housewife had wrapped up a roasted fowl, maniac flour, and a cheese for me, so that I was well provisioned on setting off. The next station, Aldeia do Pedro, on the banks of the Paraibi, was situated at a distance of sixteen miles. Our way lay through magnificent woods, and before we had traversed half of it, we arrived at the river Paraibi, one of the largest in the Brazils, and celebrated, moreover, for the peculiar character of its bed, which is strewed with innumerable cliffs and rocks. These, owing to the low state of the stream, were more than usually conspicuous. On every side rose little islands, covered with small trees or underwood, lending a most magic appearance to the river. During the rainy season, most of these cliffs and rocks are covered with water, and the river then appears more majestic. On account of the rocks, it can only be navigated by small boats and rafts. As you proceed along the banks, the scenery gradually changes. The fore part of the mountain ranges subside into low hills. The mountains themselves retreat, and the nearer you approach Aldeia do Pedro, the wider and more open becomes the valley. In the background alone are still visible splendid mountain ranges, from which rises a mountain higher than the rest, somewhat more naked and almost isolated. To this my guide pointed, and gave me to understand that our way lay over it, in order to reach the Puris who live beyond. About noon I arrived at Aldeia do Pedro, which I found to be a small village with a stone church. The latter might, perhaps, contain two hundred persons. I had intended continuing my journey to the Puris the same day, but my guide was attacked with pains in his knee, and could not ride further. I had, therefore, no resource but to alight at the priest's, who gave me a hearty welcome. He had a pretty good house, immediately adjoining the church. 10th of October. As my guide was worse, the priest offered me his negro to replace him. I thankfully accepted his offer, but could not set off before one o'clock, for which I was, in some respects, not sorry, as it was Sunday, and I hoped to see a great number of the country people flock to the mass. This, however, was not the case. Although it was a very fine day, there were hardly thirty people at church. The men were dressed exactly in the European fashion. The women wore long cloaks with collars, and had white handkerchiefs upon their heads, partly falling over their faces as well. The latter they uncovered in church. Both men and women were barefooted. As chance would have it, I witnessed a burial and a christening. Before mass commenced, a boat crossed over from the opposite bank of the Paraibi, and on reaching the side, a hammock, 
in which was the deceased, was lifted out. He was then laid in a coffin, which had been prepared for the purpose in a house near the churchyard. The corpse was enveloped in a white cloth, with the feet and half the head protruding beyond it. The latter was covered with a peaked cap of shining black cloth. The christening took place before the burial. The person who was to be christened was a young negro of fifteen, who stood with his mother at the church door. As the priest entered the church to perform mass, he christened him, in passing by, without much ceremony or solemnity, and even without sponsors. The boy, too, seemed to be as little touched by the whole affair as a newborn infant. I do not believe that either he or his mother had the least idea of the importance of the rite. The priest then hurriedly performed mass, and read the burial service over the deceased, who had belonged to rather a wealthy family, and therefore was respectably interred. Unfortunately, when they wanted to lower the corpse into its cold resting place, the ladder was found to be too short and too narrow, and the poor wretch was so tossed about, coffin and all, that I expected every moment to see him roll out. But all was of no avail, and after a great deal of useless exertion no other course was left but to place the coffin on one side and enlarge the grave, which was done with much unwillingness and amid an unceasing volley of oaths. This fatiguing work being at last finished, I returned to the house, where I took a good déjeuner à la fourchette in company with the priest, and then set out with my black guide. We rode for some time through a broad valley between splendid woods, and had to cross two rivers, the Paraibi and the Pomba, in trunks of trees hollowed out. For each of these wretched conveyances I was obliged to pay one new hays, two shillings and two pence, and to incur great danger into the bargain, not so much on account of the stream and the small size of the craft, as of our mules, which, fastened by their halter, swam alongside, and frequently came so near that I was afraid that we should be every moment capsized. After riding twelve miles further, we reached the last settlement of the whites. On an open space, which had with difficulty been conquered from the virgin forest, stood a largish wooden house, surrounded by a few miserable huts, the house serving as the residence of the whites, and the huts as that of the slaves. A letter which I had brought from the priest procured me a welcome. The manner of living in this settlement was of such a description that I was almost tempted to believe that I was already among savages. The large house contained an entrance hall leading into four rooms, each of which was inhabited by a white family. The whole furniture of these rooms consisted of a few hammocks and straw mats. The inhabitants were cowering upon the floor, playing with the children, or assisting one another to get rid of their vermin. The kitchen was immediately adjoining the house, and resembled a very large barn with openings in it. Upon a hearth that took up nearly the entire length of the barn, several fires were burning, over which hung small kettles, and at each side were fastened wooden spits. On these were fixed several pieces of meat, some of which were being roasted by the fire, and some cured by the smoke. The kitchen was full of people, whites, puris, and negroes, children whose parents were whites and pudis, or pudis and negroes. In a word, the place was like a book of specimens containing the most varied ramifications of the three principal races of the country. In the courtyard was an immense number of fowls, beautifully marked ducks and geese. I also saw some extraordinarily fat pigs and some horribly ugly dogs. Under some cocoa palms and tamarind trees, were seated white and colored people, separate and in groups, mostly occupied in satisfying their hunger. Some had got broken basins or pumpkin gourds before them, in which they kneaded up with their hands boiled beans and manioc flour. This thick and disgusting-looking mess they devoured with avidity. Others were eating pieces of meat, which they likewise tore with their hands and threw into their mouths alternately with handfuls of maniac flour. The children, who also had their gourds before them, were obliged to defend the contents valiantly, for at one moment a hen would pack something out, and at the next 
a dog would run off with a bit, or sometimes even a little pig would waggle up and invariably give a most contented grunt when it had not performed the journey for nothing. While I was making these observations, I suddenly heard a merry cry outside the courtyard. I proceeded to the place from which it issued, and saw two boys dragging towards me a large dark brown serpent, certainly more than seven feet long at the end of a bast rope. It was already dead, and as far as I could learn from the explanations of those about me, it was of so venomous a kind that if a person is bitten by it, he immediately swells up and dies. I was rather startled at what I heard, and determined at least not to set out through the wood just as evening was closing in, as I might have to take up my quarters for the night under some tree. I therefore deferred my visit to the savages until the next morning. The good people imagined that I was afraid of the savages, and earnestly assured me that they were a most harmless race, from whom I had not the least to fear. As my knowledge of Portuguese was limited to a few words, I found it rather difficult to make myself understood, and it was only by the help of gesticulations, with now and then a small sketch, that I succeeded in enlightening them as to the real cause of my fear. I passed the night, therefore, with these half-savages, who constantly showed me the greatest respect, and overwhelmed me with attention. A straw mat, which, at my request, was spread out under shelter in the courtyard, was my bed. They brought me for supper a roast fowl, rice and hard eggs, and for dessert, oranges and tamarind pods. The latter contained a brown, half-sweet, half-sour pulp, very agreeable to the taste. The women lay all round me, and by degrees we managed to get on wonderfully together. I showed them the different flowers and insects I had gathered during the day. This doubtless induced them to look upon me as a learned person, and as such to impute to me a knowledge of medicine. They begged me to prescribe for different cases of illness, bad ears, eruptions of the skin, and in the children a considerable tendency to scrofula, etc. I ordered lukewarm baths, frequent fomentations, and the use of oil and soap, applied externally and rubbed into the body. May heaven grant that these remedies have really worked some good. On the 11th of October, I proceeded into the forest, in company with a negress and a puri, to find out the Indians. At times, we had to work our way laboriously through the thicket, and then again we would find narrow paths, by which we pursued our journey with greater ease. After eight hours walking, we came upon a number of puris, who led us into their huts, situated in the immediate vicinity, where I beheld a picture of the greatest misery and want. I had often met with a great deal of wretchedness in my travels, but never so much as I saw here. On a small space, under lofty trees, five huts, or rather sheds, formed of leaves, were erected, eighteen feet long, by twelve feet broad. The frames were formed of four poles stuck in the ground, with another reaching across, and the roof of palm leaves, through which the rain could penetrate with the utmost facility. On three sides these bowers were entirely open. In the interior hung a hammock or two, and on the ground glimmered a little fire, under a heap of ashes, in which a few roots, Indian corn, and bananas were roasting. In one corner, under the roof, a small supply of provisions was hoarded up, and a few gourds were scattered around. These are used by the savages instead of plates, pots, water jugs, etc. The long bows and arrows, which constitute their only weapons, were leaning in the background against the wall. I found the Indians still more ugly than the Negroes. Their complexion is a light bronze, stunted in stature, well knit, and about the middle size. They have broad and somewhat compressed features, and thick, coal-black hair, hanging straight down, which the women sometimes wear in plates fastened to the back of the head, and sometimes falling down loose about them. Their forehead is broad and low, the nose somewhat flattened, the eyes long and narrow, almost like those of the Chinese, and the mouth large, with rather thick lips. To give a still greater effect to all these various charms, 
a peculiar look of stupidity is spread over the whole face, and is more especially to be attributed to the way in which their mouths are always kept opened. Most of them, both men and women, were tattooed with a reddish or blue collar, though only round the mouth, in the form of a moustache. Both sexes are passionately fond of smoking, and prefer brandy to everything. Their dress was composed of a few rags, which they had fastened round their loins. I had already heard, in Nova Friburgo, a few interesting particulars concerning the puris, which I will here relate. The number of the Brazilian Indians at the present time is calculated at about 500,000, who live scattered about the forests in the heart of the country. Not more than six or seven families ever settle on the same spot, which they leave as soon as the game in the neighborhood has been killed, and all the fruit and roots consumed. A large number of these Indians have been christened. They are always ready, for a little brandy or tobacco, to undergo the ceremony at the shortest notice, and only regret that it cannot be repeated more frequently, as it is soon over. The priest believes that he has only to perform the rite in order to gain another soul for heaven, and afterwards gives himself very little concern, either about instruction or the manners and morals of his converts. These, it is true, are called Christians, or tame savages, but live in the same hidden manner that they previously did. Thus, for instance, they contract marriages for indefinite periods, elect their caciques, chiefs, from the strongest and finest men, follow all their old customs on the occasion of marriages and deaths, just the same as before baptism. Their language is very poor. They are said, for example, only to be able to count one and two, and are therefore obliged, when they desire to express a larger number, to repeat these two figures continually. Furthermore, for today, tomorrow, and yesterday, they possess only the word day, and express their more particular meanings by signs. For today, they say day, and feel their head, or point upwards. For tomorrow, they again use the word day, and point their fingers in a straightforward direction. And for yesterday, they use the same word, and point behind them. The puris are said to be peculiarly adapted for tracking runaway negroes, as their organs of smell are very highly developed. They smell the trace of the fugitive on the leaves of the trees, and if the negro does not succeed in reaching some stream in which he can either walk or swim for a considerable distance, it is asserted that he can very seldom escape the Indian engaged in pursuit of him. These savages are also readily employed in felling timber, in cultivating Indian corn, manioc, etc., as they are very industrious, and think themselves well paid with a little tobacco, brandy, or colored cloth. But on no account must they be compelled to do anything by force. They are free men. They seldom, however, come to offer their assistance, unless they are half-starved. I visited the huts of all these savages, and as my guides had trumpeted forth my praises as being a woman of great knowledge, I was here asked my advice for the benefit of every one who was ill. In one of the huts I found an old woman groaning in her hammock. On my drawing nearer they uncovered the poor creature, and I perceived that all her breast was eaten up by cancer. She seemed to have no idea of a bandage, or any means of soothing the pain. I advised her to wash the wound frequently with a decoction of mallows, and in addition to this, to cover it over with the leaves of the same plant. I only trust that my advice procured her some trifling relief. This horrible disease, unfortunately, does not appear to be at all rare among the puris, for I saw many of their women, some of whom had large heart swellings, and others even small tumors on the breast. After having sufficiently examined everything in the huts, I went with some of the savages to shoot parrots and monkeys. We had not far to go, in order to meet with both, and I had now an opportunity of admiring the skill with which these people use their bows. They brought down the birds even when they were on the wing, and very seldom missed their mark. After shooting three parrots and an ape, we returned to the huts. The good creatures offered me the best hut they possessed, and invited me to pass the night there. Being rather fatigued by the toilsome nature of my journey on foot, the heat, and the hunting excursion, 
I very joyfully accepted their proposition. The day, too, was drawing to a close, and I should not have been able to reach the settlement of the whites before night. I therefore spread out my cloak upon the ground, arranged a log of wood so as to serve instead of a pillow, and for the present seated myself upon my splendid couch. In the meanwhile, my hosts were preparing the monkey and the parrots by sticking them on wooden spits and roasting them before the fire. In order to render the meal a peculiarly dainty one, they also buried some Indian corn and roots in the cinders. They then gathered a few large fresh leaves off the trees, tore the roasted ape into several pieces with their hands, and placing a large portion of it, as well as a parrot, Indian corn, and some roots upon the leaves, put it before me. My appetite was tremendous, seeing that I had tasted nothing since the morning. I therefore immediately fell to on the roasted monkey, which I found superlatively delicious, the flesh of the parrot was far from being so tender and palatable. After our meal, I begged the Indians to perform one of their dances for me, a request with which they readily complied. As it was already dark, they brought a quantity of wood, which they formed into a sort of funeral pile, and set on fire. The men then formed a circle all around and began the dance. They threw their bodies from side to side in a most remarkably awkward fashion, but always moving the head forwards in a straight line. The women then joined in, remaining, however, at some little distance in the rear of the men, and making the same awkward movements. They now began a most horrible noise, which was intended for a song, at the same time distorting their features in a frightful manner. One of them stood near, playing upon a kind of stringed instrument, made out of the stem of a cabbage palm, and about two feet or two feet and a half in length. A hole was cut in it, in a slanting direction, and six fibers of the stem had been raised up, and kept in an elevated position at each end, by means of a small bridge. The fingers were then used for playing upon these as upon a guitar. The tone was very low, disagreeable, and hoarse. The first dance they named the Dance of Peace or Joy. The men then performed a much wilder one alone. After providing themselves for the purpose with bows, arrows, and stout clubs, they again formed a circle, but their movements were much quicker and wilder than in the first instance, and they likewise hit about them with their clubs in a horrible fashion. They then suddenly broke their rank, strung their bows, placed their arrows ready, and went through the pantomime of shooting after a flying foe, uttering at the same time the most piercing cries, which echoed through the whole forest. I started up in a fright, for I really believed that I was surrounded by enemies, and that I was delivered up into their power, without any chance of help or assistance. I was heartily glad when this horrible war dance came to a conclusion. After retiring to rest, and when all around had gradually become hushed into silence, I was assailed by apprehensions of another description. I thought of the number of wild beasts and the horrible serpents that might perhaps be concealed quite close to me, and then of the exposed situation I was in. This kept me awake a long time, and I often fancied I heard a rustling among the leaves, as if one of the dreaded animals were breaking through. At length, however, my weary body asserted its rights. I laid my head upon my wooden pillow, and consoled myself with the idea that the danger was, after all, not so great as many of we travellers wish to have believed. Otherwise, how would it be possible for the savages to live as they do, without any precautions, in their open huts? On the 12th of October, early in the morning, I took leave of the savages, and made them a present of various bronze ornaments, with which they were so delighted that they offered me everything they possessed. I took a bow with a couple of arrows, as mementos of my visit, returned to the wooden house, and having also distributed similar presents there, mounted my mule, and arrived late in the evening at Aldeia do Pedro. On the morning of the 13th of October, I bade the obliging priest farewell, and with my attendant, who by this time was quite recovered, began my journey back to Nova Friburgo, and, in this instance, although I pursued the same road, was only three days instead of four on the way. On arriving, I found Count Berthold, who was now quite well. 
we determined, therefore, before returning to Rio de Janeiro, to make a little excursion to a fine waterfall about twelve miles from Nova Friburgo. By mere chance, we learned that the christening of the Princess Isabella would take place on the 19th, and, as we did not wish to miss this interesting ceremony, we preferred returning directly. We followed the same road we had taken in coming, till about four miles before reaching Ponte de Pinheiro, and then struck off towards Porto de Praia. This road was thirty-two miles longer by land, but so much shorter by sea that the passage is made by steamer from Porto de Praia to Rio de Janeiro in half an hour. The scenery around Pinheiro was mostly dull and tedious, almost like a desert, the monotony of which was only broken here and there by a few scanty woods or low hills. We were not lucky enough to see the mountains again until we were near the capital. I must here mention a comical mistake of Herr Baske of Nova Friburgo, which we at first could not understand, but which afterwards afforded a good deal of amusement. Herr Baske had recommended us a guide, whom he described as a walking encyclopedia of knowledge, and able to answer all our questions about trees, plants, scenery, etc., in the most complete manner. We esteemed ourselves exceedingly fortunate to obtain such a phoenix of a guy, and immediately took advantage of every opportunity to put his powers to the test. He could, however, tell us nothing at all. If we asked him the name of a river, he replied that it was too small and had no name. The trees, likewise, were too insignificant, the plants too common. The ignorance was rather too much. We made inquiry and found that Herr Baske had not intended to send us the guide we had, but his brother, who, however, had died six months previously, a circumstance which Herr Baske must have forgotten. On the evening of the 18th of October, we arrived safely in Rio de Janeiro. We immediately inquired about the christening, and heard it had been put off till the 15th of November, and that on the 19th of October only the Emperor's anniversary would be kept. We had thus hurried back to no purpose, without visiting the waterfall near Nova Friburgo, which we might have admired very much at our leisure. On our return, we only came eight miles out of our way. End of section 7《Section 8 of A Woman's Journey Round the World》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson A Woman's Journey Round the World by Ida Laura Pfeiffer Section 8 Chapter 5 The Voyage Round Cape Horn Departure from Rio Janeiro Santos and St. Paulo, Circumnavigation of Cape Horn, The Straits of Magellan, Arrival in Valparaiso, 8th December 1846 to 2nd March 1847. When I paid £25 for my place in the fine English bark, John Renwick, Captain Bell, the latter promised me that he would be ready to sail on the 25th of November at the latest, and would stop at no intermediate port, but shape his course direct to Valparaiso. The first part of this promise I believed, because he assured me that every day he stopped cost him seven pounds, and the second because, as a general rule, I willingly believe every one, even ship captains. In both particulars, however, was I deceived, for it was not until the 8th of December that I received a notice to go on board that evening, and then for the first time the captain informed me that he must run into Santos to lay in a stock of provisions, which were there much cheaper than in Rio Janeiro. That he also intended clearing out a cargo of coal and taking in another of sugar. He did not tell me till we arrived in Santos itself, where he also assured me that all these different matters would not take him more than three or four days. I took my leave of my friends and went on board in the evening. Count Birch told, and Messrs. Geiger and Rister accompanying me to the ship. Early in the morning of the ninth of December we weighed anchor, but the wind was so unfavourable 
that we were obliged to tack the whole way in order to gain the open sea, and it was not until about 10 a.m. that we lost sight of land. There were eight passengers besides myself, five Frenchmen, one Belgian, and two citizens of Milan. I looked upon the latter as half-countrymen of mine, and we were soon very good friends. It was the second time this year that the two Italians were making the voyage round Cape Horn. Their first had not been fortunate. They reached Cape Horn in winter, which in those cold southern latitude lasts from April till about November. Footnote. In the southern hemisphere, the seasons, as regard the months, are exactly the contrary to what they are in the northern. For instance, when it is winter on the one side of the equator, it is summer on the other, etc. End of footnote. They were unable to circumnavigate the Cape, being driven back by violent contrary winds and storms, against which they strove for fourteen weary days without making the least progress. The crew now lost courage, and affirmed that it would be advisable to turn back and wait for more favourable winds. The captain, however, was not of this opinion, and succeeded so well in working upon the pride of the crew that they once more engaged in their conflict with the elements. It was, however, for the last time, for the very same night a tremendous sea broke over the ship, tearing away all her upper works and sweeping the captain and six of the sailors overboard. The water poured in torrents into the cabins and drove every one from their berths. The bulwarks, boats, and binnacle were carried clean off, and the mainmast had to be cut away. The sailors then turned the ship about, and after a long and dangerous voyage, succeeded in bringing her, dismasted as she was, into Rio Janeiro. This story was not very encouraging, but the fine weather and our good ship relieved us of all anxiety. With regard to the vessel, we could not have chosen a better. It had large comfortable cabins, an exceedingly good-natured and obliging captain, and a bill of fare which must have contented the most dainty palate. Every day we had roast or stewed fowls, ducks or geese, fresh mutton or pork, eggs variously prepared, plum pudding and tarts. To all this were added side dishes of ham, rice, potatoes and other vegetables, and for dessert dried fruit, nuts, almonds, cheese, etc. There was also plenty of bread, fresh baked every day, and good wine. We all unanimously acknowledged that we had never been so well treated, or had so good a table in any sailing vessel before, and we could therefore, in this respect, look forward to our voyage without any apprehension. On the 12th of December we hove in sight of the mountain ranges of Santos, and at nine o'clock the same evening we reached a bay which the captain took for that of the same name. Lighted torches were repeatedly held over the vessel's side to summon a pilot. No pilot, however, made his appearance, and we were, therefore, obliged to trust to chance, and anchor at the mouth of the bay. On the morning of the 13th a pilot came on board, and astonished us with the intelligence that we had anchored before the wrong bay. We had some trouble in working our way out, and anchoring about noon in the right one. A pretty little chateau-like building immediately attracted our attention. We took it for some advanced building of the town and congratulated one another on having reached our temporary destination so quickly. On approaching nearer, however, we could perceive no signs of the town and learned that the building was a small fort and that Santos was situated in a second bay communicating with the first by a small arm of the sea. Unluckily, the wind had by this time fallen and we were obliged to be at anchor all day and it was not until the 14th that a slight breeze sprang up and wafted us into port. Santos is most charmingly situated at the entrance of a large valley. Picturesque hills adorned with chapels and detached houses rise on each side, and immediately beyond are considerable mountain ranges, spreading in a semicircle round the valley, while a lovely island forms a most beautiful foreground to the whole. We had scarcely landed before the captain informed us that we must stop for at least five days. The Italians, one of the Frenchmen and myself, determined that we would take advantage of this delay to make an excursion to St. Paulo, the largest inland town of the Brazils, and about 40 miles from Santos. The same evening we hired mules, for which we paid five mil rise, ten shillings and tenpence, each, 
and set out upon our trip. 15th of December. Early in the morning we armed ourselves with well-charged double-barreled pistols, having been alarmed by accounts of the maroon negroes, about a hundred of whom were said to be at that time lurking in the mountains, and to be so daring that they extended their inroads as far as the vicinity of Santos itself. Footnote. Maroon negroes are those negroes who have run away from their masters. They generally collect in large bands and retire into the recesses of the virgin forests, whence, however, they often emerge to steal and plunder. Their depredations are not unfrequently accompanied by murder. End of footnote. The first eight miles led through the valley to the lofty range of mountains which we had to cross. The road was good and more frequented than any I had yet seen in the Brazils. Handsome wooden bridges traverse the rivers Vicente and Cubatao. One of these bridges is actually covered, but then every one is charged a pretty high toll. In one of the vendors at the foot of the mountain, we fortified ourselves with some excellent pancakes, laid in a stock of sugar canes, the juice of which is excessively refreshing in the great heat, and then proceeded to scale the Serra, 3,400 feet high. The road was inexorable, full of holes, pits, and puddles, in which our poor beasts often sank above their knees. We had to skirt chasms and ravines, with torrents rolling loudly beneath, yet not visible to us, on account of the thick underwood which grew over them. Some part of the way, too, lay through virgin forests, which, however, were not nearly so beautiful or thick as some I had traversed on my excursion to the Puris. There were hardly any palm trees, and the few there were reminded us from their thin stems and scanty foliage of those of a colder climate. The prospect from the Serra struck us all with astonishment. The entire valley with its woods and prairies was spread far and wide before our sight, as far as the bays, the little detached huts being quite indistinguishable, while only a part of the town and a few masts of ships were perceptible in the distance. A turning in the road soon shut out this charming picture from our gaze. We then left the Serra, and entered upon a woody, uneven tract, alternating with large, level grass plots, covered with low brushwood and innumerable molehills two feet high. Halfway from Santos to San Paulo is a place called Rio Grande, the houses of which lie, after the Brazilian fashion, so far apart that no one would suppose they had any connection with each other. The owner of the mules used on this journey resides here, and here likewise the money for their hire is paid. If the traveller desires to proceed immediately, he has fresh mules given him, but should he prefer stopping the afternoon or night, he finds very good victual and clean rooms, for which he has nothing to pay, as they are included in the five mill rides, ten shillings, ten pence, charged for the mules. We snatched a hasty morsel or two, and then hurried on, in order to complete the second half of the road before sunset. The plain became broader and broader the nearer we approached the town. The beauty of the scenery falls off very much, and for the first time since I left Europe did I see fields and hills of sand. The town itself, situated upon a hill, presents a tolerable appearance. It contains about 22,000 inhabitants, and is a place of considerable importance for the internal commerce of the country. In spite of this, however, it has neither an inn nor any other place where strangers can alight. After inquiring for a long time in vain for lodgings, we were directed to a German and a Frenchman, with the remark that both received lodgers out of pure politeness. We went first to the German, who very bluntly cut us short by saying he had no room. From him we proceeded to the Frenchman, who sent us to a Portuguese, and on visiting the latter we received the same answer we had obtained from the German. We were now greatly embarrassed, the more so because the wearisome nature of our journey had so fatigued the Frenchman that he was hardly able any longer to sit upright in his saddle. In this critical position I thought of the letter of recommendation that Herr Geiger had given me in Rio Janeiro for a German gentleman of the name of Loskiel, who had settled here. I had intended not to deliver this letter until the next day, but necessity knows no law, and so I paid my visit the same evening. He was kind enough to interest himself for us in the warmest manner imaginable. 
he gave one of the gentlemen and myself lodgings in his own house and our two companions in that of a neighbour of his inviting all of us to dine at his table we now learned that in st paulo no one not even a hotel keeper will receive a stranger if he has not been provided with a letter of recommendation it is certainly a lucky thing for travellers that this strange custom is not prevalent everywhere sixteenth of december after having completely recovered ourselves from the fatigue of our yesterday's ride our first thought was to view the curiosities of the town we asked our hospitable host for information on this point but he merely shrugged his shoulders and said that he knew of no curiosities unless indeed we chose to look upon the botanical gardens in the light of one we went out therefore after breakfast and first of all viewed the town where we found the number of large and well-built houses was in comparison to the size of the two palaces greater than in rio janeiro although even here there was nothing like taste or peculiar architectural style the streets are tolerably wide but present an extraordinarily deserted appearance the universal silence being broken only by the insupportable creaking of the country people's carts these carts rest upon two wheels or rather two wooden discs which are often not even hooped with iron to keep them together the axle which is likewise of wood is never greased and thus causes the demoniacal kind of music to which i alluded a peculiarity of dress very remarkable in this hot climate is here prevalent all the men with the exception of the slaves wear large cloth cloaks one half of which they throw over their shoulder i even saw a great many women enveloped in long broadcloth capes in st paulo there is a high school those who study there and come from the country or the smaller towns are exposed to the inconvenience of being refused lodging under any one's roof they are obliged to hire and furnish houses for themselves and be their own housekeepers we visited several churches which possess very little worth looking at either inside or out and then concluded by proceeding to the botanical gardens which also contains no object of any interest with the exception of a plantation of chinese teas all our sightseeing did not occupy us more than a few hours and we could very conveniently have begun our journey back to santos the next morning but the frenchman who on account of the great fatigue he had suffered had not accompanied us in our walk begged us to put off our return for half a day longer and to arrange it in such a manner that we should pass the night in rio grande we willingly acceded to his wish and set out upon the afternoon of the seventeenth after thanking our kind host most cordially for his hospitable entertainment in rio grande we found an excellent supper convenient sleeping apartments and a good breakfast the next morning about twelve o'clock on the eighteenth of december we arrived safely in santos and the frenchman then confessed to us he had felt so fatigued on arriving in st paulo from his long ride that he was afraid of being seriously ill however he recovered himself completely in a few days but assured us that it would be some time before he again accompanied us on one of our trips the first question we put to the captain was when do you weigh anchor to which he very politely replied that as soon as he had cleared out two hundred tons of coal and shipped six thousand sacks of sugar he should be ready to set sail and in consequence of this we had to remain three whole weary weeks in santos we were still in santos when we celebrated new year's day eighteen forty seven and at last on the second of january we were lucky enough to bid the town adieu but did not proceed far for in the first bay the wind fell and did not spring up again till after midnight it was now sunday and no true englishman will set sail on a sunday we remained therefore lying at anchor the whole of the third of january looking with very melancholy feelings after two ships whose captains in spite of the holiness of the day had profited by a fresh breeze and sailed gaily past us on the same evening we saw a vessel which our captain affirmed was a slaver run into the bay it kept as far as possible from the fort and cast anchor at the most outward extremity of the bay as the night was clear and moonlight we walked late upon the deck when true enough we saw little boats laden with negroes pulling in shore an officer indeed came from the fort to inquire into the doings of this suspicious craft but the owner seemed to afford him a satisfactory account for he left the ship and the slaves continued during the whole night to be quietly and undisturbedly 
smuggled in as before on the morning of the fourth of january as we sailed past the vessel we beheld a great number of the poor creatures still standing upon the deck our captain inquired of the slave dealer how many slaves he had on board and we learned with astonishment that the number amounted to six hundred and seventy much has already been said and written upon this horrible trade it is everywhere execrated and looked upon as a blot on the human race and yet it still continues to flourish this day promised to turn out a very melancholy one in many respects we had hardly lost sight of the slaver before one of our own crew had nearly committed suicide the steward a young mulatto had contracted the bad habit of indulging too much in liquor the captain had often threatened to punish him severely but all to no purpose and this morning he was so intoxicated that the sailors were obliged to lay him in the corner of the foresail where he might sleep himself sober suddenly however he leapt up clambered on to the forepart of the ship and threw himself into the sea luckily it was almost a calm the water was quite still and we had hopes of saving him he soon reappeared at the side of the vessel and ropes were thrown him from every side the love of life was awakened in his breast and caused him to grasp involuntarily at the ropes but he had not strength enough to hold on he again sank and it was only after great exertion that the brave sailors succeeded in rescuing him from a watery grave hardly had he recovered his senses ere he endeavoured to throw himself in again exclaiming that he had no wish to live the man was raving mad and the captain was obliged to have him bound hand and foot and chained to the mast on the following day he was deprived of his office and degraded to the rank of subordinate to the new steward fifth of january mostly calms our cook caught to-day a fish three feet long and remarkable for the manner in which it changed colour when it came out of the water it was a bright yellow to which colour it owes the name of dorado at the expiration of one or two minutes the brilliant yellow changed into a light sky blue and after its death its belly again turned into a beautiful light yellow but the back was a brownish green it is reckoned a great delicacy but for my part i found its flesh rather dry on the ninth of january we were off the rio grande in the evening everything seemed to promise a violent storm the captain consulted his barometer every second almost and issued his orders according to its indications black clouds now began to drive towards us and the wind increased to such a pitch that the captain had all the hatchways carefully fastened down and the crew ready to reef the sails at a moment's notice at a little past eight the hurricane broke forth flash after flash of lightning darted across the horizon from every side and lighted the sailors in their work the agitated waves being illuminated with the most dazzling brilliancy the majestic rolling of the thunder drowned the captain's voice and the white foaming billows broke with such terrific force over the deck that it appeared as if they would carry everything with them into the depths of the ocean unless there had been ropes stretched on either side of the ship for the sailors to catch hold of the latter would most certainly have been washed away such a storm as this affords much food for reflection you are alone upon the boundless ocean far from all human help and feel more than ever that your life depends upon the almighty alone the man who in such a dreadful and solemn moment can still believe there is no god must indeed be irretrievably struck with mental blindness a feeling of tranquil joy always comes over me during such great convulsions of nature i very often have myself bound near the binnacle and let the tremendous waves break over me in order to absorb as it were as much of the spectacle before me as possible on no occasion did i ever feel alarmed but always confident and resigned at the expiration of four hours the storm had worn itself out and was succeeded by a perfect calm on the tenth of january we caught sight of sea turtles and a whale the latter was only a young one about forty feet long eleventh of january we were now off the rio plata and found the temperature very perceptibly cooler footnote the rio plata is one of the largest rivers in brazil End of footnote. up to the present time we had seen no signs of sea tangle or molluscae 
but during the night we beheld some molluscae for the first time shining like stars at a great depth below the surface of the water in these latitudes the constellation of the southern cross keeps increasing in brilliancy and beauty though it is far from being as wonderful as it is said to be the stars in it four in number and disposed somewhat to the following manner are it is true large and splendid but they did not excite either in myself or any other person of our company much more admiration than the other constellations as a general rule many travellers exaggerate a great deal on the one hand they often describe things which they have never seen themselves and only know from hearsay and on the other they adorn what they really have seen with a little too much imagination sixteenth of january in thirty seven degrees south latitude we fell in with a strong current running from south to north and having a yellow streak down the middle of it the captain said that this streak was caused by a shoal of small fishes i had some water drawn up in a bucket and really found a few dozen living creatures which in my opinion however belonged rather to some species of molluscae than to any kind of fish they were about three quarters of an inch long and as transparent as the most delicate water bubbles they were marked with white and yellow spots on the fore part of their bodies and had a few feelers underneath in the night of the twentieth to twenty first of january we were overtaken by a very violent storm which so damaged our mainmast that the captain determined on running into some haven on the first opportunity and putting in a new one for the present the old one was made fast with cables iron chains and braces in forty three degrees north latitude we saw the first sea tangle the temperature had by this time very perceptibly decreased in warmth the glass often standing no higher than fifty nine degrees or sixty three degrees fahrenheit twenty third january we were so near patagonia that we could easily make out the outline of the coast twenty sixth january we still kept near the land in fifty degrees south latitude we saw the chalky mountains of patagonia Today we passed the Falkland Islands, which stretched from 51 degrees to 52 degrees south latitude. We did not see them, however, as we kept as near the land as possible, in order not to miss the Straits of Magellan. For some days the captain had been studying an English book, which, in his opinion, clearly proved that the passage through the Straits of Magellan was far less dangerous and far shorter than that round Cape Horn. I asked him how it happened that other sailors knew nothing of this valuable book and why all vessels bound for the western coast of america went round cape horn he could give me no other answer than that the book was very dear and that that was the reason no one bought it footnote other captains assured me that it was only possible for men of war to pass through the straits of magellan as the passage requires a great number of hands every evening the ship must be brought to an anchor and the crew must constantly be in readiness to trim or reef the sails on account of the various winds which are always springing up End of footnote. to me this bold idea of the captain's was extremely welcome i already pictured in my mind the six feet tall patagonians putting off to us in their boats i saw myself taking their muscles plants ornaments and weapons in exchange for coloured ribbons and handkerchiefs while to render my satisfaction complete the captain said that he should land at port famine a patagonian haven to supply the injured portion of our mainmast how thankful was i in secret for the storm for having reduced our ship to her present condition too soon however were all my flattering hopes and dreams dispelled on the twenty seventh of january the latitude and longitude were taken and it was then found that the straits of magellan were twenty seven minutes or nautical miles behind us but as we were becalmed the captain promised in case of a favourable wind should spring up to endeavour to return as far as the straits i placed no more confidence in this promise and i was right about noon a scarcely perceptible breeze sprang up which the captain in high spirits pronounced a favourable one for rounding cape horn if he had ever really intended to pass through the straits he would only have had to cruise about for a few hours for the wind soon changed and blew directly in a desired direction twenty eighth january we were constantly so near terra del fuego that we could make out every bush with the naked eye we could have reached the land in one hour 
without retarding our voyage in the least, for we were frequently becalmed. But the captain would not consent, as the wind might spring up every instant. The coast appeared rather steep, but not high. The foreground was composed of meagre pasture, alternating with tracts of sand, and in the background were ranges of woody hills, beyond which rose snow-covered mountains. On the whole, the country struck me as being more inhabitable than the island of Iceland, which I had visited a year and a half previously. The temperature, too, must here be higher, as even at sea we have 54 degrees 5 minutes and 59 degrees Fahrenheit. I saw three kinds of sea tangle, but could only obtain a specimen of one, resembling that which I had seen in 44 degrees south latitude. The second kind was not very different, but it was only the third that had pointed leaves, several of which together formed a sort of fan, several feet long and broad. On the 30th of January we passed very near the Staten Islands, lying between 56 degrees and 57 degrees south latitude. They are composed of bare high mountains and separated from Terra del Fuego by an arm of the sea called La Mer, only seven miles long and about the same distance across. The captain told us, seamanlike, that on one occasion of his sailing through these straits, his ship had got into a strong current and regularly danced, turning round during the passage at least a thousand times. I had already lost a great deal of confidence in the captain's tales, but I kept my eyes steadily fixed upon a Hamburg brig that happened to be sailing ahead to see whether she would dance, but neither she nor our own bark was so obliging. Neither vessels turned even once, and the only circumstance worthy of remark was the heaving and foaming of the waves in the strait, while at both ends the sea lay majestically calm before our eyes. We had passed the strait in an hour, and I took the liberty of asking the captain why our ship had not danced, to which he replied it was because we had both wind and current with us. It is perhaps possible that under other circumstances the vessel might have turned round once or twice, but I strongly doubt its doing so a thousand times. This was, however, a favourite number with our worthy captain. One of the gentlemen once asked him some question about the first London hotels, and was told that it was impossible to remember their names, as there were above a thousand of the first class. Near the Strait Le Mer begins, in the opinion of the seamen, the dangerous part of the passage round Cape Horn, and ends off the Straits of Magellan. Immediately we entered it, we were greeted with two most violent bursts of wind, each of which lasted about half an hour. They came from the neighbouring icy chasms in the mountains of Terra del Fuego, and split two sails, and broke the great studding sail-yard, although the sailors were numerous and quick. The distance from the end of the Strait Le Mer to the extreme point of the Cape is calculated to be not more than seventy miles, and yet this trifling passage cost us three days. At last, on the 3rd of February, we were fortunate enough to reach the southernmost point of America, so dreaded by all mariners. Bare, pointed mountains, one of which looks like a crater that has fallen in, form the extremity of the mighty mountain chain, and a magnificent group of colossal black rocks, basalt, of all shapes and sizes, are scattered at some distance in advance, and are separated only by a small arm of the sea. The extreme point of Cape Horn is 600 feet high. At this spot, according to our works in geography, the Atlantic Ocean changes its name and assumes that of the Pacific. Sailors, however, do not give it the latter designation before reaching the Straits of Magellan, as up to this point the sea is continually stormy and agitated, as we learned to our cost, being driven by violent storms as far back as 60 degrees south latitude. Besides this, we lost our topmast, which was broken off, and which, in spite of the heavy sea, had to be replaced. The vessel, meanwhile, being so tossed about that we were often unable to take our meals at the table, but were obliged to squat down upon the ground and hold our plates in our hands. On one of these fine days the steward stumbled with the coffee pot and deluged me with its burning contents. Luckily, only a small portion fell upon my hands, so that the accident was not a very serious one. After battling for fourteen days with winds and waves, with rain and cold, we at last arrived off the western entrance to the Straits of Magellan, having accomplished the most dangerous portion of our voyage. 
Footnote. The glass sank in the daytime to 48 degrees and 50 degrees, and at night to 28 degrees below zero. End of footnote. During these 14 days we saw very few whales or albatrosses, and not one iceberg. We thought that we should now quietly pursue our way along the placid sea, trusting confidently in its peaceful name. For three whole days we had nothing to complain of, but in the night of the 19th to the 20th of February we were overtaken by a storm worthy of the Atlantic itself, which lasted for nearly 24 hours and cost us four sails. We suffered most damage from the tremendous waves, which broke with such fury over the ship that they tore up one of the planks on the deck and let the water into the cargo of sugar. The deck itself was like a lake, and the portholes had to be opened in order to get rid of the water more quickly. The water leaked in the hold at the rate of two inches an hour. We could not light any fire, and were obliged to content ourselves with bread and cheese and raw ham, which we with great difficulty conveyed to our mouth as we sat upon the ground. The last cask of lamp oil, too, fell a sacrifice to this storm, having been torn from its fastenings and broken into pieces. The captain was very apprehensive of not having enough oil to light the compass till we arrived at Valparaiso, and all the lamps on the ship were, in consequence, replaced by candles, and the small quantity of oil remaining kept for the compass. In spite of all these annoyances, we kept up our spirits, and even, during the storm, we could scarcely refrain from laughing at the comical positions we all fell into whenever we attempted to stand up. The remainder of the voyage to Valparaiso was calm, but excessively disagreeable. The captain wished to present a magnificent appearance on arriving, so that the good people might believe that wind and waves could not injure his fine vessel. He had the whole ship painted from top to bottom with oil colours. Even the little doors in the cabins were not spared this infliction. Not content with creating a most horrid disturbance over our heads, the carpenter invaded even our cabins, filling all our things with sawdust and dirt, so that we poor passengers had not a dry or quiet place of refuge in the whole ship. Just as much as we had been pleased with Captain Bell's politeness during all the previous part of the voyage, we were indignant at his behaviour during the last five or six days. But we could offer no resistance, for the captain is an autocrat on board his own ship, knowing neither a constitution nor any other limit to his despotic power. At six o'clock in the evening of the 2nd of March, we ran into the port of Valparaiso. End of section 8 Section 9 of A Woman's Journey Round the World This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. A Woman's Journey Round the World by Ida Laura Pfeiffer. Section 9. Arrival and Residence in Valparaiso. Appearance of the Town. Public Buildings. A Few Observations on the Manners and Customs of the Lower Classes. The Eating Houses of Polonia. The Cherub Angelito, the Railroad, Gold and Silver Mines. The appearance of Valparaiso is dull and monotonous. The town is laid out in two long streets at the foot of dreary hills, which look like gigantic masses of sand, but which really consist of large rocks covered with thin layers of earth and sand. On some of these hills are houses, and on one of them is the churchyard which combined with the wooden church towers built in the spanish style relieves to a slight degree the wearisome uniformity of the prospect not less astounding than the deserted look of the port was the miserably wretched landing place which is composed of a high wooden quay about a hundred feet long stretching out into the sea with narrow steps like ladders against the side it was a most pitiable sight to see a lady attempting to go up or down. All persons who were in the least weak or awkward had to be let down with ropes. The two principal streets are tolerably broad, 
and very much frequented especially by horsemen every chilean is born a horseman and some of their horses are such fine animals that you involuntarily stop to admire their proud action their noble bearing and the nice symmetry of their limbs the stirrups are curiously formed consisting of long heavy pieces of wood hollowed out and into which the rider places the tips of his feet the spurs are remarkably large and are often about four inches in diameter the houses are constructed completely in the european style with flat italian roofs the more ancient buildings have only a ground floor and are small and ugly while most of the modern ones have a spacious and handsome first floor the interior too of the latter is generally very tasty large steps conduct into a lofty well ventilated entrance hall on the first floor from which the visitor passes through large glass doors into the drawing room and other apartments the drawing room is the pride not only of every european who has settled in the country but also of the chileans who often spend very large sums in the decorations heavy carpets cover all the floor rich tapestry hangs against the walls furniture and mirrors of the most costly description are procured from europe and on the tables are strewed magnificent albums adorned with the most artistic engravings the elegant fireplaces however convinced me that the winters here are not as mild as the inhabitants would fain have had me believe of all the public buildings the theatre and the exchange are the finest the interior of the former is very neat and contains a roomy pit and two galleries portioned off as boxes the inhabitants of the town patronize the theatre a great deal but not so much on account of the italian operas played there as for the sake of possessing a common place of meeting the ladies always come in full dress and mutual visits are made in the boxes all of which are very spacious and beautifully furnished with mirrors carpets sofas and chairs the second fine building the exchange comprises a good-sized cheerful hall with convenient rooms adjoining from the hall there is a pleasant view over the town and sea the building belonging to the german club contains some fine apartments with reading and card rooms the only thing that pleased me about the churches were the towers which consist of two or three octagons placed one above the other and each one supported by eight columns they are composed of wood the altars and pillars of the nave being of the same material the nave itself presents rather a poor and naked appearance occasioned in the great degree by the absence of sittings the men stand and the women bring with them little carpets which they spread before them and on which they either kneel or sit ladies in easy circumstances have their carpets brought by their maids the cathedral is called la matriza the public promenades of valparaiso are not very pleasant as most of the sidewalks and roads are covered almost a foot deep with sand and dust which the slightest breath of wind is sufficient to raise in thick clouds after ten o'clock in the morning when the sea breeze begins blowing the whole town is very often enveloped by it a great many persons are said to die here from diseases of the chest and lungs the most frequented places of resort are polanka and the lighthouse near the latter especially the prospect is very beautiful extending as it does on a clear day as far as some of the majestic snow-covered spurs of the andes the streets as i have already mentioned are tolerably lively peculiar omnibuses and cabriolets traverse them frequently the fare from one end of the town to the other is one real two and a half pence there are also a great number of asses mostly employed in carrying water and provisions the lower classes are remarkably ugly the chileans have a yellowish brown complexion thick black hair most unpleasant features and such a peculiarly repulsive cast of countenance that any physiognomist would straightway pronounce them to be robbers or pickpockets at the least captain bell had told me a great deal of the extraordinary honesty of these people and in his usual exaggerated manner assured us that a person might leave a purse of gold lying in the street with the certainty of finding it the next day on the same spot 
but in spite of this i must frankly confess that on my part i should be rather fearful of meeting these honest creatures even by day in a lonely spot with the money in my pocket i had subsequently opportunities of convincing myself of the fallaciousness of the captain's opinion for i often met with convicts chained together and employed in the public buildings and cleaning the roads the windows and doors too are secured with bolts and bars in a manner almost unknown in any town of europe at night in all the streets and on all the hills which are inhabited the parties of police who call out to one another in exactly the same manner that the advance posts do during a campaign mounted patrols also traverse the town in every direction and persons returning alone from the theatre or from a party often engage their services to conduct them home burglariously entering a house is punished with death all these precautions do not most decidedly argue much for the honesty of the people i will take this opportunity of mentioning a scene of which i was myself an eye-witness as it happened before my window a little boy was carrying a number of plates and dishes on a board when the latter unluckily slipped from his grasp and all the crockery lay in fragments at his feet at first the poor fellow was so frightened that he stood like a column gazing with a fixed look at the pieces and then began to cry most bitterly the passers-by stopped it is true to look at the unfortunate child but did not evince the least compassion they laughed and went on in any other place they would have raised a little subscription or at least pitied and consoled him but certainly would not have seen anything to laugh at the circumstance is of itself a mere trifle but it is exactly by such trifles that we are often enabled to form a true estimate of people's real characters another adventure also but of quite a different and most horrible kind happened during my stay in valparaiso as i have already remarked it is the custom here as well as in many countries of europe to sentence criminals to hard labor on public works one of the convicts endeavored to bribe his jailer to let him escape and so far succeeded that the latter promised on his paying an ounce seventeen spanish dollars three pounds and eight shillings to give him an opportunity for flight the prisoners are allowed every morning and afternoon to receive the visits of their friends and relations and likewise to accept provisions from them the wife of the convict in question profited by this regulation to bring her husband the necessary money and on receiving this the jailer arranged matters so that on the next morning the convict was not fastened to the same chain with a fellow criminal as is usually the case but could walk alone and thus easily get clear off more especially as the spot in which they worked was a very lonely one the whole affair was very cunningly arranged but either the jailer changed his mind or perhaps from the beginning had intended to act as he did he fired at the fugitive and shot him dead it is very seldom that any pure descendants of the original inhabitants are to be seen we met with only two they struck me as very similar to the puris of brazil except that they have not such small ugly shaped eyes in this country there are no slaves the dress of the chileans is quite in the european taste especially as regards the women the only difference with the men is that instead of a coat they frequently wear the poncho which is composed of two pieces of cloth or merino each about one ell broad and two ells long the two pieces are sewn together with the exception of an opening in the middle for the head to pass through the whole garment reaches down to the hips and resembles a square cape the poncho is worn of all colors green blue bright red etc and looks very handsome especially when embroidered all round with colored silk which is the case when the wearer is opulent in the streets the women invariably wear large scarfs which they draw over their heads in church my intention on coming to chile was to stop for a few weeks in order to have time for an excursion to the capital santiago and after that to proceed to china as i had been told in rio janeiro that there was a ship from valparaiso to china every month unfortunately this was not the case i found that vessels bound for that country was very seldom to be met with but that there happened to be one at that moment 
which would sail in five or six days. I was generally advised not to lose the opportunity, but rather to abandon my design of visiting Santiago. I reflected for a little and agreed to do so, although with a heavy heart, and in order to avoid all disappointment immediately went to the captain, who offered to take me for two hundred Spanish dollars, forty pounds. I agreed, and have five days left which I determined to spend in carefully examining Valparaiso and its environs. I should have had plenty of time to pay Santiago a flying visit, since it is only a hundred and thirty miles from Valparaiso, but the expenses would have been very heavy, as there is no public conveyance, and consequently I should have been obliged to hire a carriage for myself. Besides this, I should have derived but little satisfaction from the mere superficial impressions, which would have been all I could have obtained of either town. I contented myself, therefore, with Valparaiso alone. I toiled industriously up the surrounding hills and mountains, visited the huts of the lower classes, witnessed their national dances, etc., determined that here at least I would become acquainted with everything. On some of the hills, especially on the Serra Allegri, there are the most lovely country houses with elegant gardens and a most beautiful view over the sea. The prospect inland is not so fine, as chains of tall, naked, ugly mountains rise up behind the hills and completely shut in the scene. The huts of the poor people are miserably bad, being mostly built of clay and wood, and threatening to fall down every moment. I hardly ventured to enter them, thinking that the interior was of a piece with the exterior, and was consequently astonished at seeing not only good beds, chairs, and tables, but very often elegant little altars adorned with flowers. The inmates, too, were far from being badly dressed, and the linen hung out before many of these hovels struck me as superior to much that I had seen at the windows of some of the most elegant houses, situated in the principal streets of the towns of Sicily. A very good idea of the manners and customs of the people may be easily obtained by strolling, on Sundays and fete days, near Polanka, and visiting the eating-houses. I will introduce my reader to one of these places. In one corner, on the ground, burns a fierce fire, surrounded by innumerable pots and pans, between which are wooden pits with beef and pork, simmering and roasting in the most enticing manner. An ungainly wooden framework, with a long broad plank on it, occupies the middle of the room, and is covered with a cloth whose original colour it would be an impossibility to determine. This is the table at which the guests sit. During the dinner itself, the old patriarchal customs are observed, with this difference, that not only do all the guests eat out of one dish, but that all the eatables are served up in one, and one only. Beans and rice, potatoes and roast beef, paradise apples and onions, etc., etc., lie quietly side by side, and are devoured in the deepest silence. At the end of the repast, a goblet filled with wine, or sometimes merely water, is passed from hand to hand, and after this has gone round, the company begin to talk. In the evening, dancing is vigorously pursued to the music of a guitar. Unfortunately, it was lent during my visit, when all public amusements are prohibited. The people themselves, however, were not so particular, and were only too ready for a few rio, to go through the Samaqueca and Refalosa, the national dances of the country. I had soon seen sufficient. The gestures and movements of the dancers were beyond all description unbecoming, and I could but pity the children, whose natural modesty cannot fail to be nipped in the bud by witnessing the performance of these dances. I was equally displeased with a remarkable custom prevalent here, in accordance with which the death of a little child is celebrated by its parents as a grand festival. They name the deceased child an angelito, little angel, and adorn it in every possible way. Its eyes are not closed, but, on the contrary, opened as wide as possible, and its cheeks are painted red. It is then dressed out in the finest clothes, crowned with flowers, and placed in a little chair, in a kind of niche, which also is ornamented with flowers. The relations and neighbours then come and wish the parents joy at possessing such an angel, and during the first night the parents, relations and friends execute the wildest dances, 
and feast in the most joyous fashion before the angelito i heard that in the country it was not unusual for the parents to carry the little coffin to the churchyard themselves followed by the relations with the brandy bottle in their hands and giving vent to their joy in the most outrageous manner a merchant told me that one of his friends who holds a judicial appointment had a short time previous been called to decide a curious case a grave digger was carrying one of these deceased angels to the churchyard when he stepped into a tavern to take a dram the landlord inquired what he had got under his poncho and on learning that it was an angelito offered him two rio for it the grave digger consented the landlord quickly arranged a niche with flowers in the drinking room and then hastened to inform the whole neighborhood what a treasure he had got they all came admired the little angel and drank and feasted in its honor but the parents soon heard of it hurried down to the tavern took away their child and had the landlord brought before the magistrate on hearing the case the latter could scarcely restrain from laughing but arranged the matter amicably as such a crime was not mentioned in the statute book the manner in which patients are conveyed to the hospital here is very remarkable they are placed upon a simple wooden armchair with one band fastened in front of them to prevent their falling off and another beneath for them to place their feet on a most horrible sight when the sick person is so weak that he can no longer hold himself in an upright posture i was not a little astonished on hearing that in this country where there is yet no post or indeed any regular means of conveyance from one place to another that a railroad was about being constructed from here to santiago the work has been undertaken by an english company and the necessary measurements already begun as the localities are very mountainous the railroad will have to make considerable windings in order to profit by the level tracks and this will occasion an enormous outlay quite out of proportion to the present state of trade or the amount of passenger traffic at present there are not more than two or three vehicles a day from one place to the other and if by chance ten or fifteen passengers come from santiago to valparaiso the thing is talked of over the whole town this has given rise to the belief that the construction of a railroad has merely been seized on as an excuse in order to enable those concerned to search about the country undisturbed for gold and silver persons discovering mines are highly favored and have full right of property to their discovery being obliged merely to notify the same to the government this license is pushed to such an extent that if for instance a person can advance any plausible grounds for asserting that he has found a mine in a particular spot such as under a church or house etc he is at liberty to have either pulled down provided he is rich enough to pay for the damage done about fifteen years ago a donkey driver accidentally hit upon a productive silver mine he was driving several asses over the mountain when one of them gave way he seized a stone and was about to throw it after the animal but stumbled and fell to the ground while the stone escaped from his grasp and rolled away rising in a great passion he snatched a second from the earth and had drawn his arm to throw the stone when he was struck by its uncommon weight he looked at it more closely and perceived that it was streaked with rich veins of pure silver he preserved the stone as a treasure marked the spot drove his asses home and then communicated his important discovery to one of his friends who was a miner both of them then returned to the place which the miner examined and pronounced the soil full of precious ore nothing was now wanting save capital to carry on their operations this they procured by taking the miners employer into partnership and in a few years all three were rich men the six days had now elapsed and the captain sent me a message to be on board with my bag and baggage the next day as he intended putting out to sea in the evening but on the morning of his intended departure my evil genius conducted a french man-of-war into the harbour little imagining that this was destined to overturn all my plans i proceeded very tranquilly to the landing-place where i met the captain hastening to meet me with a long story about his half-cargo and the necessity he was under of completing his freight with provisions for the use of the french garrison at tahiti and so forth in a word 
The end of the matter was that I was informed we should have to stop another five days. In the first burst of my disappointment, I paid a visit to the Sardinian consul, Herr Bayerbach, and told him of the position in which I was placed. He consoled me in a most kind and gentlemanly manner, as well as he could, and on learning that I had already taken up my quarters on board, insisted on my occupying a chamber in his country house in the Serra Allegri. Besides this, he introduced me to several families, where I passed many very pleasant hours, and had the opportunity of inspecting some excellent collections of mussel shells and insects. Our departure was again deferred from day to day, so that, although in this manner I spent fifteen days in Chile, I saw nothing more of it than Valparaiso and its immediate neighbourhood. As Valparaiso is situated to the south of the equator, and, as is well known, the seasons of the southern hemisphere are exactly the contrary to those of the northern, it was now autumn. I saw, 34 degrees south latitude, almost the same kinds of fruits and vegetables as those we have in Germany, especially grapes and melons. The apples and pears were not so good, nor so abundant as with us. In conclusion, I will here give a list of the prices which travellers have to pay for certain things. A room that is at all decent in a private house costs four or five rio, two shillings, a day. The table d'hote, a piastre, four shillings. But washing is more expensive than anything else, on account of the great scarcity of water, for every article, large or small, costs a real, six months. A passport, too, is excessively dear, being charged eight Spanish dollars, one pound twelve shillings. End of section 9section 10 of a woman's journey round the world this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by piotr natter a woman's journey round the world by ida laura pfeiffer chapter 7 the voyage from valparaiso to canton via tahiti part 1 departure from valparaiso tahiti manners and customs of the people fete and ball in honour of louis philippe excursions a tahitian dinner the lake vaihiria the defile of fanatua and the diadem departure arrival in china on the seventeenth of march captain van vick uriance sent me word that his ship was ready for sea and that he should set sail the next morning the news was very unwelcome to me as for the last two days i had been suffering from english cholera which on board ship where the patient cannot procure meat broth or any other light nourishment and where he is always more exposed to the sudden changes of the weather than he is on shore is very apt to be attended with grave results i did not however wish to miss the opportunity of visiting china knowing how rarely it occurred nor was i desirous of losing the two hundred dollars forty pounds already paid for my passage and i therefore went on board trusting in my good luck which had never forsaken me on my travels during the first few days i endeavoured to master my illness by observing a strict diet and abstaining from almost everything but to no purpose i still continued to suffer until i luckily thought of using salt-water baths i took them in a large tub in which i remained a quarter of an hour after the second bath i felt much better and after the sixth i was completely recovered i merely mentioned this malady to which i was very subject in warm climates that i may have the opportunity of remarking that sea baths or cooling drinks such as buttermilk sour milk sherbet orangeade etc are very efficacious remedies the ship in which I made my present voyage was the Dutch bark Lutpuit, a fine, strong vessel, quite remarkable for its cleanliness. The table was pretty good, too, with the exception of a few Dutch dishes and a superfluity of onions. To these, which played a prominent part in everything that was served up, I could not accustom myself, and felt greatly delighted that a large quantity of this noble production of the vegetable kingdom became spoiled during the voyage. The captain was a polite and kind man, and the mates and sailors were also civil and obliging. 
in fact as a general rule in every ship that i embarked in i was far from finding the seamen so rough and uncivil as travellers often represent them to be their manners are certainly not the most polished in the world neither are they extraordinarily attentive or delicate but their hearts and dispositions are mostly good after three days sailing we saw on the twenty first of march the island of saint felix and on the morning following saint ambrosio they both consist of naked inhospitable masses of rock and serve at most as resting places for a few gulls we were now within the tropics but found the heat greatly moderated by the trade winds and only unbearable in the cabin for nearly a month did we now sail on without the slightest interruption free from storms with the same monotonous prospect of sky and water before us until on the nineteenth of april we reached the archipelago of the society islands this archipelago stretching from one hundred and thirty degrees to one hundred and forty degrees longitude is very dangerous as most of the islands composing it scarcely rise above the surface of the water in fact to make out david clark's island which was only twelve miles distant the captain was obliged to mount to the shrouds during the night on the twenty first to the twenty second of april we were overtaken by a sudden and violent storm accompanied by heavy thunder this storm our captain termed a thunder gust while it lasted flashes of lightning frequently played around the mast tops occasioned by electricity they generally flutter for two or three minutes about the most elevated point of any object and then disappear the night of the twenty second to the twenty third of april was a very dangerous one even the captain said so we had to pass several of the low islands in dark rainy weather which completely concealed the moon from us about midnight our position was rendered worse by the springing up of a strong wind which together with incessant flashes of lightning caused us to expect another squall luckily however morning broke and we escaped both the storm and the islands in the course of the day we passed the bice islands and two days later on the twenty fifth of april we beheld one of the society islands maitia on the following morning being the thirty-ninth of our voyage we came in sight of tahiti and the island opposite to it emao also called moreo the entrance into papeiti the port of tahiti is exceedingly dangerous it is surrounded by reefs of coral as by a fortress while wild and foaming breakers rolling on every side leave but a small place open through which a vessel can steer a pilot came out to meet us and although the wind was so unfavorable that the sails had to be trimmed every instant steered us safely into port afterwards when we had landed we were congratulated heartily on our good fortune every one had watched our course with the greatest anxiety and at the last turn the ship took expected to see her strike upon a coral reef this misfortune had happened to a french man-of-war that at the period of our arrival had been lying at anchor for some months engaged in repairing the damage done before we could come to an anchor we were surrounded by half a dozen pirogues or boats manned by indians who climbed up from all sides upon the deck to offer us fruit and shellfish but not as formerly for red rags or glass beads such golden times for travellers are over they demanded money and were as grasping and cunning in their dealings as the most civilized europeans i offered one of them a small bronze ring he took it smelt it shook his head and gave me to understand that it was not gold he remarked another ring on my finger and seizing hold of my hand smelt this second ring as well then twisted his face into a friendly smile and made signs for me to give him the ornament in question i afterwards had frequent opportunities of remarking that the natives of these islands have the power of distinguishing between pure and counterfeit gold by the smell some years ago the island of tahiti was under the protection of the english but at present it is under that of the french it had long been a subject of dispute between the two nations until a friendly understanding was at last come to in november eighteen forty six queen pomare who had fled to another island had returned to papeiti five weeks before my arrival she resides in a four-roomed house and dines daily with her family at the governor's table the french government is having a handsome house built for her use and allows her a pension of twenty-five thousand francs per annum 
one hundred and forty one pounds thirteen shillings four pence no stranger is allowed to visit her without the governor's permission but this is easily obtained papeiti was full of french troops and several men of war were lying at anchor the place contains three or four thousand inhabitants and consists of a row of small wooden houses skirting the harbour and separated by small gardens in the immediate background is a fine wood with a number of huts scattered about in different parts of it the principal buildings are the governor's house the french magazines the military bakehouse the barracks and the queen's house which however is not quite completed besides these a number of small wooden houses were in the course of erection the want of them being greatly felt at the time of my visit even officers of high rank were obliged to be contented with the most wretched huts i went from hut to hut in the hopes of being able to obtain some small room or other but in vain all were already occupied i was at last obliged to be satisfied with a small piece of ground which i found at the carpenters whose room was already inhabited by four different individuals i was shown a place behind the door exactly six feet long and four broad there was no flooring but the earth itself the walls were composed of wicker work the bed was quite out of the question and yet for this accommodation i was obliged to pay one florin and thirty kreutzers a week about seven shillings the residence or hut of an indian consists simply of a roof of palm trees supported on a number of poles with sometimes the addition of walls formed of wicker works each hut contains only one room from twenty to fifty feet long and from ten to thirty feet broad and is frequently occupied by several families at the same time the furniture is composed of finely woven straw mats a few overlids and two or three wooden chests and stools the last however are reckoned articles of luxury cooking utensils are not wanted as the cookery of the indians does not include soups or sauces their provisions being simply roasted between two hot stones all they require is a knife and a cocoa shell for water before their huts or on the shore lie their pirogues formed of the trunks of trees hollowed out and so narrow small and shallow that they would constantly be overturning if there were not on one side five or six sticks each about a foot long fastened by a crossbar to preserve the equilibrium in spite of this however one of these boats is very easily upset unless a person steps in very cautiously when on one occasion i proceeded in a pirogue to the ship the good-hearted captain was horror-struck and in his concern for my safety even reprimanded me severely and besought me not to repeat the experiment a second time the costume of the indians has been since the first settlement of the missionaries about fifty years ago tolerably becoming especially in the neighbourhood of papeiti both men and women wear round their loins a kind of apron made of coloured stuff and called a pareo the women let it fall as low down as their ankles the men not farther than the calf of their leg the latter have a short coloured skirt underneath it and again beneath that large flowing trousers the women wear a long full blouse both sexes wear flowers in their ears which have such large holes bored in them that the stalk can very easily be drawn through the women both old and young adorn themselves with garlands of leaves and flowers which they make in the most artistic and elegant manner i have often seen men too wearing the same kind of ornament on grand occasions they cast over their ordinary dress an upper garment called a tiputa the cloth of which they manufacture themselves from the bark of the bread and cocoa trees the bark while it is still tender is beaten between two stones until it is as thin as paper it is then coloured yellow and brown one sunday i went into the meeting-house to see the people assembled there note all the indians are christians protestants but i fear only in name End of note. before entering they all laid aside their flowers with which they again ornamented themselves at their departure some of the women had black satin blouses on and european bonnets of an exceedingly ancient date it would not be easy to find a more ugly sight than that of their plump heavy heads and faces in these old-fashioned bonnets during the singing of the psalms there was some degree of attention and many of the congregation joined in very becomingly but while the clergyman was performing the service i could not remark the slightest degree of devotion in many of them 
the children played joked and ate while the adults gossiped or slept and although i was assured that many could read and even write i saw only two old men who made any use of their bibles the men are a remarkably strong and vigorous race six feet being by no means an uncommon height amongst them the women likewise are very tall but too muscular they might even be termed unwieldy the features of the men are handsomer than those of the women they have beautiful teeth and fine dark eyes but generally a large mouth thick lips and an ugly nose the cartilage being slightly crushed when the child is born so that the nose becomes flat and broad this fashion appears to be most popular with the females for their noses are the ugliest their hair is jet black and thick but coarse the women and girls usually wear it plaited in two knots the color of their skin is a copper brown all the natives are tattooed generally from the hips half down the legs and frequently this mode of ornamenting themselves is extended to the hands feet and other parts of the body the designs resemble arabesques they are regular and artistic in their composition and executed with much taste that the population of this place should be so vigorous and well formed is the most surprising if we reflect on their depraved and immoral kind of life little girls of seven or eight years old have their lovers of twelve or fourteen and their parents are quite proud of the fact the more lovers a girl has the more she is respected as long as she is not married she leads a most dissolute life and it is said that not all the married women make the most faithful wives possible i had frequent opportunities of seeing the national dances which are the most unbecoming i ever beheld although every painter would envy me my good fortune let the reader picture to himself a grove of splendid palms and other gigantic trees of the torrid zone with a number of open huts and a crowd of good-humoured islanders assembled beneath to greet in their fashion the lovely evening which is fast approaching before one of the huts a circle is formed and in the centre sit two herculean and half-naked natives beating time most vigorously on small drums five similar colossi are seated before them moving the upper parts of their bodies in the most horrible and violent manner and more especially the arms hands and fingers the latter they have the power of moving in every separate joint i imagine that by these gestures they desired to represent how they pursue their enemy ridicule his cowardice rejoice at their victory and so forth during all this time they howl continually in a most discordant manner and make the most hideous faces at the commencement the men appear alone upon the scene of action but after a short time two female forms dart forward from among the spectators and dance and rave like two maniacs the more unbecoming bold and indecent their gestures the greater the applause the whole affair does not at most last longer than two minutes and the pause before another dance is commenced not much longer an evening's amusement of this description often lasts for hours the younger members of the society very seldom take any part in the dances it is a great question whether the immorality of these islanders has been lessened by french civilization from my own observations as well as from what i was told by persons well informed on the subject i should say that this has not yet been the case and that for the present there is but little hope of its being so while on the other side the natives have acquired a number of useless wants in consequence of which the greed for gold has been fearfully awakened in their breasts as they are naturally very lazy and above all things disinclined to work they have made the female portion of the community the means of gaining money parents brothers and even husbands offer to their foreign masters those belonging to them while the women themselves offer no opposition as in this manner they can obtain the means for their own display and money for their relations without trouble every officer's house is the rendezvous of several native beauties who go out and in at every hour of the day even abroad they are not particular they will accompany any man without the least hesitation and no gentleman ever refuses a conductress of this description as a female of an advanced age i may be allowed to make a few observations upon such a state of things and i frankly own that although i have travelled much and seen a great deal i have never witnessed such shameful scenes of public depravity as a proof of what i assert i will mention a little affair which happened one day before my hut 
four fat graces were squatted on the ground smoking tobacco when an officer who happened to be passing caught a glimpse of the charming picture rushed up at double quick pace and caught hold of one of the beauties by the shoulder he began by speaking softly to her but as his anger increased he changed his tone to one of loud abuse but neither entreaties nor threats produced the slightest effect upon the delicate creature to whom they were addressed she remained coolly in the same position continuing to smoke with the greatest indifference and without deigning even to cast upon her excited swain a look far less answer him a word he became enraged to such a pitch that he so far forgot himself as to loosen the gold earrings from her ear and threatened to take away all the finery he had given her even this was not sufficient to rouse the girl from her stoiled calmness and the valiant officer was at last obliged to retreat from the field of battle from his conversation which was half in french and half in the native dialect i learned that in three months the girl had cost him about four hundred francs in dress and jewellery her wishes were satisfied and she quietly refused to have anything more to say to him i very often heard the feeling attachment and kindness of this people spoken of in terms of high praise with which however i cannot unreservedly agree their kindness i will not precisely dispute they readily invite a stranger to share their hospitality and even kill a pig in his honour give him a part of their couch etc but all this costs them no trouble and if they are offered money in return they take it eagerly enough without so much as thanking the donor as for feeling and attachment i should almost be inclined to deny that they possess them in the slightest degree i saw only sensuality and none of the nobler sentiments i shall return to this subject when describing my journey through the islands on the first of may i witnessed a highly interesting scene it was the fete of louis philippe the king of the french and the governor m brouin exerted himself to the utmost to amuse the population of tahiti in the forenoon there was a tournament on the water in which the french sailors were the performers several boats with lusty oarsmen put out to sea in the bows of each boat was a kind of ladder or steps on which stood one of the combatants with a pole the boats were then pulled close to one another and each combatant endeavoured to push his antagonist into the water besides this there was a mat de cocagne with coloured shirts ribbons and other trifles fluttering at the top for whoever chose to climb up and get them at twelve o'clock the chiefs and principal personages were entertained at dinner on the grass plot before the governor's house were heaped up various sorts of provisions such as salt meat bacon bread baked pork fruits etc but instead of the guests taking their places all around as we had supposed they would have done the chiefs divided everything into different portions and each carried his share home in the evening there were fireworks and a ball no part of the entertainment amused me more than the ball where i witnessed the most startling contrasts of art and nature elegant french women side by side with their brown awkward sisters and the staff officers in full uniform in juxtaposition with the half-naked islanders many of the natives wore on this occasion broad white trousers with a skirt over them but there were others who had no other garments than the ordinary short shirt and the pareo one of the chiefs who appeared in this costume and was afflicted with elephantiasis offered a most repulsive spectacle Note elephantiasis in this country generally shows itself in the feet and extends up as far as the calves of the legs these portions of the body when so affected are greatly swollen and covered with scruff and blotches so that they really might be taken for those of an elephant End of note. this evening i saw queen pomare for the first time she is a woman of thirty-six years of age tall and stout but tolerably well preserved as a general rule i found that the women here fade much less quickly than in other warm climates her face is far from ugly and there is a most good-natured expression round her mouth and the lower portion of her face she was enveloped in a sky-blue satin gown or rather sort of blouse ornamented all round with two rows of rich black blonde she wore large jessamine blossoms in her ears and a wreath of flowers in her hair while in her hand she carried a fine pocket handkerchief beautifully embroidered and ornamented with broad lace in honour of the evening she had forced her feet into shoes and stockings though on other occasions she went barefoot the entire costume was a present from the king of the french 
The queen's husband, who is younger than herself, is the handsomest man in Tahiti. The French jokingly call him the Prince Albert of Tahiti, not only on account of his good looks, but because, like Prince Albert in England, he is not named the king, but simply the queen's consort. He had on the uniform of a French general, which became him very well, the more so that he was not in the least embarrassed in it. The only drawback were his feet, which were very ugly and awkward. Besides these two high personages, there was in the company another crowned head, namely King Otume, the owner of one of the neighboring islands. He presented a most comical appearance, having put on over a pair of full but short white trousers a bright yellow calico coat that most certainly had not been made by a Parisian artiste, for it was a perfect model of what a coat ought not to be. The monarch was barefoot. The queen's ladies of honor, four in number, as well as the most of the wives and daughters of the chiefs, were dressed in white muslin. They had also flowers in their ears and garlands in their hair. Their behavior and deportment were surprising, and three of the young ladies actually danced French quadrilles with the officers, without making a fault in the figures. I was only anxious for their feet, as no one save the royal couple wore either shoes or stockings. Some of the old women had arrayed themselves in European bonnets, while the young ones brought their children, even the youngest, with them, and, to quiet the latter, suckled them without ceremony before the company. Before supper was announced, the queen disappeared in an adjoining room to smoke a cigar or two, while her husband passed the time in playing billiards. At table I was seated between Prince Albert of Tahiti and the canary-colored King Otume. They were both sufficiently advanced in the rules of good breeding to show me the usual civilities, that is, to fill my glass with water or wine, to hand me the various dishes, and so on, but it was evident that they were at great trouble to catch the tone of European society. Some of the guests, however, forgot their parts now and then. The queen, for instance, asked, during the dessert, for a second plate, which she filled with sweetmeats, and ordered to be put on one side for her to take home with her. Others had to be prevented from indulging too much in the generous champagne, and on the whole the entertainment passed off in a becoming and good-humoured manner. I subsequently dined with the royal family several times at the governor's. The queen then appeared in the national costume, with the coloured perillo and chemise, as did also her husband. Both were barefoot. The heir apparent, a boy of nine years old, is affianced to the daughter of a neighbouring king. The bride, who is a few years older than the prince, is being educated at the court of Queen Pomare and instructed in the Christian religion, and the English and Tahitian languages. The arrangements of the queen's residence are exceedingly simple. For the present, until the stone house which is being built for her by the French government is completed, she lives in a wooden one, containing four rooms, and partly furnished with European furniture. As peace was now declared in Tahiti, there was no obstacle in my making a journey through the whole island. I had obtained a fortnight's leave of absence from the captain, and was desirous of devoting this time to a trip. I imagined that I should have been able to join one or other of the officers, who are often obliged to journey through the island on affairs connected with the government. To my great surprise I found, however, that they had all some extraordinary reason why it was impossible for me to accompany them at that particular time. I was at a loss to account for this incivility, until one of the officers themselves told me the answer to the riddle, which was this, every gentleman always travelled with his mistress. Monsieur Blanc, who let me into the secret, offered to take me with him to Papara, where he resided, but even he did not travel alone, as, besides his mistress, Tati, the principal chief of the island, and his family accompanied him. Note. I purposefully abstain from mentioning the names of any of the gentlemen at Tahiti, a piece of reserve which I think entitles me to their thanks. End of note. This chief had come to Papeiti to be present at the fete of the 1st of May. On the 4th of May we put off to sea in a boat, for the purpose of coasting round to Papara, 42 miles distant. I found the chief Tati to be a lively old man, nearly 90 years of age, who remembered perfectly the second landing of the celebrated circumnavigator of the globe, Captain Cook. His father was at that period the principal chief, and had concluded a friendly alliance with Cook and, according to the custom then prevalent at Tahiti, had changed names with him. 
Tati enjoys from the French government a yearly pension of 6,000 francs, 240 pounds, which after his death will fall to his eldest son. He had with him his young wife and five of his sons. The former was 23 years old, and the ages of the latter varied from 12 to 18. The children were all the offspring of other marriages, this being his fifth wife. As we had not left Papeiti till nearly noon, and as the sun set soon after six o'clock, and the passage between the numberless rocks is highly dangerous, we landed at Paya, twenty-two miles, where a sixth son of Tatis ruled as chief. The island is intersected in all directions by noble mountains, the loftiest of which, the Oroena, is 6,200 feet high. In the middle of the island the mountains separate, and a most remarkable mass of rock raises itself from the midst of them. It has the form of a diadem, with a number of points, and it is to this circumstance that it owes its name. Around the mountain range winds a forest girdle, from four to six hundred paces broad. It is inhabited, and contains the most delicious fruit. Nowhere did I ever eat such breadfruit, mangoes, oranges, and guavas as I did here. As for coconuts, the natives are so extravagant with them that they generally merely drink the water they contain, and then throw away the shell and the fruit. In the mountains and ravines there are a great quantity of plantains, a kind of banana, which are not commonly eaten, however, without being roasted. The huts of the natives lie scattered here and there along the shore. It is very seldom that a dozen of these huts are seen together. The breadfruit is somewhat similar in shape to a watermelon, and weighs from four to six pounds. The outside is green and rather rough and thin. The natives scrape it with mussel shells, and then slip the fruit up long ways into two portions, which they roast between two heated stones. The taste is delicious. It is finer than that of potatoes, and so like bread that the latter may be dispensed with without any inconvenience. The South Sea Islands are the real home of the fruit. It is true that it grows in other parts of the tropics, but it is very different from that produced here. In Brazil, for instance, where the people call it monkey's bread, it weighs from five to thirty pounds, and is full inside of kernels, which are taken out and eaten when the fruit is roasted. These kernels taste like chestnuts. The mango is a fruit resembling an apple, and of the size of man's fist. Both the rind and the fruit itself are yellow. It tastes a little like turpentine, but loses this taste more and more the riper it gets. This fruit is of the best description. It is full and juicy, and has a long, broad kernel in the middle. The bread and mango trees grow to a great height and circumference. The leaves of the former are about three feet long, a foot and a half broad, and deeply serrated, while those of the latter are not much larger than the leaves of our own apple trees. End of section 10《11》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》
varied by fungi and pulse of every description like open arabesque work the whole interspersed with pretty groups of rocks of every hue the most lovely shellfish were clinging to these rocks or lying scattered on the ground while endless shoals of variegated fish darted in and out between them like so many butterflies and hummingbirds these delicate creatures were scarcely four inches long and surpassed in richness of color anything i had seen many of them were of the purest sky blue others a light yellow while some again that were almost transparent were brown green etc on our arrival at paya about six in the evening the young tati had a pig weighing around eighteen or twenty pounds killed and cooked after the fashion of tahiti in honor of his father a large fire was kindled in a shallow pit in which were a number of stones a quantity of breadfruit majore that had been first peeled and split into two portions with a very sharp wooden axe was then brought when the fire had gone out and the stones heated to the requisite degree the pig and the fruit were laid upon them a few other heated stones placed on the top and the whole covered up with green branches dry leaves and earth during the time that the victuals were cooking the table was laid a straw mat was placed upon the ground and covered with large leaves for each guest there was a coconut shell half filled with meaty a sourish beverage extracted from the cocoa palm in an hour and a half the victuals were dug up the pig was neither very artistically cooked nor very enticing but cut up as quick as lightning being divided by the hand and knife into as many portions as there were guests and each person had his share together with half a breadfruit handed to him upon a large leaf there was no one at our rustic table besides the officer his mistress the old tati his wife and myself as it is contrary to the custom of the country for the host to eat with his guests or the children with their parents with the exception of this ceremony i did not observe any other proof of love or affection between the father and son the old man for instance although ninety years of age and suffering besides from a violent cough was obliged to pass the night under nothing but a light roof open to the weather while his son slept in his well-closed huts on the fifth of may we left taipari with empty stomachs as old tati was desirous of entertaining us at one of his estates about two hours journey distant on our arrival and as soon as the stones were heated for our meal several of the natives out of the neighboring huts hastened to profit by the opportunity to cook their provisions as well bringing with them fish pieces of pork breadfruit plantains and so on the fish and meat were enveloped in large leaves for our use besides breadfruit and fish there was a turtle weighing perhaps more than twenty pounds the repast was held in a hut to which the whole neighborhood also came and forming themselves into groups a little on one side of us principal guests eat the provisions they had brought with them each person had a coconut shell full of meaty before them into this he first threw every morsel and took it out again with his hand and then what remained of the meaty was drunk at the end of the meal we had each of us a fresh coconut with a hole bored into it containing at least a pint of clear sweet tasting water this is erroneously termed by us milk but it only becomes thick and milky when the coconut is very stale in which condition it is never eaten in these islands tati with his family remained here while we proceeded to papara an hour's walk the road was delightful leading mostly through thick groves of fruit trees but it would not suit a person with a tendency to hydrophobia for we were obliged to wade through more than half a dozen streams and brooks at papara monsieur blanc possessed some landed property with a little wooden four-roomed house in which he was kind enough to give me a lodging we here heard of the death of one of the tati's sons of which he numbered twenty-one he had been dead three days and his friends were awaiting tati to pay the last honors to the deceased i had intended to make an excursion to the late wahiria but deferred doing so in order to be present at the burial on the following morning the sixth of may i paid a visit to the hut of the deceased m blanc gave me a new handkerchief to take with me as a present a relic of the old superstition which the people of this island have introduced into christianity these presents are supposed to calm the soul of the deceased 
the corpse was lying in a narrow coffin upon a low bier both of which were covered with a white pole before the bier were hung two straw mats on which were spread the deceased's clothes drinking vessels knives and so forth while on the other lay the presents making quite a heap of shirts parillos pieces of cloth etc all so new and good that they might have served to furnish a small shop old tati soon entered the hut but quickly returned into the open air stopping only a few instants as the corpse was already most offensive he sat down under a tree and began talking very quietly and unconcernedly with the neighbors as if nothing had happened the female relatives and neighbors remained in the hut they too chatted and gossiped very contentedly and moreover ate and smoked i was obliged to have the wife children and relations of the deceased pointed out to me for i was unable to recognize them by their demeanor in a little time the stepmother and wife rose and throwing themselves on the coffin howled for half an hour but it was easy to see that their grief did not come from the heart their moaning was always pitched in the same monotonous key both then returned with smiling faces and dry eyes to their seats and appeared to resume the conversation at the point at which they had broken it off the deceased's canoe was burnt upon the shore i had seen enough and returned to my quarters to make some preparations for my trip to the lake the next day the distance is reckoned to be eighteen miles so that the journey there and back may be performed in two days with ease and yet a guide had the conscience to ask ten dollars two pounds for his services with the assistance of old tatty however i procured one for three dollars twelve shillings pedestrian trips are very fatiguing on tahiti since it is so richly watered that the excursionist is constantly obliged to wade through plains of sand and rivers i was very suitably clothed for the purpose having got strong men's clothes without any stockings trousers and a blouse which i had fastened up as high as my hips thus equipped i began on the seventh of may my short journey in company with my guide in the first third of my road which lay along the coast i counted about thirty-two brooks which we were obliged to walk through we then struck off through ravines into the interior of the islands first calling however at a hut to obtain some refreshment the inmates were very friendly and gave us some bread fruit and fish but very willingly accepted a small present in exchange in the interior the fine fruit trees disappear and their place is supplied by plantains taros and a kind of bush growing to the height of twelve feet and called oputu maranta the last in fact grew so luxuriantly that we frequently experienced the greatest difficulty in making our way through the taro which is planted is from two to three feet high and has fine large leaves and tubercles similar to the potato but which do not taste very good when roasted the plantain or banana is a pretty little tree from fifteen to twenty feet high with leaves like those of the palm and a stem which is often eight inches in diameter but is not of wood but cane and very easily broken it belongs properly to the herbiferous species and grows with uncommon rapidity it reaches its full growth the first year in the second it bears fruit and then dies it is produced from shoots which generally spring up near the parent tree through one mountain stream which chafed along the ravine over a stony bed and in some places was exceedingly rapid and in consequence of the rain that had lately fallen was frequently more than three feet deep we had to wade sixty-two times my guide caught hold of me by the hand whenever we passed a dangerous spot and dragged me often half swimming after him the water constantly reached above my hips and all idea of getting dry again was totally out of question the path also became at every step more fatiguing and dangerous i had to clamber over rocks and stones covered to such an extent with the foliage of the oputu that i never knew with any degree of certainty where i was placing my foot i received several severe wounds on my hands and feet and frequently fell down on the ground when i trusted for support to the treacherous stem of a banana which would break beneath my grasp it was really a breakneck sort of excursion which is very rarely made even by the officers and certainly never by ladies in two places the ravine became so narrow that the bed of the stream occupied its whole extent it was here that the islanders during the war with the french built stone walls five feet in height 
to protect them against the enemy, in case they should have attacked them from this side. In eight hours' time we had completed the eighteen miles, and attended an elevation of eighteen hundred feet. The lake itself was not visible until we stood upon its shores, as it lies in a slight hollow. It is about eight hundred feet across. The surrounding scenery is the most remarkable. The lake is so closely hemmed in by a ring of lofty and precipitous green mountains that there is no room even for a footing between the water and the rocks, and its bed might be taken for an extinguished volcano filled with water, a supposition which gained additional force from the masses of basalt which occupied the foreground. It is plentifully supplied with fish, one kind of which is said to be peculiar to the locality. It is supposed that the lake has a subterranean outlet which as yet remains undiscovered. To cross the lake it is either necessary to swim over or trust oneself to a dangerous kind of boat which is prepared by the natives in a few minutes. Being desirous of making the attempt, I intimated this by signs to my guide. In an instant he tore off some plantain branches, fastened them together with long tough grass, laid a few leaves upon them, launched them in the water, and then told me to take possession of this apology for a boat. I must own that I felt rather frightened, although I did not like to say so. I stepped on board, and my guide swam behind and pushed me forward. I made the passage to the opposite side and back without any accident, but I was in truth rather alarmed the whole time. The boat was small and floated under rather than upon the water. There was nothing I could support myself with, and every minute I expected to fall into the lake. I would not advise anyone who cannot swim ever to follow my example. After I had sufficiently admired the lake and the surrounding scenery, we retracted our way for some hundred yards, until we reached a little spot roofed over with leaves. Here my guide quickly made a good fire, after the Indian fashion. He took a small piece of wood, which he cut to a fine point, and then, selecting a second piece, he made it into a narrow furrow, not very deep. In this he rubbed the pointed stick, until the little particles which were detached during the operation began to smoke. These he threw into a quantity of dry leaves and grass, which he had got together for the purpose, and swung the hole several times round in the air, until it burst out into flames. The entire process did not take more than two minutes. For our supper he gathered a few plantains and laid them on the fire. I profited by the opportunity to dry my clothes, by sitting down near the fire, and turning first one side towards it and then the other. Half wet through, and tolerably fatigued, I retired to my couch of dry leaves immediately after partaking of our scanty meal. It is a fortunate circumstance that in these wild and remote districts neither men nor beasts afford the slightest grounds for apprehension the former are very quiet and peaceably inclined and with the exception of a few wild boars the latter are not dangerous the island is especially favoured it contains no poisonous hurtful insects or reptiles it is true there are a few scorpions but so small and harmless that they may be handled with impunity the mosquitoes alone were the source of very considerable annoyance as they are in all southern countries the eighth of may it began to rain very violently during the night, and in the morning I was sorry to see that there was not much hope of its clearing up. On the contrary, the clouds became blacker and blacker, and collecting from all sides, like so many evil spirits, poured down in torrents upon the innocent earth. Nevertheless, in spite of this, there was no other course open to us but to bid defiance to the angry water deity, and proceed upon our journey. In half an hour I was literally drenched, this being the case, I went on uncomplainingly, as it was impossible for me to become wetter than I was. On my return to Papara, I found that Tati's son was not buried, but the ceremony took place the next day. The clergyman pronounced a short discourse at the side of the grave, and as the coffin was being lowered, the mats, straw hat, and clothes of the deceased, as well as a few of the presents, were thrown in with it. The relations were present, but as unconcerned as I was myself. The graveyard was in the immediate vicinity of several murays. The latter are small four-cornered plots of ground, surrounded by stone walls three or four feet high, where the natives used to deposit their dead, which were left exposed upon wooden frames until the flesh fell from the bones. These were then collected and buried in some lonely spot. 
the same evening i witnessed a remarkable mode of catching fish two boys waded out into the sea one with a stick and the other with a quantity of burning chips the one with the stick drove the fish between the rocks and then hid them the other lightening him in the meanwhile they were not very fortunate however the more common and successful manner of fishing is with nets almost every day m blanc had visits from officers who were passing accompanied by their mistresses the reader may easily imagine that the laws of propriety were not however always strictly observed and as i had no desire to disturb the gentlemen in their intellectual conversation and amusement i retired with my book into the servants room they too would laugh and joke but at least in such a manner that there was no occasion to blush for them it was highly amusing to hear m blanc launch out in praise of the attachment and gratitude of his indian beauty he would have altered his tone had he seen her behaviour in his absence on one occasion i could not help telling one of the gentlemen my opinion of the matter and expressing my astonishment that they could treat these grasping and avaricious creatures with such attention and kindness to load them with presents anticipate their every wish and forgive and put up with their most glaring faults the answer i received was that these ladies if not so treated and loaded with presents would quickly run off and that in fact even by the kindest attention they never allowed themselves to be influenced very long from all i saw i must repeat my former assertion that the tahitian people are endowed with none of the more noble sentiments of humanity but that their only pleasures are merely animal nature herself encourages them to this in an extraordinary manner they have no need to gain their bread by the sweat of their brow the island is most plentifully supplied with beautiful fruit tubercles of all descriptions and tame pigs so that the people have really only to gather the fruit and kill the pigs to this circumstance is to be attributed the difficulty that exists of obtaining any one as a servant or in any other capacity the most wretched journeyman will not work for less than a dollar a day the price for washing a dozen handkerchiefs or any other articles is also a dollar four shillings not including soap a native whom i desired to engage as guide demanded a dollar and a half a day i returned from papara to papeiti in the company of an officer and his native beauty we walked the thirty-six miles in one day on our way we passed the hut of the girl's mother where we partook of a most splendid dish it was composed of breadfruit mangoes and bananas kneaded together into a paste and cooked upon hot stones it was eaten while warm with a sauce of orange juice on taking leave the officer gave the girl a present of a dollar to give her mother the girl took it as indifferently as if it were not of the slightest value and her mother did exactly the same neither of them pronouncing one word of thanks or manifesting the least sign of satisfaction we now and then came upon some portions of the road the word of public offenders that were most excellently constructed whenever an indian is convicted of a crime he is not chained in a gang like convicts in europe but condemned to make or mend a certain extent of road and the natives fulfil the tasks thus imposed with such punctuality that no overseer is ever necessary this kind of punishment was introduced under king pomare and originated with the natives themselves the europeans have merely continued the practice at punavia we entered the fort where we refreshed ourselves in military fashion with bread wine and bacon and reached our journey's end at seven o'clock in the morning besides papara i visited also venus point a small tongue of land where cook observed the transit of venus the stone on which he placed his instruments still remains on my way i passed the grave or murai of king pomare the first it consisted of a small piece of ground surrounded by a stone wall and covered with a roof of palm leaves some half decayed pieces of cloth and portions of wearing apparel were still lying in it one of my most interesting excursions however was that to fantawa and the diadem the former is a spot which the indians considered impregnable but where nevertheless they were well beaten by the french during the last war m brouat the governor was kind enough to lend me his horses and to allow me the escort of a non-commissioned officer who could point out to me each position of the indians and french as he had himself been in the engagement for more than two hours we proceeded through horrible ravines thick woods and rapid mountain torrents the ravines often became so narrow as to form so many defiles 
with such precipitous and inaccessible sides that here as at thermopyle a handful of valiant warriors might defy whole armies as a natural consequence the entrance of fantawa is regarded as the real key to the whole island there was no other means of taking it than by scaling one of its most precipitous sides and pressing forward upon the narrow ledge of rock above so as to take the enemy in the rear the governor m brois announced that he would confide this dangerous enterprise to volunteers and he soon had more than he could employ from those chosen a second selection of only sixty-two men was made these divested themselves of every article of clothing save their shoes and drawers and took no other arms save their muskets after clambering up for twelve hours and incurring great danger they succeeded by the aid of ropes and by sticking pointed iron rods and bayonets into the rock in reaching the crest of the mountain where their appearance so astonished the indians that they lost all courage threw down their arms and surrendered they said that those who were capable of deeds like this could not be men but spirits against whom all hopes of resistance were out of the question altogether at present there is a small fort built at fantawa and on one of its highest points stands a guard-house the path leading to it is over a small ledge of rock skirted on each side by a yawning abyss persons affected with giddiness can only reach it with great difficulty if indeed they can do so at all in this last case they are great losers for the prospect is magnificent in the extreme extending over valleys ravines and mountains without number among the latter may be mentioned the colossal rock called the diadem thick forests of palms and other trees and beyond all these the mighty ocean broken into a thousand waves against the rocks and reefs and in the distance mingling with the azure sky near the fort a waterfall precipitates itself perpendicularly down a narrow ravine unfortunately the bottom of it is concealed by jutting rocks and promontories and the volume of water is rather small otherwise this fall would on account of its height which is certainly more than four hundred feet deserve to be classed among the most celebrated ones with which i am acquainted the road from the fort to the diadem is extremely fatiguing and fully three hours are required to accomplish the journey the prospect here is even more magnificent than that from the fort as the eye beholds the sea over two sides of the island at the same time this excursion was my last in this beautiful isle as i was obliged to embark on the next day the seventeenth of may the cargo was cleared and the ballast taken on board all articles to which the french troops are accustomed such as flour salted meat potatoes pulse wine and a variety of others have to be imported Note, up to the present period tahiti has produced nothing for exportation and therefore all vessels have to clear out in ballast the island is important to the french as a port where their ships in the pacific may stop and refit End of note. I felt extremely reluctant to leave, and the only thing that tended at all to cheer my spirits was the thought of my speedy arrival in China, that most wonderful of all known countries. We left the port of Papeiti on the morning on the 17th of May, with a most favorable wind, soon passed in safety all the dangerous coral reefs which surround the islands, and in seven hours' time had lost sight of it altogether. Towards evening we beheld the mountain ranges of the island of Huaheme, which we passed during the night the commencement of our voyage was remarkably pleasant besides the favorable breeze which still continued we enjoyed the company of a fine belgian brig the rubens which had put to sea at the same time as ourselves it was seldom that we approached near enough for the persons on board to converse with each other but whoever is at all acquainted with the endless uniformity of long voyages will easily understand our satisfaction at knowing we were even in the neighborhood of human beings we pursued the same track as far as the philippine islands but on the morning of the third day our companion had disappeared leaving us in ignorance whether she had outsailed us or we her we were once more alone on the endless waste of water on the twenty third of may we approached very near to the low island of penchin a dozen or two of the natives were desirous of honouring us with a visit and pulled stoutly in six canoes towards our ship but we sailed so fast that they were soon left a long way behind 
several of the sailors affirmed that these were specimens of real savages and that we might reckon ourselves fortunate in having escaped their visit the captain too appeared to share this opinion and i was the only person who regretted not having formed a more intimate acquaintance with them twenty eighth of may for some days we had been fortunate enough to be visited from time to time with violent showers a most remarkable thing for this time of year in this climate where the rainy season commences in january and lasts for three months the sky for the remaining nine being generally cloudless this present exception was the more welcome from our being just on the line where we should otherwise have suffered much from the heat the thermometer stood at only eighty one degrees in the shade and ninety seven degrees in the sun Today at noon we crossed the line and were once more in the northern hemisphere a tahitian sucking pig was killed and consumed in honor of our successful passage and our native hemisphere toasted in real hock on the fourth of june under eight degrees north latitude we beheld again for the first time the lovely polar star on the seventeenth of june we passed so near to saipan one of the largest of the ladron islands that we could make out the mountains very distinctly the ladron and marianne islands are situated between the thirteen degrees and twenty one degrees north latitude and the one hundred and forty five degrees and one hundred and forty six degrees east longitude on the first of july we again saw land this time it was the coast of lukovia or luzon the largest of the philippines and lying between the eighteen degrees and nineteen degrees north latitude and the one hundred and twenty five degrees and one hundred and nineteen degrees east longitude the port of manila is situated on the southern coast of the island in the course of the day we passed the island of babuan and several detached rocks rising colossus like from the sea four of them were pretty close together and formed a picturesque group some time afterwards we saw two more in the night of the first to the second of july we reached the western point of luzon and entered on the dangerous chinese sea i was heartily glad at last to bid adieu to the pacific ocean for a voyage on it is one of the most monotonous things that could be imagined the appearance of another ship is a rare occurrence and the water is so calm that it resembles a stream very frequently i used to start up from my desk thinking that i was in some diminutive room ashore and my mistake was the more natural as we had three horses a dog several pigs hens geese and a canary bird on board all respectively neighing barking grunting cackling and singing as if they were in a farmyard the sixth july for the first few days after entering the chinese sea we sailed pretty well in the same fashion we had done in the pacific proceeding slowly and quietly on our way Today we beheld the coast of China for the first time, and towards evening we were not more than thirty-three miles from Macau. I was rather impatient for the following morning. I longed to find my darling hope realized of putting my foot upon Chinese ground. I pictured the mandarins with their high caps and the ladies with their tiny feet, when in the middle of the night the wind shifted, and on the 7th of July we had been carried back one hundred and fifteen miles in addition to this the glass fell so low that we dreaded a typhoon which is a very dangerous kind of storm or rather hurricane that is very frequent in the chinese sea during the month of july august and september it is generally first announced by a black cloud on the horizon with one edge dark red and the other half white and this is accompanied by the most awful torrents of rain by thunder lightning and the violent winds which arise simultaneously on all sides and lash the waters up mountains high we took every precaution in anticipation of our dangerous enemy but for once they were not needed either the hurricane did not break out at all or else it broke out at a greater distance from us for we were only visited by a trifling storm of no long duration on the eighth of july we again reached the vicinity of macao and entered the straits of lema our course now lay between bays and reefs diversified by groups of the most beautiful islands offering the series of most magnificent and varied views on the ninth of july we anchored in macao roads the town which belongs to the portuguese and has a population of twenty thousand inhabitants is beautifully situated on the seaside and surrounded by pleasing hills and mountains the most remarkable objects are the palace of the portuguese governor the catholic monastery of guia 
the fortifications, and a few fine houses, which lie scattered about the hills in picturesque disorder. Besides a few European ships, there were anchored in the roads several large Japanese junks, while a great number of small boats, manned by Chinese, were rocking to and fro around us. End of section 11「Section 12 of A Woman's Journey Round the World」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Woman's Journey Round the World by Ida Laura Pfeiffer Chapter 8 China Part 1 Macau, Hong Kong, Victoria Voyage on board a Chinese junk the Si Kiang, called also the Tigris, Huampoa, Canton, or Quang Chu Fu, mode of life pursued by Europeans, the Chinese manners and customs, criminals and pirates, murder of Vo Chi, promenades and excursions. A year before my arrival in China, it would have seemed hardly credible to me that I should ever succeed in taking my place among the small number of Europeans who are acquainted with that remarkable country, not from books alone, but from actual observation. I never believed that I should really behold the Chinese, with their shaven heads, long tails, and small ugly narrow eyes, the exact counterparts of the representations of them which we have in Europe. We had hardly anchored before a number of Chinese clambered up on deck, while others remained in their boats, offering for sale a variety of beautifully made articles, with fruit and cakes, laid out in great order, so as to form in a few seconds a regular market round the vessel. Some of them began praising their wares in broken English, but on the whole they did not drive a very flourishing business, as the crew merely bought a few cigars and a little fruit. Captain Juriancy hired a boat, and we immediately went on shore, where each person on landing had to pay half a Spanish dollar two shillings to the mandarin i subsequently heard that this imposition was shortly afterwards abolished we proceeded to the house of one of the portuguese merchants established there passing through a large portion of the town on our way thither europeans both men and women can circulate freely without being exposed to a shower of stones as is frequently the case in other chinese towns the streets which are exclusively inhabited by chinese presented a very bustling aspect. The men were in many cases seated out of doors in groups, playing at dominoes, while locksmiths, carpenters, shoemakers, and many others were either working, talking, playing, or dining in the numerous booths. I observed but few women, and these were of the lower classes. Nothing surprised and amused me more than the manner in which the Chinese eat. They have two little sticks, with which they very skilfully convey their victuals into their mouths. This process, however, cannot be so successfully practiced with rice, because it does not hold together. They therefore hold the plate containing it close to their mouths, and push it in by the aid of their sticks, generally letting a portion of it fall back again, in no very cleanly fashion, into the plate. For liquids, they use round spoons of porcelain. The style in which the houses are built did not strike me as very remarkable. The front generally looks out upon the courtyard or garden. Among other objects which I visited was the grotto, in which the celebrated Portuguese poet, Camoens, is said to have composed the Luciade. He had been banished, A.D. 1556, to Macau, on account of a satirical poem he had written, Disparates no India, and remained in banishment several years before receiving a pardon. The grotto is charmingly situated upon an eminence, not far from the town. As there was no business to be done, the captain resolved to put to sea again the next morning, and offered in the most friendly manner to take me as his guest to Hong Kong, as I had only agreed for a passage as far as Macau. I accepted his invitation with the greatest pleasure, as I had not a single letter to any one in Macau, besides which it is very seldom that there is an opportunity of proceeding to Hong Kong. On account of the shallowness of the water, our ship was hove to at rather a long distance from the shore, 
where it was exposed to an attack from the pirates, who are here very daring and numerous. In consequence of this, every precaution was taken, and the watch doubled for the night. As late as the year 1842, these pirates attacked a brig that was lying at anchor in the Macau roads, murdering the crew and plundering the vessel. The captain had remained on shore, and the sailors had carelessly given themselves up to sleep, leaving only one man to keep watch. In the middle of the night, a champagne, which is the name given to a vessel smaller than a junk, came alongside the brig. One of the rowers then came on board, pretending he had a letter from the captain, and as the sailor went near the lantern to read the letter, he received from the pirate a blow upon his head, which laid him senseless on the deck. The rest of those in the boat, who had hitherto remained concealed, now scaled the side of the brig, and quickly overpowered the slumbering crew. In our case, however, the night passed without any incident worth noting, and on the morning of the 10th of July, having first taken on board a pilot, we proceeded to Hong Kong, a distance of sixty nautical miles. The voyage proved highly interesting, on account of the varied succession of bays, creeks, and groups of islands which we had to pass. The English obtained Hong Kong from the Chinese, at the conclusion of the war in 1842, and founded the port of Victoria, which contains at present a large number of palace-like houses built of stone. The Europeans who have settled here, and who are not more than two or three hundred in number, are far from being contented, however, as trade is not half as good as they at first expected it would be. Every merchant is presented by the English government with a plot of ground, on condition of his building on it. Many of them erected, as I before mentioned, splendid edifices, which they would now be glad to sell for half the cost price, or, even very frequently, to give the ground and foundations without asking the smallest sum in return. I resolved to stop only a few days in Victoria, as it was my wish to arrive at Canton as soon as possible. In addition to the greatest politeness he had previously shown me, Captain Juriancy conferred another favour by allowing me, during my stay here, to live and lodge on board his ship, thereby saving me an expense of sixteen shillings or twenty-four shillings a day. And besides this, the boat, which he had hired for his own use, was always at my disposal. Footnote. The expense of living at an hotel in Macau, Victoria, and Canton is from four to six dollars a day, sixteen to twenty-four shillings. End of footnote. I must also take this opportunity of mentioning that I never drank, on board any other vessel, such clear and excellent water, a proof that it is not only so easily spoiled by the heat of the tropics, or a protracted period, as is generally imagined. It all depends on care and cleanliness, for which the Dutch are especially celebrated. And I only wish that every captain would, in this respect at least, imitate their example. It is rather too bad for passengers to be obliged to quench their thirst with thick and most offensive water, a disagreeable necessity I was subjected to on board every other sailing vessel in which I made a voyage of any length. Victoria is not very pleasantly situated, being surrounded by barren rocks. The town itself has a European stamp upon it, so that were it not for the Chinese porters, laborers, and peddlers, a person would hardly believe he was in China. I was much struck at seeing no native women in the streets, from which it might be concluded that it was dangerous for a European female to walk about as freely as I did. But I never experienced the least insult, or heard the slightest word of abuse from the Chinese, even their curiosity was here by no means annoying. In Victoria, I had the pleasure of becoming acquainted with the well-known Herr Gutzloff and four other German missionaries. Footnote. Karl Gutzloff was born on the 8th of July, 1803, at Pyritz in Pomerania. As a boy, he was distinguished for his piety and extraordinary talent. His parents apprenticed him to a leather seller. In this capacity, he was noted for his industry, although he was far from contented with his position, and in the year 1821 he found an opportunity of presenting a poem in which he expressed his sentiments and wishes to the king of Prussia. The king recognized the talent of the struggling youth, and opened to him a career in accordance with his inclination. In the year 1827 he proceeded as a missionary to Batavia, and, at a later period, to Bintang, 
where he applied himself with such assiduity to the study of Chinese, that in the space of two years he knew it well enough to preach in it. In December 1831 he went to Macau, where he established a school for Chinese children, and commenced his translation of the Bible into Chinese. He founded, in conjunction with Morrison, a society for the diffusion of useful knowledge in China, and edited a monthly Chinese magazine, in which he endeavored to interest the people upon history, geography, and literature. In 1832 and 1833, he penetrated as far as the province of Fo Kien. Gustav's travels made us acquainted with several very important facts, connected with the different Chinese dialects, and are also of great worth to other scientific points of view. They are especially useful in enabling us to form a correct opinion as to the merits of the works that have lately appeared on China, and every one must acknowledge his rare talent, must value his immovable fixedness of purpose, and must admire his zealous perseverance in the cause of science, and his unshaken belief in the principle of his religion. Dr. Gutzloff died in November 1851. End of footnote. They were studying the Chinese language, and wore the Chinese costume, with their heads shaved like the natives, and with large cues hanging down behind. No language is so difficult to read and write as the Chinese. It contains more than 4,000 characters, and is wholly composed of monosyllables. Little brushes dipped in Indian ink are used for writing, the writing itself extending down the paper from right to left. I had not been above a few days in Victoria before I had an opportunity of proceeding to Canton on board a small Chinese junk. A gentleman of the name of Proustan, who is settled as a merchant here, and whom I found excessively kind, endeavoured very earnestly to dissuade me from trusting myself among the Chinese without any protector, and advised me either to take a boat for myself or a place in the steamer. But both these means were too dear for my small finances, since either would have cost twelve dollars, whereas a passage in the junk was only three. I must also add that the appearance and behaviour of the Chinese did not inspire me with the slightest apprehension. I looked to the priming of my pistols, and embarked very tranquilly on the evening of the 12th of July. A heavy fall of rain and the approach of night soon obliged me to seek the interior of the vessel, where I passed my time in observing my Chinese fellow travellers. The company were, it is true, not very select, but behaved with great propriety, so that there was nothing which could prevent my remaining among them. Some were playing at dominoes, while others were extracting most horrible sounds from a sort of mandolin with three strings. All, however, were smoking, chatting, and drinking tea, without sugar, from little saucers. I, too, had this celestial drink offered to me on all sides. Every Chinese, rich or poor, drinks neither pure water nor spirituous liquors, but invariably indulges in weak tea, with no sugar. At a late hour in the evening, I retired to my cabin, the roof of which, not being completely waterproof, let in certain very unwelcome proofs that it was raining outside. The captain no sooner remarked this than he assigned me another place, where I found myself in the company of two Chinese women, busily engaged in smoking out of pipes with bowls no bigger than thimbles, and in consequence they could not take more than four or five puffs without being obliged to fill their pipes afresh. They soon remarked that I had no stool for my head. They offered me one of theirs, and would not be satisfied until I accepted it. It is a Chinese custom to use, instead of pillows, little stools of bamboo or strong pasteboard. They are not stuffed, but are rounded at the top, and are about eight inches high, and from one to three feet long. They are far more comfortable than would at first be imagined. 13th July On hurrying upon deck early in the morning to view the mouth of the Si Kiang, or Tigris, I found that we had already passed it, and were a long way up the river. I saw it, however, subsequently, on my return from Canton to Hong Kong. The Si Kiang, which is one of the principal rivers of China, and which, at a short distance before entering the sea, is eight nautical miles broad, is so contracted by hills and rocks at its mouth that it loses one half of its breadth. The surrounding country is fine, and a few fortifications on the summits of some of the hills give it rather a romantic appearance. Near Human, or Huampoa, the stream divides into several branches, 
that which flows to Canton being called the Pearl Stream. Although Wampoa of itself is an insignificant place, it is worthy of note as being the spot where, from the shallowness of the water, all deeply laden ships are obliged to anchor. Immense plantations of rice, skirted by bananas and other fruit trees, extend along the banks of the Pearl Stream. The trees are sometimes prettily arranged in alleys, but are planted far less for ornament than for use. Rice always requires a great deal of moisture, and the trees are planted in order to impart a greater degree of solidity to the soil, and also to prevent the possibility of its being washed away by the force of the stream. Pretty little country houses, of the genuine Chinese pattern, with their sloping, pointed, indented roofs, and their colored tiles inlaid with different hues, were scattered here and there, under groups of shady trees, while pagodas, called tas, of various styles, and from three to nine stories high, raised their heads on little eminences in the neighborhood of the villages, and attracted attention at a great distance. A number of fortifications, which, however, look more like roofless houses than anything else, protect the stream. For miles below Canton, the villages follow one another in quick succession. They are mostly composed of miserable huts, built for the most part on piles, driven into the river, and before them lie innumerable boats, which also serve as dwellings. The nearer we approached Canton, the busier became the scene on the river, and the greater the number of ships and inhabited boats. I saw some junks of most extraordinary shape, having poops that hung far over the water, and provided with large windows and galleries, and covered in with a roof like a house. These vessels are often of immense size, and of a thousand tons burden. I also saw some Chinese men of war, flat, broad, and long, and mounting twenty or thirty cannons. Footnote. All large vessels have two painted eyes let into the prow. With these, as the Chinese believe, they are better able to find their way. End of footnote. Another object of interest was the mandarin's boats, with their painted sides, doors, and windows, their carved galleries, and pretty little silk flags giving them the appearance of the most charming houses. But what delighted me most was the flower boats, with their upper galleries ornamented with flowers, garlands, and arabesques. A large apartment, and a few cabinets, into which the interior is divided, are reached through doors and windows, which have almost a gothic appearance. Mirrors and silk hangings adorn the walls, while glass chandeliers and colored paper lanterns, between which swing lovely little baskets with fresh flowers, complete the magic scene. These flower boats are always stationary, and are frequented by the Chinese as places of amusement both day and night. Plays are acted here, and ballets, and conjuring performed. Women, with the exception of a certain class, do not frequent these places. Europeans are not exactly prevented from entering them, but are exposed, especially in the present unfavorable state of public opinion, to insult and even injury. In addition to these extraordinary vessels, let the reader picture to himself thousands of small boats, champans, some at anchor, some crossing and passing in all directions, with fishermen casting their nets, and men and children amusing themselves by swimming, and he will have some idea of the scene I witnessed. I often could not avoid turning away with terror at seeing the little children playing and rolling about upon the narrow boats. I expected every instant that one or other of them would certainly fall overboard. Some parents are cautious enough to fasten hollow gourds, or bladders filled with air, on their children's backs, until they are six years old, so as to prevent them sinking so quickly, if they should happen to tumble into the water. All these multifarious occupations, this ceaseless activity, this never-ending bustle, form so peculiar a feature that it is hardly possible for a person who has not been an eyewitness to obtain a correct idea of it. It is only during the last few years that we European women have been allowed to visit or remain in the factories at Canton. I left the vessel without any apprehension, but first I had to consider how I should find my way to the house of a gentleman named Agassiz, for whom I had brought letters of recommendation. I explained to the captain by signs that I had no money with me, and that he must act as my guide to the factory, where I would pay him. He soon understood me, and conducted me to the place, and the Europeans there showed me the particular house I wanted. On seeing me arrive, 
and hearing the manner in which I had travelled, and the way that I had walked from the vessel to his house, Mr. Agassiz was extremely surprised, and would hardly credit it that I had met with no difficulties or injury. From him I learned what risks I, as a woman, had run in traversing the streets of Canton with no escort but a Chinese guide. Such a thing had never occurred before, and Mr. Agassiz assured me that I might esteem myself as exceedingly fortunate in not having been insulted by the people in the grossest manner, or even stoned. Had this been the case, he told me that my guide would have immediately taken to flight and abandoned me to my fate. I had certainly remarked, on my way from the vessel to the factory, that both old and young turned back to look after me, and that they hooted and pointed at me with their fingers. The people ran out of the booths, and gradually formed a crowd at my heels. I had, however, no alternative but to preserve my countenance. I walked, therefore, calmly on, and perhaps it is to the very fact of my manifesting no fear that I escaped unmolested. I had not intended to stop long in Canton, as, since the last war between the English and Chinese, Europeans are obliged to be more careful than ever how they show themselves in public. This hatred is more especially directed against women, as it is declared in one of the Chinese prophecies that a woman will some day or other conquer the celestial empire. On account of this, I entertained but slight hopes of seeing anything here, and thought of proceeding directly to the port of Shanghai, in the north of China, where, as I was informed, it was far easier to obtain access both among the nobility and lower classes. Fortunately, however, I made the acquaintance of a German gentleman, Herr von Karlowitz, who had been settled for some time in Canton. He offered in the kindest manner to act as my mentor, on condition that I should arm myself with patience until the mail from Europe, which was expected in a few days, had come in. Footnote. There is only one mail a month from Europe. End of footnote. At such times, the merchants are so busy and excited that they have no leisure to think of anything but their correspondence. I was therefore obliged to wait, not only until the steamer had arrived, but until it had left again, which it did not do until a week had elapsed. I have to thank Mr. Agassiz that the time did not hang heavily upon my hands. I was most kindly and hospitably entertained, and enjoyed the opportunity of noting the mode of life of those Europeans who have settled in the country. Very few take their families with them to China, and least of all to Canton, where both women and children are closely imprisoned in their houses, which they can only leave in a well-closed litter. Besides this, everything is so dear that living in London is cheap in comparison. Lodgings of six rooms with a kitchen cost about seven hundred or eight hundred dollars a year, one hundred and forty or one hundred and sixty pounds. A man-servant receives from four to eight dollars a month, and female servants nine or ten dollars, as Chinese women will not wait upon a European unless greatly overpaid. In addition to all this, there is a custom prevalent here of having a separate person for each branch of household duty, which renders a large number of servants indispensable. A family of only four persons requires at least eleven or twelve domestics, if not more. In the first place, every member of the family must have an attendant especially for his or her use. Then there is a man-cook, a number of nursery-maids, and several coolies for the more menial duties, such as cleaning the rooms, carrying the wooden water, and so forth. In spite of this number of servants, the attendance is frequently very bad, for, if one or another of them happens to be out, and his services are required, the master must wait until he returns, as no servant could ever be prevailed upon to do another's duty. At the head of the whole household is the comprador, who is a kind of major-domo. To his care are confided all the plate, furniture, linen, and other effects. He engages all the servants, provides for their board, and anything else they may require, and answers for their good conduct, deducting, however, two dollars a month from their wages of each, in return for his services. He makes all the purchases, and settles all the bills, giving in the sum total at the end of the month, without descending into the items. Besides these domestic duties, the comprador is also entrusted with the money belonging to his master's firm. Hundreds of thousands of dollars pass through his hands, and he is responsible for the genuineness of every one. He has persons in his own employment who pay and receive all monies, and who examine and test every separate coin 
with the most marvellous rapidity. They take a whole handful of dollars at a time, and toss them up separately with the finger and thumb. This enables them to determine whether each rings properly, and on the coin falling into their hand again, reversed, they examine the second side with a glance. A few hours are sufficient to pass several thousand dollars in review, and this minute inspection is very necessary, on account of the number of false dollars made by the Chinese. Each piece of money is then stamped, with the peculiar mark of the firm, as a guarantee of its genuineness, so that it at last becomes exceedingly thin and broad, and frequently falls to bits. No loss is, however, occasioned by this, as the amount is always reckoned by weight. Besides dollars, little bars of pure unstamped silver are used as a circulating medium, small portions varying in size being cut off them, according to the sum required. The counting-house is situated on the ground floor, in the comprador's room. The Europeans have nothing to do with the money, and, in fact, never even carry any for their private use. The comprador has no fixed salary, but receives a stated percentage upon all business transactions. His percentage upon the household expenses is not fixed, but is not on that account less certain. On the whole, these compradors are very trustworthy. They pay down a certain sum as caution money to some mandarin, and the latter answers for them. The following is a tolerably correct account of the mode of life pursued by the Europeans settled here. As soon as they are up and have drunk a cup of tea in their bedroom, they take a cold bath. A little after nine o'clock, they breakfast upon fried fish or cutlets, cold roast meat, boiled eggs, tea, and bread and butter. Every one then proceeds to his business until dinner time, which is generally four o'clock. The dinner is composed of turtle soup, curry, roast meat, hashes, and pastry. All the dishes, with the exception of the curry, are prepared after the English fashion, although the cooks are Chinese. For dessert there is cheese with fruit, such as pineapples, long yen, mangoes, and lychee. The Chinese affirm that the latter is the finest fruit in the whole world. It is about the size of a nut, with a brown, verrucous outside. The edible part is white and tender, and the kernel black. Long yen is somewhat smaller, but is also white and tender, although the taste is rather watery. Neither of these fruits struck me as very good. I do not think the pineapples are so sweet, or possessed of that aromatic fragrance which distinguishes those raised in our European greenhouses, although they are much larger. Portuguese wines and English beer are the usual drinks. Ice, broken into small pieces and covered up with a cloth, is offered with each. The ice is rather a costly article, as it has to be brought from North America. In the evening, tea is served up. During mealtimes, a large punka is employed to diffuse an agreeable degree of coolness through the apartment. The punka is a large frame from eight to ten feet long and three feet high, covered with white Indian cloth and fastened to the ceiling. A rope communicates through the wall, like a bell pull, with the next room, or the ground floor, where a servant is stationed to keep it constantly in motion, and thus maintain a pleasant draught. As may be seen from what I have said, the living here is very dear for Europeans. The expense of keeping a house may be reckoned at 30,000 francs, 6,000 dollars, 1,200 pounds, at the lowest, a very considerable sum, when we reflect how little it procures, neither including a carriage nor horses. There is nothing in the way of amusement or places of public recreation. The only pleasure many gentlemen indulge in is keeping a boat, for which they pay 28 shillings a month, or they walk in the evenings in a small garden, which the European inhabitants have laid out at their own cost. This garden faces the factory, surrounded on three sides by a wall, and, on the fourth, washed by the Pearl Stream. The living of the Chinese population, on the contrary, costs very little. Sixty cash, twelve hundred of which make a dollar, four shillings, may be reckoned a very liberal daily allowance for each man. As a natural consequence, wages are extremely low. A boat, for instance, may be hired for half a dollar, two shillings a day, and on this income a whole family of from six to eight persons will often exist. It is true the Chinese are not too particular in their food. They eat dogs, cats, mice, and rats, the intestines of birds, and the blood of every animal, and I was even assured that caterpillars and worms formed part of their diet. 
Their principal dish, however, is rice, which is not only employed by them in the composition of their various dishes, but supplies the place of bread. It is exceedingly cheap. The pickle, which is equivalent to 124 pounds English avoir du poids, costing from one dollar and three quarters to two dollars and a half. The costume of both sexes among the lower orders consists of broad trousers and long upper garments, and is remarkable for its excessive filth. The Chinaman is an enemy of baths and washing. He wears no shirt and does not discard his trousers until they actually fall off his body. The men's upper garments reach a little below the knee, and the women's somewhat lower. They are made of nankeen, or dark blue, brown, or black silk. During the cold season, both men and women wear one summer garment over the other, and keep the whole together with a girdle. During the great heat, however, they allow their garments to flutter unconstrained about their body. All the men have their heads shaved, with the exception of a small patch at the back, the hair on which is carefully cultivated and plaited into a queue. The thicker and longer this queue is, the prouder is its owner. False hair and black ribbon are consequently worked up in it, so that it often reaches down to the ankles. During work it is twisted round the neck, but on the owner's entering the room it is let down again, as it would be against all the laws of etiquette and politeness for a person to make his appearance with his queue twisted up. The women wear all their hair, which they comb entirely back off their forehead, and fasten it in the most artistic plaits to their head. They spend a great deal of time in the process, but when their hair is once dressed, it does not require to be touched for a whole week. Both men and women sometimes go about with no covering at all on their head. Sometimes they wear hats made of thin bamboo, and very frequently three feet in diameter. These keep off both sun and rain, and are exceedingly durable. On their feet they wear sewed stockings and shoes, formed of black silk, or some material like worsted. The soles, which are more than an inch thick, are made up of layers of strong pasteboard or felt pasted together. The poor people go barefooted. The houses of the lower classes are miserable hovels, built of wood or brick. The internal arrangements are very wretched. The whole furniture consists of a worthless table, a few chairs, and two or three bamboo mats, stools for the head, and old counterpanes. Yet, with this poverty, there are always sure to be some pots of flowers. The cheapest mode of living is on board a boat. The husband goes on shore to his work, and leaves the wife to make a trifle by ferrying persons over, or letting out the boat to pleasure parties. One half of the boat belongs to the family themselves, and the other half to the persons to whom they let it. And although there is not much room, the whole boat measuring scarcely twenty-five feet in length, the greatest order and cleanliness is everywhere apparent, as each single plank on board is thoroughly scrubbed and washed every morning. Great ingenuity is displayed in turning every inch of space on board these small craft to advantage, and the dexterity is actually pushed so far as to find room for a tiny domestic altar. During the day, all the cooking and washing is done, and though at the latter process there is no want of little children, the temporary tenant of the boat does not suffer the least annoyance. Nothing offensive meets his eye, and at the most he merely hears at rare intervals the whining voice of some poor little wretch. The youngest child is generally tied on its mother's back while she steers. The elder children, too, have sometimes similar burdens, but jump and climb about without the least consideration for them. It has often grieved me to the heart to see the head of an infant scarcely born thrown from one side to the other with each movement of the child that was carrying it, or the sun darting so fiercely on the poor little creature who was completely exposed to its rays that it could hardly open its eyes. For those who have not been witnesses of the fact, it is almost impossible to form an idea of the indigence and poverty of a Chinese boat family. The Chinese are accused of killing numbers of their newborn or weakly children. They are said to suffocate them immediately after their birth, and throw them into the river, or expose them in the streets, by far the most horrible proceeding of the two, on account of the number of swine and houseless dogs who fall upon and voraciously devour their prey. The most frequent victims are the female infants, as parents esteem themselves fortunate in possessing a large number of male children, the latter being bound to support them in their old age. The eldest son, in fact, should the father die, is obliged to take his place, and provide for his brothers and sisters, who, on their part, are bound to yield implicit obedience, and show him the greatest respect. 
these laws are very strictly observed and anyone infringing them is punished with death the chinese consider it a great honor to be a grandfather and every man who is fortunate enough to be one wears a moustache as the distinctive sign of his good luck these thin gray moustaches are the more conspicuous as the young men not only wear none but as a general rule grow no beard at all end of section twelve Section 13 of A Woman's Journey Around the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Woman's Journey Around the World by Ida Laura Pfeiffer. Chapter 8 China. Part 2. With regard to the social manners and customs of the Chinese, I am only able to mention a few as it is exceedingly difficult, and, in fact, almost impossible, for a foreigner to become acquainted with them. I endeavoured to see as much as I could, and mixed on every possible opportunity among the people, afterwards writing down a true account of what I had seen. On going out one morning, I met more than fifteen prisoners, all with a wooden yoke, kangu, about their necks, being led through the streets, this yoke is composed of two large pieces of wood, fitting into one another, and having from one to three holes in them. Through these holes the head, and one or both hands, are stuck, in proportion to the importance of the offence. A yoke of this description varies in weight from fifty to a hundred pounds, and presses so heavily upon the neck and shoulders of the poor wretch who bears it, that he is unable to convey his victuals to his mouth himself, and is compelled to wait till some compassionate soul feeds him. This punishment lasts from a few days to several months. In the latter case, the prisoner generally dies. Another description of punishment is the bastinado with the bamboo, which, when applied to the more tender parts of the body, very often, as early as the fifteenth blow, frees its victim forever from all his earthly sufferings. Other more severe punishments, which in no way yield the palm to those of the Holy Inquisition, consist in flaying the prisoner alive, crushing his limbs, cutting the sinews out of his feet, and so on. Their modes of carrying out the sentence of death appear to be mild in comparison, and are generally confined to strangling and decapitation, although, as I was informed, in certain extraordinary cases, the prisoner is executed by being sawed in two, or left to die of starvation. In the first case, the unhappy victim is made fast, between two planks, and sawed in two longitudinally, beginning with the head, and, in the second, he is either buried up to his head in the ground, and thus left to perish of want, or else is fastened in one of the wooden yokes I have described, while his food is gradually reduced in quantity every day, until at last it consists of only a few grains of rice. In spite of the horrible and cruel nature of these punishments, it is said that individuals are found ready, for a sum of money, to undergo them all, death even included, instead of the person condemned. In the year 1846, four thousand people were beheaded at Canton. It is true that they were the criminals of two provinces, which together numbered a population of nine million souls, but the number is still horrible to contemplate. Is it possible that there could really be so many who should be looked upon as criminals, or are persons sentenced to death for a mere nothing? Or are both of these suppositions true? I once happened to go near the place of execution, and, to my horror, beheld a long row of still bleeding heads exposed upon high poles. The relations enjoy the privilege of carrying away and interring the bodies. There are several different religions in China, the most prevalent being Buddhism. It is marked by great superstition and idolatry, and is mostly confined to the lower classes. The most natural is that of the wise Confucius, which is said to be the religion of the court, the public functionaries, the scholars, and educated classes. The population of China is composed of a great many very different races. Unfortunately, I am unable to describe their several characteristics, as my stay in China was far too short. The people I saw in Canton, Hong Kong, and Macau are of middling stature. 
their complexion varies with their occupation. The peasants and laborers are rather sunburnt, rich people and ladies white. Their faces are flat, broad, and ugly. Their eyes are narrow, rather obliquely placed, and far apart. Their nose is broad, and their mouth large. Their fingers, I observed, were in many cases extremely long and thin. Only the rich, of both sexes, allow their nails to grow to an extraordinary length, as a proof that they are not obliged, like their poorer brethren, to gain their livelihood by manual labor. These aristocratic nails are generally half an inch long, though I saw one man whose nails were quite an inch in length, but only on his left hand. With this hand it was quite impossible for him to raise any flat object, except by laying his hand flat upon it, and catching hold of it between his fingers. The women of the higher classes are generally inclined to corpulency, a quality which is highly esteemed, not in women alone, but in men as well. Although I had heard a great deal about the small feet of Chinese women, I was greatly astonished at their appearance. Through the kind assistance of a missionary's lady, Mrs. Bolt, I was enabled to behold one of these small feet in natura. Four of the toes were bent under the sole of the foot, to which they were firmly pressed, and with which they appeared to be grown together. The great toe was alone left in its normal state. The fore part of the foot had been so compressed with strong, broad bandages, that instead of expanding in length and breadth, it had shot upwards, and formed a large lump at the instep, where it made part and parcel of the leg. The lower portion of the foot was scarcely four inches long, and an inch and a half broad. The feet are always swathed in white linen or silk, bound round with silk bandages, and stuffed into pretty little shoes, with very high heels. To my astonishment, these deformed beings tripped about, as if in defiance of us broad-footed creatures, with tolerable ease, the only difference in their gait being that they waddled like geese. They even ran up and down stairs without the aid of a stick. The only persons exempted from this Chinese method of improving their beauty are girls of the lowest class, that is, those who live in boats. In families of rank, they are all subject to the same fate, while in those of the middle class, as a general rule, it is limited to the eldest daughter. The worth of a bride is reckoned by the smallness of her feet. This process of mutilation is not commenced immediately, the child is born, but is deferred until the end of the first, or sometimes even third year, nor is the foot after the operation forced into an iron shoe, as many have affirmed, but merely firmly compressed with bandages. The religion of the Chinese allows them to have a number of wives, but in this respect they are far behind the Mohammedans. The richest have rarely more than from six to twelve, while poor persons content themselves with one. I visited during my stay in Canton as many workshops of the different artists as I could. My first visit was to the most celebrated painters, and I must frankly own that the vividness and splendor of their coloring struck me exceedingly. These qualities are generally ascribed to the rice paper on which they paint, and which is of the greatest possible fineness, and as white as milk. The paintings upon linen and ivory differ very little, as far as the coloring is concerned, from those of our European artists, and the difference is therefore the more visible in their composition and perspective, which, with the Chinese, are yet in a state of infancy. This is more especially true of perspective. The figures and objects in the background rival in size and brilliancy those in front, while rivers or seas float in the place which should be occupied by clouds. On the other hand, the native artists can copy admirably, and even take likenesses. Footnote. When they copy a picture, they divide it, like our own artists, into squares. End of footnote. I saw some portraits, so strikingly well drawn and admirably colored, that first-rate European artists need not have been ashamed to own them. The Chinese possess marvelous skill in carving ivory, tortoise shell, and wood. Among the superior black lacquered articles, especially with flat or raised gold ornaments, I observed some, which were worthy of a place in the most valuable collections of objects of vertu. I saw some small work tables worth at least six hundred dollars, a hundred and twenty pounds. The baskets and carpets made from the bamboo are also remarkably beautiful. 
They are, however, far behind in gold or silver work, which is generally heavy and tasteless. But then again, they have attained great celebrity by their porcelain, which is remarkable not only for its size, but for its transparency. It is true that vases and other vessels four feet high are neither light nor transparent, but cups and other small objects can only be compared to glass for fineness and transparency. The colors on them are very vivid, but the drawings very stiff and bad. In the manufacture of silks and crepe shawls, the Chinese are unsurpassable. The latter, especially in beauty, tastefulness, and thickness, are far preferable to those made in England or France. The knowledge of music, on the other hand, is so little developed that our good friends of the Celestial Empire might almost, in this respect, be compared to savages. Not that they have no instruments, but they do not know how to use them. They possess violins, guitars, lutes, all with strings or wires, dulcimers, wind instruments, ordinary and kettle drums, and cymbals, but are neither skilled in composition, melody, nor execution. They scratch, scrape, and thump upon their instruments in such a manner as to produce the finest marrowbone and cleaver kind of music imaginable. During my excursions up and down the Pearl Stream, I had frequent opportunities of hearing artistic performances of this description on board the Mandarin and Flower Boats. In all kinds of deception the Chinese are great adepts, and decidedly more than a match for any Europeans. They have not the slightest sense of humor, and if you detect them, content themselves with saying, You are more clever or cunning than I. I was told that when they have any livestock, such as calves or pigs, for sale, they compel them, as they are disposed of by weight, to swallow stones or large quantities of water. They also know how to blow out and dress stale poultry, so as to make it look quite fresh and plump. But it is not the lower classes alone that indulge in cheating and fraud. These agreeable qualities are shared by the highest functionaries. It is a well-known fact, for instance, that there are nowhere so many pirates as in the China Sea, especially in the vicinity of Canton. Yet, no measures are taken to punish or extirpate them, simply because the mandarins do not think it beneath their dignity to secretly share in the profits. For example, though the opium trade is forbidden, so much of this drug is smuggled in every year that it is said to exceed in value that of all the tea exported in the same period. Footnote. A pickle of raw opium is worth about six hundred dollars, one hundred and twenty pounds. End of footnote. The merchants enter into a private understanding with the officers and mandarins, agreeing to give them a certain sum for every pickle, and it is no rare occurrence for a mandarin to land whole cargoes under the protection of his own flag. In like manner, there is said to be, on one of the islands near Hong Kong, a very extensive manufactory of false money, which is allowed to be carried on without any interruption, as it pays a tribute to the public functionaries and mandarins. A short time ago, a number of pirate vessels that had ventured too near Canton were shot into and sunk, the crews lost and their leader taken. The owners of the vessels petitioned the government to set the prisoners free, and threaten, in case of a refusal, to make extensive disclosures. Everyone was convinced that a sum of money accompanied this threatening letter, for shortly after it was reported that the prisoner had escaped. I myself was witness of a circumstance in Canton which caused me great uneasiness, and was a pretty good proof of the helplessness or apathy of the Chinese government. On the 8th of August, Mr. Agassiz set out with a friend, intending to return the same evening. I was left at home alone with the Chinese servants. Mr. Agassiz did not return at the appointed time. At last, about one o'clock in the morning, I suddenly heard voices in loud conversation, and a violent knocking at the street door. I at first supposed it to be Mr. Agassiz, and felt much surprise at the late hour of his arrival, but I soon perceived that the disturbance was not in our house, but in that on the opposite side of the way. It is easy to fall into an error of this description, as the houses are situated quite close to each other, and windows are left open day and night. I heard voices exclaim, Get up! Dress! And then, It is horrible! Shocking! Good heavens! Where did it happen? I sprang quickly out of bed, and huddled on my gown, 
thinking either that a fire had broken out in some house or other, or that the people had risen in insurrection. Footnote. I had more especial reason to fear this latter circumstance, as the people had given out that on the 12th or 13th of August, at the latest, there would be a revolution, in which all the Europeans would lose their lives. My state of mind may easily be imagined, left as I was, entirely alone with the Chinese servants. End of footnote. Seeing a gentleman at one of the windows, I called and inquired of him what was the matter. He told me hurriedly that intelligence had just arrived, that two of his friends who were proceeding to Hong Kong, Huang Po lay on the road, had been attacked by pirates, and that one was killed and the other wounded. He then immediately retired, so that I was unable to learn the name of the unfortunate victim, and was left all night a prey to the greatest anxiety, lest it should be Mr. Agassiz. Fortunately, this at least was not the case, as Mr. Agassiz returned at five o'clock in the morning. I then learned that this misfortune had happened to Monsieur Vaucher, a Swiss gentleman, who had passed many an evening in our house. On the very day of his departure, I met him at a neighbor's, where we had all been in the highest spirits, singing songs and quartets. At nine o'clock, he went on board the boat, set off at ten, and, a quarter of an hour afterwards, in the midst of thousands of champagnes and other craft, met his tragical end. M. Vaucher had intended to proceed to Hong Kong, and there embark on board a larger vessel for Shanghai. Footnote. One of the ports which were opened to the English in 1842. End of footnote. He took with him Swiss watches to the value of 40,000 francs, 1,600 pounds, and in speaking to a friend, congratulated himself on the cautious manner he had packed them up, without letting his servants know anything about it. This, however, could not have been the case, and, as the pirates have spies among the servants in every house, they were unfortunately but too well acquainted with the circumstance. During my stay in Canton, the house of a European was pulled down by the populace, because it stood upon a piece of ground which, though Europeans were allowed to occupy, they had not hitherto built upon. In this manner, there was hardly a day that we did not hear of acts of violence and mischief, so that we were in a continual state of apprehension, more especially as the report of the near approach of a revolution, in which all the Europeans were to perish, was everywhere bruited about. Many of the merchants had made every preparation for instant flight, and muskets, pistols, and swords were neatly arranged ready for use in most of the counting-houses. Luckily, the time fixed for the revolution passed over, without the populace fulfilling its threats. The Chinese are cowardly in the highest degree. They talk very large when they are certain they have nothing to fear. For instance, they are always ready to stone or even kill a few defenseless individuals, but if they have to face any opposition, they are sure not to commence the attack. I believe that a dozen good European soldiers would put to flight more than a hundred Chinese. I myself never met with a more dastardly, false, and at the same time cruel race in my life. One proof of this is that their greatest pleasure consists in torturing animals. In spite of the unfavorable disposition of the populace, I ventured out a good deal. Herr von Karlowitz was untiring in his kindness to me, and accompanied me everywhere, exposing himself to many dangers on my account, and bearing patiently the insults of the populace, who followed at our heels, and loudly expressed their indignation at the boldness of the European woman in thus appearing in public. Through his assistance, I saw more than any woman ever yet saw in China. Our first excursion was to the celebrated temple of Honan, which is said to be one of the finest in China. This temple is surrounded by numerous outbuildings, and a large garden enclosed with a high wall. You first enter a large forecourt, at the extremity of which a colossal gateway leads into the inner courts. Under the archway of this portico are two war gods, each eighteen feet high, in menacing attitudes and with horribly distorted features. They are placed there to prevent evil spirits from entering. A second similar portico, under which are the four celestial kings, leads into the inmost court, where the principal temple is situated. The interior of the temple is one hundred feet in length, and one hundred feet in breadth. 
the flat roof, from which hang a number of glass chandeliers, lamps, artificial flowers, and silk ribbons, is supported upon several rows of wooden pillars, while the multitude of statues, altars, flower-pots, censers, candelabra, candlesticks, and other ornaments, involuntarily suggest to the mind of the spectator the decoration of a Roman Catholic church. In the foreground are three altars, and behind these three statues, representing the god Buddha in three different aspects, the past, present, and the future. These figures, which are in a sitting posture, are of colossal dimensions. We happened to visit the temple just as service was being performed. It was a kind of mass for the dead, which a mandarin had ordered for his deceased wife. At the right and left altars were the priests, whose garments and gesticulations also resembled those of the Roman Catholics. At the middle altar was the mandarin, piously engaged in prayer, while two stood beside him, fanning him with large fans. Footnote. His costume was composed of a wide overgarment reaching to the knees, and furnished with flowing arms, and underneath this, trousers of white silk. The upper garment was made of brocade of very vivid colors, and an extraordinary pattern. On his breast, he wore two birds, as marks of his rank, and a necklace of precious stones. His shoes, composed of black silk, were turned up into points at the extremities. On his head, he wore a conical velvet hat with a gilt button. End of footnote. He frequently kissed the ground, and every time he did so, three wax tapers were presented to him, which he first elevated in the air, and then gave to one of the priests, who placed them before a statue of Buddha, but without lighting them. The music was performed by three men, one of whom twanged a stringed instrument, while the second struck a metal globe, and the third played the flute. Besides the principal temple, there are various smaller ones, and halls, all adorned with statues of gods. A special honor is paid to the twenty-four gods of pity and to Quan Fu Tsi, a demigod of war. Many of the former have four, six, or even eight arms. All these divinities, Buddha himself not excepted, are made of wood, gilt over, and painted with glazing colors. In the Temple of Mercy, we met with an adventure which was nearly attended with unpleasant consequences. A priest, or bonds, handed us some little tapers, for us to light and offer to his divinity. Herr von Karlowitz and myself had already got the tapers in our hands, and were quite willing to afford him this gratification, when an American missionary who was with us tore the tapers from our grasp and indignantly returned them to the priest, saying that what we were about to do was an act of idolatry. The priest took the matter very seriously, and, instantly closing the doors, called his companions, who hurried in from all sides, and abused us in the most violent and vociferous fashion, pressing closer every instant. It was with the greatest difficulty that we succeeded in fighting our way to the door, and thus making our escape. After this little fray, our guide conducted us to the dwelling of the holy pegs. Footnote. The reader must know that these animals are looked upon as particularly sacred. End of footnote. A beautiful stone hall is set apart for their use, which hall these remarkable divinities fill, in spite of all the care bestowed on them, with so horrible a stench that it is impossible to approach them without holding one's nose. They are taken care of and fed until death summons them away. When we visited the place, there were only a pair of these fortunate beings, and their number rarely exceeds three couples. I was better pleased with the residence of a bonds, which adjoined this holy spot. It consisted of a sitting-room and bedroom merely, but was very comfortably and elegantly fitted up. The walls of the sitting-room were ornamented with carved woodwork, and the furniture was old-fashioned and pleasing. At the back of the apartment, which was flagged, stood a small altar. We here saw an opium-eater, lying stretched out upon a mat, on the floor. At his side was a cup of tea, with some fruit, and a little lamp, besides several pipes, with bowls that were smaller than a thimble. On our entrance, he was just inhaling the intoxicating smoke from one of them. It is said that some of the Chinese opium smokers consume from twenty to thirty grains a day. As he was not altogether unconscious of our presence, he managed to raise himself, laid by his pipe, 
and dragged himself to a chair. His eyes were fixed and staring, and his face deathly pale, presenting altogether a most pitiable and wretched spectacle. Last of all we were conducted to the garden, where the bonzes at their death are burnt, a particular mark of distinction, as all other people are interred. A simple mausoleum about thirty feet square, and a few small private monuments, were all that was to be seen. None of them had any pretensions to elegance, being built of the simplest masonry. In the former of these edifices are preserved the bones of the persons who have been burnt, and among them are also buried the rich Chinese, whose heirs pay pretty handsomely to obtain such an honor for them. At a little distance stands a small tower, eight feet in diameter and eighteen in height, with a small pit where a fire can be kindled in the floor. Over this pit is an armchair, to which the deceased bonds is fastened in full costume. Logs and dry brushwood are disposed all round, and the hole is set fire to, and the doors closed. In an hour they are again opened, the ashes strewed round the tower, and the bones preserved until the period for opening the mausoleum, which is only once every year. A striking feature in the garden is this beautiful water-rose, or lotus-flower, Nymphia nilumbo, which was originally a native of China. The Chinese admire this flower so much that they have ponds dug in their gardens expressly for it. It is about six inches in diameter and generally white, very rarely pale red. The seeds resemble in size and taste those of the hazel, and the roots, when cooked, are said to taste like artichokes. There are more than a hundred bonzes who reside in the temple of Honan. In their ordinary dress, they differ nothing from the common Chinamen, the only means of recognizing them being by their heads, which are entirely shaved. Neither these nor any other priests can boast, as I was told, of being in the least respected by the people. Our second excursion was to the halfway pagoda, so called by the English from its lying halfway between Canton and Huampoa. We went up the Pearl Stream to it. It stands upon a small eminence near a village, in the midst of immense fields of rice, and is composed of nine stories, one hundred and seventy feet high. Its circumference is not very considerable, but nearly all the same all the way up, which gives it the look of a tower. I was informed that this pagoda was formerly one of the most celebrated in China, but it has long ceased to be used. The interior was completely empty. There were neither statues nor any other ornaments, nor were there any floors to prevent the eye from seeing to the very top. On the outside, small balconies without railings surrounded each story, to which access is gained by steep and narrow flights of stairs. These projecting balconies produce a very fine effect, being built of colored bricks, very artistically laid, and faced with variegated tiles. The bricks are placed in rows, with their points jutting obliquely outwards, so that the points project about four inches over one another. At a distance, the work seems as if it were half pierced through, and from the beautiful colors and fineness of the tiles, a person might easily mistake the entire mass for porcelain. While we were viewing the pagoda, the whole population of the village had assembled round us, and as they behaved with tolerable quietness, we determined on paying a visit to the village itself. The houses, or rather huts, were small and built of brick, and with the exception of their flat roofs, presented nothing peculiar. The rooms did not possess a ceiling of their own, but were simply covered by the roof. The floor was formed of earth, closely pressed together, and the internal walls consisted partly of bamboo mats. What little furniture there was, was exceedingly dirty. About the middle of the village was a small temple, with a few lamps burning dimly before the principal divinity. What struck me most was the quantity of poultry, both in and out of the huts, and we had to take the greatest care to avoid treading on some of the young brood. The chickens are hatched, as they are in Egypt, by artificial heat. On our return from the village to the pagoda, we saw two champans run in shore, and a number of swarthy, half-naked, and mostly armed men jump out, and hasten through the fields of rice directly to where we were. We set them down as pirates, and awaited the upshot with a considerable degree of uneasiness. We knew that, if we were right in our supposition, we were lost without hope, for at the distance we were from Canton, and entirely surrounded by Chinese, 
who would have been but too ready to lend them assistance, it would have been doubly easy for pirates to dispatch us. All idea of escape or rescue was out of the question. While these thoughts were flashing across our minds, the men kept approaching us, and at length their leader introduced him as the captain of a Siamese man-of-war. He informed us in broken English that he had not long arrived with the governor of Bangkok, who was proceeding for the rest of the way to Pekin by land. Our fears were gradually dispelled, and we even accepted the friendly invitation of the captain to run alongside his ship and view it on our return. He came in the boat with us and took us on board, where he showed us everything himself. The sight, however, was not a particularly attractive one. The crew looked very rough and wild. They were all dressed in a most slovenly and dirty manner, so that it was utterly impossible to distinguish the officers from the common men. The vessel mounted twelve guns and sixty-eight hands. The captain set before us Portuguese wine and English beer, and the evening was far advanced before we reached home. End of section 13section fourteen of a woman's journey around the world this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a woman's journey round the world by ida laura pfeiffer chapter eight china part three the longest trip that can be made from canton is one twenty miles up the pearl stream and Mr. Agassiz was kind enough to procure me this pleasure. He hired a good boat, which he furnished abundantly with eatables and drinkables, and invited a missionary, who made the trip several times, Herr von Karlowitz and myself. The company of a missionary is as yet by far the safest escort in China. These gentlemen speak the language. They become gradually acquainted with the people, and travel about with hardly any obstacle to speak of all around the vicinity of Canton. About a week before we had decided on going, a few young gentlemen had endeavored to make the same excursion, but had been fired upon from one of the fortresses that lie on the banks of the river, and compelled to turn back halfway. When we approached the fortress in question, the crew of our boat refused to proceed any further, until we had almost employed violence to make them do so. We also were fired into, but fortunately not until we were more than half past the fortress. Having escaped the danger, we pursued our course without further interruption, landed at several hamlets, visited the so-called Heron Pagoda, and took a good view of everything that was to be seen. The scenery all round was charming, and displayed to our view large plains with rice, sugar, and tea plantations, picturesque clumps of trees, lovely hills, and more elevated mountain ranges rising in the distance. On the declivities of the hills, we beheld a number of graves, which were marked by single, upright stones. The Heron Pagoda has three stories, with a pointed roof, and is distinguished for its external sculpture. It has no balconies outside, but instead of this, a triple wreath of leaves round each story. In the first and second story, to which access is gained by more than usually narrow stairs, are some small altars with carved idols. We were not allowed to go into the third story under the excuse that there was nothing to be seen there. The villages we visited resembled more or less that we had seen near the halfway pagoda. During this journey, I was an eyewitness of the manner in which the missionaries dispose of their religious tracts. The missionary, who had been kind enough to accompany us, took this opportunity of distributing among the natives some seeds that should bring forth good fruit. He had five hundred tracts on board our boat, and every time that another boat approached us, a circumstance that was of frequent occurrence, he stretched himself as far as possible over the side with half a dozen tracts in his hand, and made signs to the people to approach and take them. If people did not obey his summons, we rode up to them, and the missionary gratified them with his tracts in dozens, and went his way rejoicing, in anticipation of the good, which he did not doubt they would effect. Whenever we arrived at a village, however, matters reached even a higher pitch. The servant was obliged to carry whole packs of tracts, which in a moment were distributed among the crowd of curious who had quickly gathered round us. 
everyone took what was offered to him, as it cost nothing, and if he could not read it, the tracts were in Chinese. He had at least got so much paper. The missionary returned home delighted. He had disposed of his five hundred copies. What glorious news for the missionary society! And what a brilliant article for his religious paper he no doubt transmitted to Europe. Six young Englishmen made this same expedition up the Pearl Stream six months later, stopping at one of the villages and mixing with the people. Unhappily, however, they all fell victims to the fanaticism of the Chinese. They were most barbarously murdered. There was now no trip of any distance left, but one round the walls of the town of Canton, properly so called. Footnote. The town of Canton is nine miles in circumference. It is the residence of a viceroy, and divided by walls into the Chinese and the Tartar town. The population of the town itself is reckoned at 400,000, while it is calculated that 60,000 persons live in the boats and champans, and about 200,000 in the immediate vicinity. The number of Europeans settled here is about 200. End of footnote. This, too, I was shortly enabled to undertake, through the kindness of our good friend, the missionary, who offered to come as guide to Herr von Karlowitz and myself, under the condition, however, that I should put on male attire. No woman had ever yet ventured to make this trip, and he thought I ought not to venture in my own dress. I complied with his wish, therefore, and one fine morning early we set out. For some distance, our road lay through narrow streets or alleys paved with large flags. In a small niche, somewhere in front of every house, we saw little altars, from one to three feet high, before which, as it was yet early, the night lamps were still burning. An immense quantity of oil is necessarily consumed in keeping up this religious custom. The shops now began to be opened. They resembled neat entrance halls, having no front wall. The goods were exposed for sale, either in large open boxes or on tables, behind which the shopkeepers sit and work. In one corner of the shop, a narrow staircase leads up into the dwelling-house above. Here, as in Turkish towns, the same regulation is observed of each trade or calling, having its especial street, so that in one nothing but crockery and glass, in another silks, and so on, is to be seen. In the physician's street are situated all the apothecary's shops as well, as the two professions are united in one and the same person. The provisions, which are very tastily arranged, have also their separate streets. Between the houses are frequently small temples, not differing the least, however, in style, from the surrounding buildings. The gods, too, merely occupy the ground floor, the upper stories being inhabited by simple mortals. The bustle in the streets was astonishing, especially in those set apart for the sale of provisions. Women and girls of the lower classes went about making their purchases, just as in Europe. They were all unveiled, and some of them waddled like geese, in consequence of their crippled feet, which, as I before observed, extends to all ranks. The crowd was considerably increased by the number of porters, with large baskets of provisions on their shoulders, running along and praising in a loud voice their stock and trade, or warning the people to make way for them. At other times, the whole breadth of the street would be taken up, and the busy stream of human beings completely stopped by the litter of some rich or noble personage proceeding to his place of business. But worse than all were the numerous porters we met at every step we took, carrying large baskets of unsavory matter. It is a well-known fact that there is perhaps no nation on the face of the earth equal to the Chinese in diligence and industry, or that profits by and cultivates as they do every available inch of ground. As, however, they have not much cattle, and consequently but little manure, they endeavor to supply the want of it by other means, and hence their great care of anything that can serve as a substitute. All their small streets are built against the city walls, so that we had been going around them for some time before we were aware of the fact. Mean-looking gates or wickets, which all foreigners are strictly prohibited from passing, and which are shut in the evening, lead into the interior of the town. I was told that it has often happened for sailors or other strangers, during their walks, to penetrate through one of these entrances into the interior of the town, and not discover their mistake until the stones begin flying about their ears. After threading our way for at least two miles through a succession of narrow streets, we at length emerged into the open space, 
where we obtained a full view of the city walls, and from the summit of a small hill which was situated near them, a tolerably extensive one over the town itself. The city walls are about sixty feet high, and for the most part so overgrown with grass, creeping plants, and underwood, that they resemble a magnificent mass of living vegetation. The town resembles a chaos of small houses, with now and then a solitary tree, but we saw neither fine streets nor squares, nor any remarkable buildings, temples, or pagodas. A single pagoda, five stories high, reminded us of the peculiar character of Chinese architecture. Our road now lay over fertile eminences, varied with fields and meadows, in a high state of cultivation. Many of the hills are used as cemeteries, and are dotted over with small mounds of earth, walled in with stone flags or rough-hewn stones two feet high, frequently covered with inscriptions. Family tombs were also to be seen, dug in the hill, and enclosed with stone walls of the shape of a horseshoe. All the entrances were built up with stone. The Chinese do not, however, bury all their dead. They have a remarkable way of preserving them in small stone chambers, consisting of two stone walls and a roof, while the two other sides are left open. In these places there are never more than from two to four coffins, which are placed upon wooden benches two feet high. The coffins themselves consist of massive trunks of trees hollowed out. The villages through which we passed presented an animated appearance, but appeared poor and dirty. We were often obliged to hold our noses in passing through the lanes and squares, and very frequently would fain have closed our eyes as well to avoid the disgusting sight of people covered with eruptions of the skin, tumors, and boils. In all the villages I saw poultry and swine in great numbers, but not more than three horses and a buffalo cow. Both the horses and the cow were of an extremely small breed. When we had nearly reached the end of our excursion, we met a funeral. A horrible kind of music gave us warning that something extraordinary was approaching, and we had hardly time to look up and step on one side before the procession came flying past us at full speed. First came the worthy musicians, followed by a few Chinese, next two empty litters carried by porters, and then the hollow trunk of a tree representing the coffin, hanging to a low pole and carried in a similar manner. Last of all were some priests and a crowd of people. The chief priest wore a kind of fool's cap, with three points. The other persons, who consisted of men alone, had a kind of white cloth, bound round their head or arm. Footnote. The Chinese adopt white for mourning. End of footnote. I was lucky enough to be enabled to visit some of the summer palaces and gardens of the nobility. The finest of all was certainly that belonging to the Mandarin Hao Kua. The house itself was tolerably spacious, one story high, with very wide splendid terraces. The windows looked into the inner courts, and the roof was like those in European buildings, only much flatter. The sloping roofs, with their multitude of points and pinnacles, with their little bells and variegated tiles, are only to be found in the temple and country houses, but never in the usual residences. At the entrance there were two painted gods. These, according to the belief of the Chinese, keep off evil spirits. The front part of the house consisted of several reception rooms, without front walls, and, immediately adjoining them, on the ground floor, elegant parterres, and on the first floor, magnificent terraces, which were also decorated with flowers, and afforded a most splendid view over the animated scene on the river, the enchanting scenery around, and the mass of houses in the villages situated about the walls of Canton. Neat little cabinets surrounded these rooms, from which they were only separated by walls that in many cases were adorned with the most artistic paintings, and through which the eye could easily penetrate. The most remarkable of these walls were those composed of bamboos, which were as delicate as a veil, and plentifully ornamented with painted flowers, or beautifully written proverbs. A numberless quantity of chairs, and a great many sofas were ranged along the walls, from which I inferred that the Chinese are as much accustomed to large assemblages as ourselves. I observed some armchairs most skillfully cut out of a single piece of wood, others with seats of beautiful marble slabs, and others again of fine-colored tiles or porcelain. 
Among various objects of European furniture, we saw some handsome mirrors, clocks, vases, and tables of Florentine mosaic or variegated marble. There was also a most extraordinary collection of lamps and lanterns hanging from the ceilings, and, consisting of glass, transparent horn, and colored gauze or paper, ornamented with glass beads, fringe, and tassels. Nor was there any scarcity of lamps on the walls, so that when the apartments are entirely lighted up, they must present a fairy-like appearance. As we had been fortunate enough to reach this house without being stoned, we were emboldened to visit the Mandarin Haokwa's large pleasure garden, situated on a branch of the Pearl Stream, about three-quarters of a mile from the house. We had, however, hardly entered the branch of the river, before the crew wanted to turn back, having observed a Mandarin's junk, with all its flags hoisted, a signal that the owner himself was on board. They were unwilling to venture on conveying us Europeans past the vessel, for fear they should be punished, or stoned to death along with ourselves by the people. We obliged them to proceed, passed close by the junk, and then landed, and continued our excursion on foot. A large crowd of people soon collected in our rear, and began pushing the children up against us, in order to excite our rage. But arming ourselves with patience, we moved quietly on and reached, without any accident, the garden gates, which we instantly closed behind us. The garden was in a perfect state of cultivation, but without the least pretension to taste in its arrangement. On every side were summer-houses, kiosks, and bridges, and all the paths and open spots were lined with large and small flower-pots, in which were flowers and dwarf fruit-trees of every description. The Chinese are certainly adepts in the art of diminishing the size of, or rather crippling, their trees, many of which very often scarcely attain a height of three feet. These dwarf trees are very prevalent in their gardens, and preferred to the most magnificent and shady trees of a natural size. These Lilliputian alleys can hardly be considered in good taste, but it is most remarkable with what a large quantity of beautiful fruit the tiny branches are laden. Besides these toys, we observe figures of all descriptions, representing ships, birds, fish, pagodas, etc., cut out of foliage. In the heads of the animals were stuck eggs, with a black star painted on them to represent the eyes. There was also no scarcity of rocks, both single and in groups, ornamented with flower-pots, as well as little figures of men and animals, which can be removed at pleasure, so as to form new combinations, a kind of amusement of which the Chinese ladies are said to be very fond. Another sort of entertainment, no less popular as well, among the ladies, as the gentlemen, consists in kite-flying, and they will sit for hours looking at their paper monsters in the air. There is a large open spot set apart for this purpose in the garden of every Chinese nobleman. We noticed an abundance of running water and ponds, but we did not observe any fountains. As everything had passed off so well, Herr von Karlowitz proposed that we should go and see the garden of the Mandarin Puntinqua, which I was very anxious to do so as the Mandarin had ordered a steamboat to be built there by the Chinese, who had resided thirteen years in North America, where he had studied. The vessel was so far advanced that it was to be launched in a few weeks. The artist showed us his work with great satisfaction, and was evidently very much pleased at the praise we bestowed upon him for it. He attached great importance to his knowledge of the English language, for when Herr von Karlowitz addressed him in Chinese, he answered in English, and requested us to continue the conversation in that idiom. The machinery struck us as not being constructed with the usual degree of neatness for which the Chinese are famous, and also appeared far too large for the small vessel for which it was intended. Neither I nor my companion would have had the courage to have gone in her on her experimental trip. The Mandarin, who had the vessel built, had gone to Pekin to obtain a button as his reward for being the first person to launch a steamer in the Chinese Empire. The builder himself will, in all probability, be obliged to rest contented with the consciousness of his talent. From the shipyard we proceeded to the garden, which was very large, but greatly neglected. There were neither alleys nor fruit trees, rocks nor figures, but to make up for these, an insufferable quantity of summer-houses, bridges, galleries, little temples, and pagodas. The dwelling-house consisted of a very large hall, and a number of small chambers. 
the walls were ornamented both inside and out with carved wood and the roof abundantly decorated with points and pinnacles in the large halls plays and other entertainments are sometimes enacted for the amusement of the ladies who are universally confined to their houses and gardens which can only be visited by strangers in their absence footnote noble chinese ladies pass a much more secluded life than eastern women they are allowed to visit one another very seldom and that only in well-closed litters they have neither public baths nor gardens in which they can meet End of footnote. a number of peacocks silver pheasants mandarin ducks and deer are preserved in their gardens in one corner was a small gloomy bamboo plantation in which were some family graves and not far off a small earthen mound had been raised with a wooden table on which was a long poetical inscription in honor of the favorite snake of the mandarin which was buried there after duly inspecting everything we set off on our road home and reached there in safety i was not so fortunate a few days later on visiting a tea factory the proprietor conducted me himself over the workshops which consisted of large halls in which six hundred people including a great many old women and children were at work my entrance occasioned a perfect revolt old and young rose from work the elder portion lifting up the younger members of the community in their arms and pointing at me with their fingers the whole mass then pressed close upon me and raised so horrible a cry that i began to be alarmed the proprietor and his overseer had a difficult task to keep off the crowd and begged me to content myself with a hasty glance at the different objects and then to quit the building as soon as possible as a consequence of this i could only manage to observe that the leaves of the plant are thrown for a few seconds into boiling water and then placed in flat iron pans fixed slantingly in stonework where they are slightly roasted by a gentle heat during which process they are continually stirred by hand as soon as they begin to curl a little they are thrown upon large planks and each single leaf is rolled together this is effected with such rapidity that it requires a person's undivided attention to perceive that no more than one leaf is rolled up at one time after this all the leaves are placed once more in the pan black tea takes some time to roast and the green is frequently colored with prussian blue an exceedingly small quantity of which is added during the second roasting last of all the tea is once more shaken out upon the large boards in order that it may be carefully inspected and the leaves that are not entirely closed are rolled over again before i left the proprietor conducted me into his house and treated me to a cup of tea prepared after the fashion in which it is usually drunk by rich and noble chinese a small quantity was placed in a china cup boiling water poured upon it and the cup then closed with a tightly fitting cover in a few seconds the tea is then drank and the leaves left at the bottom the chinese take neither sugar rum nor milk with their tea they say that anything added to it and even the stirring of it causes it to lose its aroma in my cup however a little sugar was put the tea plant which i saw in the plantations round about canton was at most six feet high it is not allowed to grow any higher and is consequently cut at intervals its leaves are used from the third to the eighth year and the plant is then cut down in order that it may send forth new shoots or else it is rooted out there are three gatherings in the year the first in march the second in april and the third which lasts for three months in may the leaves of the first gathering are so delicate and fine that they might easily be taken for the blossom which has no doubt given rise to the error that the so-called blossom or imperial tea is supposed not to consist of the leaves but of the blossom itself footnote the leaves of this gathering are plucked with the greatest care by children and young people who are provided with gloves and are bound to pick every leaf separately End of footnote. this gathering is so hurtful to the plant that it often perishes i was informed that the tea which comes from the neighborhood of canton is the worst and that from the provinces somewhat more to the north the best the tea manufacturers of canton are said to possess the art of giving tea that has been frequently used or spoiled by rain the appearance of good tea they dry and roast the leaves color them yellow with powdered curcumni or light green with prussian blue and then roll them tightly up 
the price of tea sent to Europe varies from fifteen to sixty dollars, three to twelve pounds, a pickle of one hundred and thirty four pounds English weight. The kind at sixty dollars does not find a very ready market. The greater part of it is exported to England. The bloom is not met with in trade. I must mention a sight which I accidentally saw one evening upon the Pearl Stream. It was, as I afterwards heard, a thanksgiving festival in honor of the gods, by the owners of two junks that had made a somewhat long sea voyage without being pillaged by pirates or overtaken by the dangerous typhoon. Two of the largest flower boats, splendidly illuminated, were floating gently down the stream. Three rows of lamps were hung round the upper part of the vessels, forming perfect galleries of fire. All the cabins were full of chandeliers and lamps, and on the forecastle large fires were burning, out of which rockets darted at intervals, with a loud report, although they only attained the elevation of a few feet. On the foremost vessel there was a large mast erected, and hung with myriads of colored paper lamps up to its very top, forming a beautiful pyramid. Two boats, abundantly furnished with torches, and provided with boisterous music, preceded these two fiery masses. Slowly did they float through the darkness of the night, appearing like the work of fairy hands. Sometimes they stopped, when high flames, fed with wholly perfumed paper, flickered upwards to the sky. Perfumed paper, which must be bought from the priests, is burnt at every opportunity, and very frequently beforehand, after every prayer. From the trade in this paper, the greater proportion of the priest's income is derived. On several occasions, accompanied by Herr von Karlowitz, I took short walks in the streets near the factory. I found the greater pleasure in examining the beautiful articles of Chinese manufacture, which I could here do at my leisure, as the shops were not so open as those I saw during my excursion round the walls of Canton, but had doors and windows, like our own, so that I could walk in and be protected from the pressure of the crowd. The streets also in this quarter were somewhat broader, well paved, and protected with mats or planks to keep off the burning heat of the sun. In the neighborhood of the factory, namely, and Fushan, where most of the manufactories are situated, a great many places may be reached by water, as the streets, like those in Venice, are intersected by canals. This quarter of Canton, however, is not the handsomest, because all the warehouses are erected on the sides of the canals, where the different workmen have also taken up their residence in miserable huts that, built half upon the ground and half upon worm-eaten piles, stretch far out over the water. I had now been altogether from July 13th to August 20th, five weeks, in Canton. The season was the hottest in the whole year, and the heat was really insupportable. In the house, the glass rose as high as 94.5 degrees, and out of doors in the shade as high as 99 degrees. To render this state of things bearable, the inhabitants use, beside the punkas in the rooms, wicker work made of bamboo. This wicker work is placed before the windows and doors, or over those portions of the roofs under which the workshops are situated. Even whole walls are formed of it, standing about eight or ten feet from the real ones, and provided with entrances, window openings, and roofs. The houses are most effectually disguised by it. On my return to Hong Kong, I again set out on board a junk, but not so fearlessly as the first time. The unhappy end of Monsieur Vaucher was still fresh in my memory. I took the precaution of packing up the few clothes and linen I had in the presence of the servants, that they might be convinced that any trouble the pirates might give themselves on my account would be thrown away. On the evening of the 20th of August, I bade Canton and all my friends there farewell, and at nine o'clock I was once again floating down the Si Kiang, or Pearl Stream, famous for the deeds of horror penetrated on it. End of section 14section 15 of a woman's journey round the world this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by ziff a woman's journey round the world by ida laura pfeiffer chapter 9 the east indies singapore part 1 arrival in hong kong the english steamer singapore plantations a hunting party in the jungle, a Chinese funeral, the feast of lanterns, 
temperature, and climate. The passage from Canton to Hong Kong was accomplished without any circumstance worthy of notice, save the time it took, in consequence of the prevalence of contrary winds the whole way. We were, it is true, woke up the first night by the report of guns, but I expect they were not fired at us, as we were not molested. My travelling companions, the Chinese, also behaved themselves on this occasion with the greatest politeness and decorum, and had I been enabled to look into the future, I would willingly have given up the English steamer and pursued my journey as far as Singapore on board a junk. But as this was impossible, I availed myself of the English steamer, Pekin, of 450 horsepower, Captain Fronson Commander, which leaves for Calcutta every month. As the fares are most exorbitant, I was advised to take a third-class ticket and hire a cabin from one of the engineers or petty officers. I was greatly pleased with the notion and hastened to carry it out. Footnote, $173 the chief cabin, 117 the second, 34 pounds 12 shillings, and 23 pounds 8 shillings. End of footnote. My astonishment, however, may be imagined when, on paying my fare, I was told that the third-class passengers were not respectable, that they were obliged to sleep upon deck, and that the moon was exceedingly dangerous, etc. It was in vain that I replied I was the best judge of my own actions. I was obliged, unless I chose to remain behind, to pay for one of the second places. This suddenly gave me a very curious idea of English liberty. On the 25th of August, at 1 o'clock p.m., I went on board. On reaching the vessel, I found no servant in the second places, and was obliged to ask a sailor to take my luggage into the cabin. This latter was certainly anything but comfortable. The furniture was of the most common description, the table was covered with stains and dirt, and the whole place was one scene of confusion. I inquired for the sleeping cabin, and found there was but one for both sexes. I was told to apply to one of the officials, who would, no doubt, allow me to sleep somewhere else. I did so, and obtained a neat little cabin in consequence, and the steward was kind enough to propose that I should take my meals with his wife. I did not, however, choose to accept the offer. I paid dearly enough, heaven knows, and did not choose to accept everything as a favour. Besides, this was the first English steamer I had ever been on board, and I was curious to learn how second-class passengers were treated. The company at our table consisted not only of the passengers, of whom there were three besides myself, but of the cooks and waiters of the first-class places, as well as of the butcher, or, in a word, of every one of the attendants who chose to take pot-luck with us. As for any etiquette in the article of costume, that was entirely out of the question. Sometimes one of the company would appear without either coat or jacket. The butcher was generally oblivious of his shoes and stockings, and it was really necessary to be endowed with a ravenous appetite to be enabled to eat anything with such a set. The bill of fare was certainly adapted to the crew in their costume, but decidedly not to the passengers, who had to pay thirteen dollars, two pounds twelve shillings, a day each for provisions. The tablecloth was full of stains, and, in lieu of a napkin, each guest was at liberty to use his handkerchief. The knives and forks had white and black horn handles with notched blades and broken prongs. On the first day we had no spoons at all, on the second we had one between us, and this one was placed on the table in solitary grandeur during the entire voyage. There were only two glasses, and those of the most ordinary description, which circulated from mouth to mouth. As I was a female, instead of my turn of the glasses, I had, as a peculiar mark of distinction, an old teacup with the handle knocked off. The head cook, who did the honours, pleaded an excuse for all this discomfort, that they happened this voyage to be short of servants. This struck me as really a little too naive, for when I paid my money, I paid for what I ought to have then, and not for what I might have another time. As I said before, the provisions were execrable. The remnants of the first cabin were sent to us poor wretches. Two or three different things would very often be side by side in the most friendly and brotherly manner upon one dish, even although their character was widely different. That was looked upon as a matter of no import. It was also the case as to whether the things came to table hot or cold. On one occasion, during tea, the head cook, was in unusually good humour and remarked 
I spare no possible pains to provide for you. I hope you want for nothing. Two of the passengers, Englishmen, replied, No, that's true. The third, who was a Portuguese, did not understand the importance of the assertion. As a native of Germany, not possessing the patriotic feeling of an English subject in the matter, I should have replied very differently had I not been a woman, and if, by so replying, I could have effected a change for the better. The only light we had was from a piece of tallow candle that often went out by eight o'clock. We were then under the necessity of sitting in the dark or going to bed. In the morning the cabin served as a barber's shop, and in the afternoon as a dormitory, where the cooks and servants, who were half dead with sleep, used to come and slumber on the benches. In order to render us still more comfortable, one of the officers pitched upon our cabin as quarters for two young puppies, who did nothing but keep up one continued howl. He would not have dared to put them in the sailor's cabin, because the latter would have kicked them out without further ceremony. My description will, in all probability, be considered exaggerated, especially as there is an old opinion that the English are, above all other people, justly celebrated for their comfort and cleanliness. I can, however, assure my readers that I have spoken nothing but the truth, and I will even add that, although I have made many voyages on board steamships, and always paid second fare, never did I pay so high a price for such wretched and detestable treatment. In all my life I was never so cheated. The only circumstance on board the ship to which I can refer with pleasure was the conduct of the officers, who were, without exception, obliging and polite. I was very much struck with the remarkable degree of patience exhibited by my fellow passengers. I should like to know what an Englishman, who has always got the words comfort and comfortable at the top of his tongue, would say, if he were treated in this manner on board a steamer belonging to any other nation? For the first few days of our voyage we saw no land, and it was not until the 28th of August that we caught sight of the rocky coast of Cochin, China. During the whole of the 29th we steered close along the coast, but could see no signs of either human beings or habitations, the only objects visible being richly wooded mountain ranges. In the evening, however, we beheld several fires, which might have been mistaken for the signals from lighthouses, and proved that the country was not quite uninhabited. During the following day we only saw a large solitary rock called the Shoe. It struck me as being exactly like the head of a shepherd's dog. On the 2nd of September we neared Malacca. Skirting the coast are tolerably high, well-wooded mountain ranges, infested, according to all accounts, by numerous tigers that render all travelling very dangerous. On the 3rd of September, we ran into the port of Singapore, but it was so late in the evening that we could not disembark. On the following morning, I paid a visit to the firm of Behu and Mayer, to whom I had letters of introduction. Madame Behu was the first German lady I had met since my departure from Hamburg. I cannot say how delighted I was at forming her acquaintance. I was once more able to give free vent to my feelings in my own native tongue. Madame Behu would not hear of my lodging in an hotel. I was immediately installed as a member of her own amiable family. My original plan was to have remained but a short period in Singapore, and then proceed in a sailing vessel to Calcutta, as I had a perfect horror of English steamers, and as I had been told that opportunities continually presented themselves. I waited, however, week after week in vain, until, in spite of my unwillingness, I was obliged to embark in a comfortable English steamer at last. Footnote. These steamers carry the mails and make the voyage from Canton to Calcutta once a month, touching at Singapore on their way. End of footnote. The Europeans lead pretty much the same kind of life at Singapore that they do at Canton, with this difference, however, that the merchants reside with their families in the country and come to town every morning for business. Each family is obliged to keep a large staff of servants, and the lady of the house meddles very little in domestic matters, as these are generally altogether entrusted to the major domo. The servants are Chinese, with the exception of the seis, coachmen or grooms, who are Bengalese. Every spring, whole shiploads of Chinese boys from ten to fifteen years old come over here. They are generally so poor that they cannot pay their passage. When this is the case, the captain brings them over on his own account, and is paid beforehand by the person engaging them their wages for the first year. 
these young people live very economically and when they have a little money return generally to their native country though many hire themselves as journeymen and stop altogether the island of singapore has a population of fifty five thousand souls forty thousand of whom are chinese ten thousand malays or natives and hundred fifty europeans the number of women is said to be very small in consequence of the immigrants from china and india consisting only of men and boys the town of singapore and its environs contain upwards of twenty thousand inhabitants the streets struck me as being broad and airy but the houses are not handsome they are only one story high and from the fact of the roofs being placed directly above the windows appear as if they were crushed on account of the continual heat there is no glass in any of the windows but its place is supplied by sun-blinds. Every article of merchandise has here, as at Canton, if not its own peculiar street, at least its own side of the street. The building in which meat and vegetables are sold is a fine, handsome edifice resembling a temple. As a natural result of the number of persons of different nations congregated upon this island, there are various temples, none of which are worthy of notice, however, with the exception of that belonging to the Chinese it is formed like an ordinary house but the roof is ornamented in the usual chinese fashion to rather too great an extent it is loaded with points and pinnacles with circles and curves without end all of which are formed of coloured tiles or porcelain and decorated with an infinity of arabesques flowers dragons and other monsters over the principal entrance are small stone bas reliefs and both the exterior and interior of the building can boast of a profusion of carved woodwork richly gilt. Some fruits and biscuits of various descriptions, with a very small quantity of boiled rice, were placed upon the altar of the goddess of mercy. These are renewed every evening, and whatever the goddess may leave is the perquisite of the bonzes. On the same altar lay pretty little wooden counters, cut in an oval shape, which the Chinese toss up in the air, it is held to be a sign of ill luck if they fall upon the reverse side but if they fall upon the other this is believed to betoken good fortune the worthy people are in the habit of tossing them up until they fall as desired another manner of learning the decrees of fate consists in placing a number of thin wooden sticks in a basin and then shaking them until one falls out each of these sticks is inscribed with a certain number corresponding with a sentence in a book of proverbs this temple was more frequented by the people than those in Canton. The counters and sticks seemed to exercise great influence over the congregation, for it was only round them that they gathered. There is nothing further to be seen in the town, but the environs, or rather the whole island, offers the most enchanting sight. The view cannot certainly be called magnificent or grand, since one great feature necessary to give it this character, namely mountains, is entirely wanting. The highest hill, on which the governor's house and the telegraph are situated, is scarcely more than two hundred feet high, but the luxuriant verdancy, the neat houses of the Europeans in the midst of beautiful gardens, the plantations of the most precious spices, the elegant areca and feathered palms, with their slim stems shooting up to the height of a hundred feet, and spreading out into the thick feather-like tuft of fresh green, by which they are distinguished from every other kind of palms, and lastly, the jungle in the background compose a most beautiful landscape, and which appears doubly lovely to a person like myself, just escaped from that prison yuck canton, or from the dreary scenery about the town of Victoria. The whole island is intersected with excellent roads, of which those skirting the seashore are the most frequented, and where handsome carriages and horses from New Holland, and even from England, are to be seen. Footnote. Horses cannot be bred here they have all to be imported and footnote besides the european carriages there are also certain vehicles of home manufacture called palanquins which are altogether closed and surrounded on all sides with jalousies generally there is but one horse at the side of which both the coachman and footman run on foot i could not help expressing my indignation at the barbarity of this custom when i was informed that the residents had wanted to abolish it but that the servants had protested against it and begged to be allowed to run beside the carriage rather than sit or stand upon it they cling to the horse or vehicle and are thus dragged along with it hardly a day passed that we did not drive out twice a week a very fine military band used to play on the esplanade close to the sea and the whole world of fashionables would either walk or drive to the place to hear the music 
the carriages were ranged several rows deep and surrounded by young bow and foot and horseback any one might have been excused for imagining himself in an european city as for myself it gave me more pleasure to visit a plantation or some other place of the kind than to stop and look on what i had so often witnessed in europe footnote the east india company to which the island belongs have a governor and english troops here and a footnote i frequently used to visit the plantations of nutmegs and cloves and refresh myself with their balsamic fragrance the nutmeg tree is about the size of a fine apricot bush and is covered from top to bottom with thick foliage the branches grow very low down the stem and the leaves shine as if they were varnished the fruit is exactly similar to an apricot covered with yellowish brown spots when ripe it bursts exposing to view a round kernel about the size of a nut enclosed in a kind of network of a fine deep red this network is known as mace it is carefully separated from the nutmeg itself and dried in the shade while undergoing this process it is frequently sprinkled with sea water to prevent its original tint turning black instead of yellow in addition to this network the nutmeg is covered with a thin soft rind the nutmeg itself is also dried then smoke dried a little and afterwards to prevent its turning mouldy dipped several times in sea water containing a weak solution of lime the clove tree is somewhat smaller and cannot boast of such luxuriant foliage or such fine large leaves as the nutmeg tree the cloves are the buds of the tree gathered before they have had time to blossom they are first smoked and then laid for a short time in the sun another kind of spice is the areca nut which hangs under the crown of the palm of the same name in groups containing from ten to twenty nuts each it is somewhat larger than a nutmeg and its outer shell is of so bright a colour that it resembles the gilt nuts which are hung upon the christmas trees in germany the kernel is almost the same colour as the nutmeg but it has no network it is dried in the shade the chinese and natives of the place chew this nut with beetle leaf and calcined mussel shells they strew the leaf with a small quantity of the mussel powder to which they add a very small piece of the nut and make the whole into a little packet which they put into their mouth when they chew tobacco at the same time the saliva becomes as red as blood and their mouths when open look like little furnaces especially if as is frequently the case with the chinese the person has his teeth dyed and filed the first time i saw a case of the kind i was very frightened i thought the poor fellow had sustained some serious injury and that his mouth was full of blood i also visited a sago manufactory the unprepared sago is imported from the neighbouring island of borneo and consists of the pith of a short thick kind of palm the tree is cut down when it is seven years old split up from top to bottom and the pith of which there is always a large quantity extracted it is then freed from the fibres pressed in large frames and dried at the fire or in the sun at this period it has still a yellowish tinge the following is the manner in which it is grained the meal or pith is steeped in water for several days until it is completely blanched it is then once more dried by the fire or in the sun and passed under a large wooden roller and through a hair sieve when it has become white and fine it is placed in a kind of linen winnowing fan which is kept damp in a peculiar manner the workman takes a mouthful of water and spurts it out like fine rain over the fan in which the meal is alternately shaken and moistened in the manner just mentioned until it assumes the shape of small globules which are constantly stirred round in large flat pans until they are dried when they are passed through a second sieve not quite so fine as the first and the larger globules separated from the rest the building in which the process takes place is a large shed without walls its roof being supported upon the trunks of trees i was indebted to the kindness of the messieurs behu and mayer for a very interesting excursion into the jungle the gentlemen four in number all well provided with fowling pieces having determined to start a tiger besides which they were obliged to be prepared for bears wild boars and large serpents we drove as far as the river gallon where we found two boats in readiness for us but before entering them paid a visit to a sugar refining establishment situated upon the banks of the river the sugar cane was piled up in stacks before the building but there had only been sufficient for a day's consumption as all that remained would have turned sour from the excessive heat the cane is first passed under metal cylinders which press out all the juice this runs into large cauldrons in which it is boiled and then allowed to cool it is afterwards placed in earthen jars where it becomes completely dry 
the buildings resembled those i have described when speaking of the preparation of sago after we had witnessed the process of sugar-baking we entered the boats and proceeded up the stream we were soon in the midst of the virgin forests and experienced at every stroke of the oars greater difficulty in forcing our passage on account of the numerous trunks of trees both in and over the stream we were frequently obliged to land and lift the boats over these trees or else lie flat down and thus pass under them as so many bridges all kinds of brushwood full of thorns and brambles hung down over our heads and even some gigantic leaves proved a serious obstacle to us these leaves belong to a sort of palm called the mengkuang near the stem they are five inches broad but their length is about twelve feet and as the stream is scarcely more than nine feet wide they reached right across it the natural beauty of the scene was so great however that these occasional obstructions so far from diminishing actually heightened the charm of the whole the forest was full of the most luxuriant underwood creepers palms and fern plants the latter in many instances sixteen feet high proved a no less effectual screen against the burning rays of the sun than did the palms and other trees. End of section 15